Greetings, ladies and mendigents, and welcome to the science fiction audiobook version of the fourth wave taken from the subreddit HFY. The link to the original will be down below, and as always, I hope that you enjoy, and if you do, please consider supporting the channel. The Fourth Wave Part 1, written by Semi Loki. My skull fight like John Henry and the steam engine were in a race to see who could burrow through it the fastest. I ached all over. It was like every nerve fiber was turned up to eleven. My hair hurt. It was like the world's worst hangover. And more. Yet, I was fairly certain I hadn't been drinking. I remember clocking out from work and taking the bus home. The closest bus stop was on the exact opposite side of Thompson Park, so... Like usual, I cut across the park towards the apartment. This time, though, I had stopped just because there were these weird lights floating ahead. Then I had been illuminated by a shaft of light and... Uh, oh. My eyes snapped open. I was in the Spartan white room. The walls seemed to admit a soft white light. I was also but naked and strapped to the steel operating table. I clenched my butt cheeks together in a desperate bid to avoid what I figured was a scheduled main event. Rhythms alert fully integrated, a voice sounded from nowhere. I was only catching a word here and there, not because the voice was low either. No, it boomed loud enough to make my throbbing head feel like it was about to explode. I cringed it with my straps and tried in vain to release my arms so that I could clamp them over my ears. Maybe someone out there noticed my reaction and took pity on me because the voice spoke again. The volume was less ear-splitting. Waves asynchronous presently. The voice said again, Yeah, it wasn't my imagination after all. I was struggling to follow the words because they weren't English. They weren't in any language that I ever heard before. I wasn't even sure that they were words could be made into a human throat. Yet, I understood them, sort of. When the voice woke up a third time, I contracted with the sounds and found the eased comprehension. The symbiotic, but only the language areas, extraordinary really. The chimera really did uh, work of art, if I do say so myself. The voice concluded, and I couldn't tell if the voice was male or female. The inflection and the tone of the voice were all wrong too. It made the voice sound almost synthetic, but I knew instinctively that it wasn't. The speaker was very much alive, but I was now certain not human. After an agonizing moment where nothing happened, part of the wall ahead of me dissolved and a pair of figures stepped into the room. The first thought that occurred to me is that, apparently, hazmat suits look the same across the universe. The pair were definitely not human. The proportions and shapes were all wrong. But the suits, they would be right at home in the CDC. Walking balloons with gloves and boots as clear plastic faceplate. A face behind the plastic looked to be shriveled up apple with too many eyes. Their eyes were like a spider's. Two large compound eyes with smaller sensors scattered across its head. The taller one opened its toothless maw and that same voice spoke out again. Should be integrated enough to allow mutual comprehension, the voice said, but there is no way of knowing if we were dealing with aeons of neural drift patterns. Still, you can try. The shorter one stepped forward and addressed me. Can you comprehend me? it asked. Evening, I greeted. How's Alvis doing these days? The two figures stared at one another. The symbiotic matrix may have affixed itself regularly, the tall one concluded. I was afraid of this. We may be completely unable to communicate with it. The shorter one looked back at me. Are you able to comprehend me? It said. If not, then we shall have to dispose of you and find another subject to interrogate. I didn't like the sound of that word, dispose, so I opted for tact this time. I understand you just fine, I said, but if you bring out a probe without the decency to lube it up first, you can forget about asking for a second date. The two regarded one another. 
Extraordinary, the taller one said. It seems to be able to understand us, but it is like half the words are complete gibberish to us. Perhaps the symbiote hasn't completely updated its lexicon for the language of the ship. The smaller one considered this. Perhaps it's just a token gesture of hostility. It used a war cry or a declaration of defiance. It's called sarcasm, I called out. Better get used to it, because if this is how you make introductions on your world, you're in for a lot of it. The both regarded him. I do believe, the taller one said, that the symbiote is linked. You may now interrogate the subject, Captain. The short one, the captain, I now realized, strode forward until he was standing beside me. There are over seven billion of your species, he said. How is this possible? Well, I said, when a mommy and a daddy love each other with very much, and Barry White is singing in the background. Captain, the tall one interrupted, I believe the gibberish is a defense mechanism. He is lightly unaware of the barricade world status. The captain smacked his hipless mouth a few times before turning to face me once more. How had your species survived? He asked me. We wondered the same thing, I informed him. Did you know of the Krakul Plague? One word did not translate. I just looked at the captain. How did your species survive this? he asked. I have no idea what you're talking about, I said. The captain looked at the taller one, who I know thought of this as the science officer. It's likely telling the truth, the science officer concluded. I find no traces of the plague present in its body. Yet oddly, there is evidence of infections with several related diseases. It seems to have developed an immunity to them. Again, the lipless mouth smacked, a sign of anxiety, I realized. I started to pick up the elements of their body language. Curious. The captain faced me again. The infantry species, it said. What happened? What are you talking about? The wall before me flashed and became a screen of some sort. Projected on the screen was a rather familiar-looking figure. Well... Familiar in the sense that I had seen it before in museums, but usually they were wearing animal skins and carrying clubs. The mechanized armor and high-tech assault rifle were an interesting twist. That's a Neanderthal, I blurted out. The two aliens regarded one another and looked back at me. What happened to them? the captain asked. I tried to shrug, but the straps made it difficult. We're not sure, I admitted. They seem to have lived with our kind for a few thousand years and then just dwindled away. Some scientist thinks they were interbred with us. The captain's mouth smacked more vigorously, agitation. Only the commandos have survived, it asked. Commandos? I asked. Your species, the Chimera commandos. I have no idea what you're talking about. Captain, it was the science officer. Perhaps I gave this creature some background that might facilitate our interrogation. The captain's mouth jittered, but it stepped back and allowed the science officer to take its place. The screen flashed and I saw a picture of Earth floating in the inky blackness of space. Your world, the science officer said unnecessarily. Nice place, I told him. It is a hell, he corrected me. A rock with unstable tectonic plates, destructive weather patterns, and an aggressive fauna, which is perhaps why the Chimera used it as their personal petri dish. You keep talking about the Chimera. Who is that? Genetic tinkers, it told me, an ancient race from far side of the galaxy. They manipulate their own genes into those of others and come into contact with, trying to make the perfect species. Those who did not join them willingly were conquered. Sounds unpleasant, I agreed. The screen flashed again, this time to an image of multiple flying saucers firing energy beams at a T-Rex with cannons strapped to its sides. The second wave invasion, the science officer informed me. They attacked our ground forces with these dragons. We eventually traced their origin back to your planet. We thought that we destroyed their weapon factory when we launched an asteroid at the planet to destroy all life. 
Without their dragons to supplement their ranks, they were forced to retreat. The image flashed back to the image of the Neanderthal in battle armor, but the image was now zoomed out and I saw another person behind him, a more modern-looking human wearing lighter armor. The ground troops were in the third invasion, the science officer concluded. Imagine our surprise when we trace their origin back to the same planet. How bad? I said. Your species were extremely versatile shock troops, it went on. Exceedingly violent. He's easy to heal, strong, fast, limber, and most of all, numerous. Your biology made a highly resistant to psionic and chemical attacks. We were forced to create a biological weapon to wipe you out. A virus so dangerous that we have blockaded your entire sector for eons, waiting for the disease to run its course and investigate the effectiveness. Now we find not only have you survived, but thrived. More numerous than ever. I tried to shrug again. Healthy living and a lot of porn, I said. Another defensive mechanism, the science officer declared, but I believe that you understand us. Despite our best efforts to destroy your hell world, it seems to insist on providing the most vicious monsters known to the galaxy, which is why we are here. To try and wipe us out again, I asked. Hardly, the captain said. Early scout ships have the far quadrants are alerting us to the movement amongst the Chimera strongholds. They're scaling up. Both of them jittered in their mouths. The fourth wave, I guessed. They recoiled from me and didn't deny it. Oh boy, looks like things are going to get interesting real soon. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Part 2. Written by Semi Loki. Tweedledum and Tweedle even dumber scuttled out of the room and the door disappeared. Great. Now I was naked, strapped to the table, and, for whatever reason, my two abductors had decided to cut me out of the next part of the conversation. At times like this, I asked that really important question. What would Jackie Chan do? Yeah. Probably fire the scriptwriter and then insist that he leave his legs free so that he could kick his legs up. Somehow break the table free from the floor and run around in circles beating people up with the table still strapped to him. While the Three Stooges sounds mixed in with the soundtrack. Not a bad plan for Jackie but I saw more than a few complications in me carrying it out. Still I hurt everywhere. I realized that I should have been afraid. But it's sort of hard to work your way up to that when it felt as though at any moment you might vomit up your own small intestines. Plus, I have a bit of a history with being mouthy when I shouldn't. Blame my mother for that one. I do. For the fourth grade, I lost ten pounds over the course of six months due to an involuntary diet compliments of Billy Geegan's fist and the desire for my lunch money. Complaints to the school didn't really do much as the school said, but he was uh, in a bad situation at home and, for some odd reason, this meant that we should be more accommodating for his need to extract lunch money from smaller classmates. As long as Billy didn't actually kill someone, the school seemed more than willing to forgive any of his transgressions. I wasn't and I asked my mother for nunchucks for my birthday. Unfortunately, my mother was a strict pacifist. She just shook her head and told me, Use words, not fist, Jason. That's me, by the way. Jason Reese. Anyway, my point is that I took my mother's advice. For six months, I tried using words and not fists. I first started off by suggesting politely that his ancestry might be canine persuasion. I got a bloody nose and no lunch money. So, the next day I suggested that perhaps he might benefit from learning the identity of his father and suggested that he start by seeing if it was actually his uncle. Bloody nose, torn shirt and no lunch money. Finally, after months of this, I told my mother her idea wasn't working. That's when she told me that what she meant by that was that I should try and find a way to make peace with Billy. Oh great. Now she tells me like it's my fault that she can't provide clear instructions. 
Anyways, the point is that I've made my nose broken four times in my life, and every time it was preceded by me opening my mouth, when it should have remained firmly closed. Apparently, the universe didn't think I should waste such talents on a single planet. The door reappeared and the captain stormed in. The captain was alone this time. We require the relocation of your leader, he said. Close, I said, but if you read your script, I think you'll find that you got the wording wrong. Your leader, he repeated. Where is your leader? You must demand an audience with your leader on our behalf. Interesting idea, I conceded. The captain looked back and placed a hand on the blank part of the wall. You need our persuasion. The captain asked him what was probably meant to be a threat. Any other time it would have worked too. If I heard less, I might have been the sobering wreck. But at the moment, though, the prospect of death beams actually seemed moderately appealing. I just said that it was an interesting idea, I said. I'm trying to think of how that might work. Okay, let's smart small. Which leader? The captain stepped away from the wall. You are ruled by a council, he asked. No, I said, trying to keep the irritation out of my voice. Which country? Are you deliberately using nonsense words to mock me? The captain asked. Now, I, you think I'm mocking you? I asked. We've really got to work on Yukusia. Okay, I'll try again. There are about 200 territories down there, each with their own leader. Which one do you want to talk to? The one who's in charge of it all, the captain said. The one they answer to. There isn't anyone that they answer to, I said patiently. Not all of them even admit that the other ones exist. What is the meaning of this? The captain asked. Are you suggesting your society is fractured? That's um, one way of putting it, I conceded. But it's societies, you know. Multiple languages, different customs, different religions. The captain retreated another step. Madness, the captain said. Your species is insane. Your whole world must have driven you mad. The warm fuzzies in the room were starting to make me feel just a bit too loved and special. Thanks, I said. Can we get back to the part where I can't help you? Your own leader, the captain said suddenly. Demand an audience. Yeah, I said. It doesn't work that way. People are generally discouraged from talking to leaders directly. Then how do they know the will of their subjects? They don't, I agreed, and largely don't care. The captain was out of the door again, leaving me alone. Really, I was growing tired of this. Lacking anything better to do, I decided to test the straps. I tensed my arms and legs and heaved. The straps held, but I thought I felt just a tiny bit of give in my right arm. Interesting. I relaxed my muscles and took a couple deep breaths. Then, before I could debate the wisdom of such an action, I tensed my muscles again while also trying to roll my body from left to side. I threw my weight against the strap as much as possible. Again, there was a tiny movement as give with something stretched imperceptibly. I relaxed my arm and tried to slide my wrist free. It was still held fast, but yes, the strap really was a bit looser. I tensed and I threw my weight against it a second time. Then a third. On the fourth try, I allowed myself to collapse into a panting heap and tried pulling my arm free again. My hand got stuck just below the thumb. It was working, but slowly. The next time I rolled to the right first before searching the left with explosive force. This time I did not relax. I tugged and tugged at my straps until I felt my hand might pop out. My hand slipped inside and the skin abraded but my own blood helped lubricate the passage of my hand. With a popping sound, my arm was now free of the straps. I took a deep breath before fumbling at my other straps to see if I could figure out the latching mechanism. They didn't seem to follow any logic I was familiar with. No levers, no clamps, no buttons. Maybe they needed a special tool. My pinky touched the rough patch on the otherwise smooth metal, and the metallic buckle broke in two. With two ends of the metal had separated cleanly into two smooth, regular pieces with no indication that they had been previously joined. So it wasn't mechanical. It was like the disappearing and reappearing door. 
My chest was now free, and I leaned over to examine the buckle on my left arm to see if I could find the rough spot that would break it open. I found it, and I could now sit up. I'd only just freed my legs. Naturally, that's when the door reappeared and the captain stepped inside. He screamed something that I didn't get a chance to translate. I took a wild guess that he was probably calling for security. I slapped both buckles on my legs at the same time, and I was free from the table. I leapt to my feet and found myself stumbling once more. Something was wrong. It took too long to fall to the floor and my body weight felt too light. I didn't have time to think about it, though. My bare feet struggled to gain purchase on the slick floor. I knew I had seconds at best before that door disappeared again. Once I was on the other side, I'd... I'd figure out that part when I got there. One problem at a time. I covered maybe half the distance to the door when a new figure appeared. This one did not wear a hazmat suit. Instead, I got my first real look at the aliens. Imagine if a grasshopper had its rear legs removed and its body twisted upright. That's the best description I could give. It had two arms and two legs, yes, but they sprouted from the front and the body rather than the sides. Legs with two sets of knees zigzagged as they held a bulky thorax out to the ground. The aliens, I and I stood bent slightly forward at all times to prevent their bodies dragging on the ground. The arms had similar lightning bolt shape as the terminated in a hand that seemed to be four thumbs evenly spaced around a circular palm. In one of those hands, the newcomer held a device that was unmistakable shape that, uh, no matter how alien, screams, I'm a gun! I tried to dive to the side, but the weakened gravity and the stick floor made me clumsy. There was a flash of light and I fell to the floor heavily and made good on my thoughts of vomiting. I thought that I had known pain before, that the hangover feeding upon waking up was the worst thing that I might be capable of feeding this side of death. That burst of life had set me straight. I felt as though my bones had been superheated while my muscles spasmed. I felt myself convulse against the floor, rubbing my face in my own sick. But I was helpless to do anything about it. The pain began to fade and I felt air catch in my lungs. I rolled over on my back and groaned. My instructions were to kill it, the captain barked. My gun is set to kill, the god responded. What? Shoot it again. A fresh wave of stomach-churning nausea and pain hit me. My vision went red as I flailed helplessly on the ground. My bones heated up again as before and the sensation faded. I was panting for breath, and I felt tears welling up in my eyes. I wanted to vomit again, but my stomach was now empty. Again, the captain barked. Another flash of light. Luckily, my own overstressed nervous system took pity on me, even if the captain would not. I blacked out. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Part 3, written by Semi Loki. Waking up was a uh, mixed blessing. On one hand, I was surprised that I could still do it. On the other hand, I wasn't looking forward to being shot again. The pure agony I had experienced then had faded to a distance and a rather unpleasant memory. But I was in no hurry to refresh it. Hesitantly, I opened my eyes. My situation had certainly changed. For one thing, I was no longer naked. No. This time, I was in one wearing the hazmat suit. It fit me poorly as the shoulders and hips kept trying to draw my limbs forward. They were stopped by a other thing that had changed. I was no longer strapped to a table, but was now pinned upright against a wall by what felt like an invisible sumo wrestler. Something pressed me against the wall with so much force that it ached to draw fresh breath into my lungs. I could just about wiggle my fingers, but my arms may as well have been welded to the wall. Two of the insectoid aliens stood in front of me a short distance away. One was tall and the other one shorter with a heavier bull from the thorax. The science officer and the captain, I guessed. For a moment, neither of them seemed to notice that I was awake again. Four rounds and it still lives. The captain said with an oddly high-pitched tilt to its voice. 
How is that possible? The records indicate that the species was augmented to survive energy weapons, the science officer offered. The lolt was a sign of anger, I guessed. Reading their body language gets getting easier as I picked up more reference points, which is why I noticed that their feet were in a constant motion now, each of the aliens now doing tiny little waltz that carried them by inches away from one another and back again. Neither one seemed to be aware that they were doing this. I had a thought, the science officer continued, that it meant that the records referred to armoring, but it seems the actual neural disruption is partially negated. If the guard had not set his weapon to maximum, it may have not have injured the creature at all. How is that even possible? the captain asked. I am not fully unraveled the complexities of its physiology, the science officer offered with a brief pause. Maybe with time I can understand the mechanism of its continued survival. Why are you too afraid of me? I interjected. The question sparked an interesting reaction. The pair immediately stopped their erratic dancing and retreated away from it. It was almost like a flinch or a dragging a hand away from an exposed flame. I knew then that I had guessed right. They were frightened. The captain's response wasn't directed at me, but towards the science officer once more. The psionic suppressors are functioning, the captain asked. Yes, captain, the science officer responded with a squeaky voice. The species is not supposed to be psychic. I am not certain how it can do that. They thought I was reading their minds, not their body language. Interesting. If my memory serves, I went on, you shot me. I think that entitles me to the role of cowering right now. So, if you'll turn off whatever it is you've got gluing me to the wall, I'll go back to curling up in the fetal position. You killed the guard, the captain shouted at me. That was news. I replayed the events in my mind. I recall being shot and falling to the ground. I certainly didn't remember jumping up afterwards and going Chuck Norris on the guard. I was fairly certain that I would remember that. No, I didn't, I counted. I never even got near the guard. You never got decontaminated, the captain said. Your disease has destroyed him. Oh, I said. We're doing that movie now. Well, yeah, we are faulty, disease-ridden species. Now whose fault is that again? The captain's mouth jittered, and he began performing the odd waltz again. You should not exist, the captain said. This should not be. The fourth wave is imminent, and the weapons are still here. This is not right. I don't see why you're complaining, I interrupted. I've watched enough Star Trek to know that I'm supposed to be imprisoned by a woman with a 1950s hairdo, who lets me go after I teach her about Earth thing called uh, kissing. I'm not quite the point where I'm willing to pucker up for either of you mugs, Give me a few shots of tequila, or hit me with that gun again, and I might change my mind, though. Can it be killed? The captain asked the science officer. I believe it is fragile as any other species, the science officer replied, just hardened to certain types of attacks. Yeah, I agreed. The football kick to the joy sack tactic still takes us out pretty quickly. They had been ignoring me up until then, but uh, for some odd reason they were now paying attention to me once again. Maybe it was the topic of kicking me in the nuts that got their interest. They'd get on all along famously with my ex-girlfriend if that were the case. Have the chimeras been in contact with your species? The captain asked. I don't think so, I offered. There are a few stories out there, but I think they have more to do with Bud Light and trailer parks than alien invaders. Answer the question, the captain snapped. Enough with your untranslatable gibberish. No, I said. No credible stories of alien contact. So you were not recently created, nor the current level of technology a gift from outsiders. I'm afraid we're to blame for it all, I answered. If we contacted your multiple leaders, the captain said slowly, would they ally with us or join the Chimera again? They can't even agree on what to order for lunch, I answered. 
What makes you think the consensus for a galactic war would be easier? The captain retreated and stamped his feet for a moment before resuming the nervous waltz. It was now the science officer who turned to approach me. Your kind fights amongst themselves, the science officer said. It wasn't a question, but I decided to treat it as it was. Yes, I agreed. They cannot cooperate. Again, not a question. We are good at cooperating, I corrected. Just not at all the time, nor with everyone. It's more complex than that. How can struggle or cooperation be a complex matter? The science officer asked. Fine, I said. You got me. So, you're going to surrender to the Chimera then? What? The science officer's feet stopped shuffling from side to side. The Chimera on the anathema to the values that we hold to as a species and... But, I interjected quickly, that means struggle, which is the opposite of surrendering to them and cooperating. You cannot cooperate with the Chimera without losing yourself, the science officer exclaimed. Yeah, I agreed. My grandmother used to say the same thing about Catholics. Like I said, it's complicated. The science officer took a few more steps away before turning to face the captain. I suggest we locate another specimen, the science officer suggested. This one seems to talk in circles. Maybe a different specimen would elicit a more useful information. I tend to agree, the captain murmured, but traditional disposal methods seem ineffective. Excuse me, I said quickly. Before we go any further with this, can you tell me where are the facilities? Both aliens glanced in my direction. Is this more gibberish? the captain asked. No, I said slowly. Do you not understand the idea of waste, the end result of eating and drinking once your body has gotten all the use from them? The captain looked in my direction and then turned away in a dismissive manner. Fine, I said, but if you kill me, you better be prepared to use pressure washer on the suit. What are you talking about? the captain asked. The elimination process requires active muscle control, I explained. Once the body expires, the muscles release. You're going to have to deal with a problem one way or another. Might as well try doing so when I can give you a helping hand. The captain paused and then touched something on the bracelet that I hadn't noticed before. The sumo wrestlers let go and I slumped limply against the wall. Very well, the captain said. Me warned that. I didn't give him a chance to finish the sentence. I discovered two universal ideas, hazmat suits and gullibility. I sent the captain sprawling as I ran past him towards the door on the far end of the chamber. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, chapter number four. In times like this is when you find yourself running pell-mell down a corridor of an alien spacecraft in an ill-fitting hazmat suit with aliens bent on murder hot on your heels that you start to really asking the important questions in life. Did I really need to cut through the middle of the park rather than stick to the well-lit and heavily trafficked sidewalks that would lead a long way around? Was there something I could have done to avoid the situation? Most of all, was there a way off of the ship? The corridor was made of that same featureless white material as the rooms. I saw no doors or exits. Okay, that's fine. They made the floors disappear and reappear. I clearly needed to figure out how they did that and do the same thing. Easy, right? I'll be the first one to admit that I'm not always the best at thinking on my feet. Truth be told, I don't do that much better at sitting down. Whatever spark that brilliant people have, that ability to climb shoulders of giants and get a better peak, I don't have that. However, as it turns out, being repeatedly threatened with your own death by a homicidal aliens is a remarkable mental lubricant. I could feel the gears churning, and, as such, I reached a rather obvious conclusion fairly quickly. The buckles on the straps that used a small rough patch on the trigger on the opening process. Some, if they used it there, odds were very good that they used it on the doors as well. I swerved to get a closer look at the wall, and ran my hand along the surface at about the same height where I guessed the alien's arm would be. My hand brushed against an irregular spot on the wall that opened up beside me. 
I glanced inside and spotted several tight-fitting pipes and no room for me to fit in between. A maintenance hatch, I guessed. I continued along the wall and as I brushed another patch I've opened another door. This one opened up into a room devoid of all furniture, save a trio of low tables with no chairs. Instead, there was shallow depression surrounding the tables in a circle. The aliens probably just lowered their bodies onto the ground when they sat. I moved along the corridor. I wasn't sure what I was looking for. A tiny spaceship with a button reading, Press here for Earth would be nice. I guess, but uh, so far, nothing seemed promising. I opened up a third door and froze in place. The room was certainly different. The room was taller than the others and longer too. Bright light flooded in from the room and illuminated the sheets that hung from the ceiling in neat rows. Below the sheets were tubes filled with blue-colored liquid, covering the sheets with multicolored leafy plants and like I had never seen before. A greenhouse? No, I read about this. Hydroponics. Hellworlder! The captain's voice boomed from everywhere, and Noah had once cease running. You can go nowhere on the ship without my knowledge. Your capture is imminent. You only waste time. It was a time to roll the dice and pray. I stepped into the hydroponics room and shut the door behind me. I reached up to the neck of the hazmat suit and began speaking to the empty room. Can you hear me, Captain? I asked. I hear you, the Captain said. Guards will arrest you presently. Can you tell where I am? I asked. I can, the Captain agreed. The plants look neat, I said. I wonder what they smell like. I'll just take off my helmet and breathe on them a bit. What do you think of that? The Captain didn't respond. <sighs> Maybe I was on the right track after all. You know, we've thought of this idea too, I told the empty room. Kind of hard to survive in space without fresh air or food. You would have an entire ecosystem to keep you alive on planets, so why not just take one with you when you travel? Plants to keep the air breathable and to munch on when you get hungry. Shame if some sort of disease got on them. An empty threat, the captain said. Our air filtration systems are decontaminating the air. Maybe, but are you willing to risk your life on that? How hard would it be to decontaminate a plant? Hope you weren't planning on eating them with the near future. I waited, and the captain remained silent, but the door wasn't kicked in either. Stalemate. I kept my hand near the helmet as we waited. Do you know, I said, if there are guards standing on the other side of this door with a sidearm drawn and ready to fire on me as soon as the door opens, you might want to remember that your guns don't put me down quickly. I bet I can open my helmet even after you shoot me. There was a strange noise from the air as if someone was about to say something, and the transmission was cut off mid-syllable. And these creatures were lousy poker players. No wonder they got their butts kicked in in the war. What do you want? The captain's voice said was from nowhere. Talking would be good, I said. No restraints, no threats to kill me. A promise to take me back home when we are done and we will be nice as a bonus. We have redundant botany bays, the captain said. I could incinerate everything in that room and remove all infections. You included. Okay, maybe they aren't all that bad at poker players. As the wise philosopher said, you gotta know when to hold them and when to fold them. Of course, he also advised, knowing when to walk away and when to run. Options I was sorely missing. Okay, Kenny. Maybe I did have one last card to play. One last bluff. It wasn't much, but it was marginally better survival odds than incineration. Do the records of my species mention the death beams that we can project with the power of our minds? I asked. Silence. You're lying. The science officer's voice came from nowhere. Well, yes, I was. However, the strange high-pitched noise he made told me that he wasn't certain of that. Sure, I said, immune to energy weapons, psionic attacks, and able to best your biological weapons. But a chimera would never give us a death beam. That would be crazy. Silence. Then more silence. Then a lot, lot more of that. 
Finally, the captain's voice returned. We will talk, the captain said. No more threats or restraints. And when we're done, then we shall return you to where we found you. I lowered my arm and touched the rough patch near the door. I wasn't surprised to find the captain, the science officer, or the pair of armed guards with the guns trained on me standing there. Deal, I agreed as I pushed past them. Now show me the way to the facilities you mentioned. After all of that, really do need to take a leak. Unlike the bit with the death beam, I really was telling the truth this time. End of chapter Chapter number 5 Star Trek, as it turned out, would continue to lie to me. First of all, let's talk about bathrooms. Does the Starship Enterprise even have a water closet? Or did Scotty just beam that stuff out of your colon? They obviously had some sort of high-tech system in place because no matter what exotic planet or what the local cuisine, you never saw Cook running down the hallway, doubled over, breaking out in cold sweats. There are no star trots. These aliens apparently employed a less high-tech solution. Without getting into too much of an anatomy lesson here, apparently my abductors placed their overflow valves in a somewhat different location. One that required a fair bit of contortion to arrange myself to use. But that wasn't even the really disturbing part. Apparently, their own metabolisms worked much lower than more efficiently than my own, and the need to eliminate occurred with much less frequency. The end results were, well, pretty much devoid of anything worth recycling, so they simply jettisoned it, knowing that one of my favorite bits of anatomy was inches away from a hard vacuum did give me a touch of performance anxiety. I am not ashamed to say, but uh, let's move past the star toilets for the moment and go right into the major disappointment. The bridge. Come on, we know what the control room of a high-tech alien spacecraft is supposed to look like. Horseshoe shaped with consoles rising up from the floor, contoured chairs, lots of buttons and flashing lights, and best of all, the tendency to emit showers of sparks whenever another ship got too close, and so much as flashes in the high beams at you. Instead, I was treated to another featureless white room, where the divots on the floor were the aliens could seat their thoraxes comfortably, but otherwise nothing out of the ordinary. No buttons or dials, no flashing lights or exploding panels, just white walls and four grey-skinned aliens and one yellow-skinned one glaring at me as I squatted on the floor in my hazmat suit. I turned my face to the yellow one. I know you, I declared. You're the god who shot me. I thought you were supposed to be dead. Kalungaga is dead, the science officer corrected me. He was just now being discharged from the surgery, but was yet to make a full recovery. So, by dead you don't mean something permanent, I translated. So when you told me I killed him, you really mean he had to go and get patched up and would then be back on his feet in no time. Were you guys planning on doing the same when you threatened to kill me? Five sets of mouths jittered, but they did not answer. Okay, I said. We come to rule one with a little negotiation here. From now on, the words dead or killed will be reserved for people who are not expected to recover from that state. Anyone who disagrees with this is free to shoot me in the back as I run down the halls with my helmet off, looking for all of your botany labs. Agreed? They were silent for a moment before the captain spoke again. I was mistaken, he amended. The officer was injured but not killed. Is that suitable? Yes, I agreed, and if he hadn't shot me four times while I was lying here in a helpless on the floor, I might feel compelled to send him a card or something, but given the circumstances, I say that we called this a wash. They jittered their mouths again. Rule two, I went on, no more lying. Why are you guys really here? We were sent to establish, he began. No, you weren't, I interrupted. Whatever you are doing here, it certainly isn't official. So why are you really here? I was just guessing, of course. Well, mostly guessing. They had bounced back and forth between wanting to recruit me versus killing me outright. They were surprised by finding the planet occupied, but still talked about having to wait for a disease to run its course. 
I am no expert, but I am fairly sure that when the hosts are all dead, the disease has pretty much run as far as it can go. There should be no reason to suspect that it would remain active a thousand years later. This story, as well as the actions, were so inconsistent, I was almost certain that they were playing it by ear, with no clear instructions. So either this was an unofficial mission constructed by an idiot with no guidelines, or they had come out here on their own with no clear plan. Like I said, I guess but a good one. Plus, I wanted to see what would happen if I shook them up a bit. I had already learned that, for whatever reason, these aliens had body language of their own, but uh, were very bad at reading it. As such, they never really developed the ability to master their own body language. So much so that even with my clumsy efforts at reading them, they suspected that I had previously unknown psychic abilities. I really didn't need one to read the shock on the ran through them. The five of them leapt up as their divots and scurried away from me as their mouths stepped together noisily. Our mission, the captain said, his voice so high-pitched that it would set the dog howling, is to... Last chance, I interrupted. No more lying. Do you have death beams? The science officer asked suddenly. No, I don't, I admitted. I just said that so that you wouldn't kill me. Our government did not send us, the science officer replied. Belsian, the captain barked, spinning to face the subordinate. You are dismissed. Rule three, I said. No, he is not. Silence. I am a female, Belsian said at last. No, she is not, I continued. No more lies, no more power plays. We either discuss the problem or you guys are on your own without my help. You think we require your help? The captain asked. It may have been a challenge. I may have been questioned. I responded in kind. You think you want my hindrance? I replied. Mouths flapping, all five slowly approached and resumed their seats to surround me in a semicircle. What are you proposing? The captain asked. First, I said, tell me more about the Chimera. What happens if they attack? Second, you seem to think humans can help. Why? To my surprise, it was the guard that answered me. If the Chimera approach your planet, your species will be no more, the guard said. Instead, another species will take your place that may once be your own. We have seen this across many worlds. Okay, so you're saying humans are the ones of these experiments, I asked, that we didn't evolve on Earth. You likely did, the officer answered, picking up the story from the guard. The raw materials were here. They had just augmented what they found to create a better warrior species. Warrior species, I asked skeptically. Look, I hate to disappoint you, but we're not exactly the strongest, fastest, or most agile creature on our planet. Correct, the science officer replied. Your Hal world experience shapes you as warriors. Rule four, I said. Stop calling it a howl world. That's my home. A wall in front of me flashed and it turned into view screen. I saw the image before the Neanderthal in battle armor with a corrode magnum and the background. This time, however, the image was moving. The image wasn't quite a hologram as it didn't project outwards. Still, there was a lot of sense of dimensions. It felt as though I was peering through an open window and witnessing the battle taking place outside. The Neanderthal advanced in the heavy armor with the short, choppy steps. The body was squatter and heavier built than modern humans. I saw beams of light flashing and bouncing off of him as he marched towards an alien species, the likes of which I'd never seen before. The alien looked like a giant serpent with a squid for a head. In its writhing arms, it held multiple pistols that blazed in a hail of energy blasts at the advancing Neanderthal. It did no good. The Neanderthal was a living tank. The Neanderthal's weapon spoke three times, and as he advanced on the spurpin squid. The first shot went wild. The second two struck the center mass and caused the alien to drop its weapon when writhe on the ground in pain. The Neanderthal barely broke its stride as it marched over the top of the fallen enemy and sending one booted foot, stamping down and crushing the fallen alien's head. As I watched the other armored figure, the modern human one ran past the fallen alien and his own weapon blazing. The image froze again. 
The third wave, the science officer reminded me. What few recordings we have survived show similar incidents whenever your species was deployed. I felt sickened, but I carefully kept my face from betraying that, not because I was afraid that I might pick up on it. I was afraid that if I let myself slip just a little, I'd never be able to stop. The images had been so clear, so visceral, there wasn't that sense of being one step removed from the movies that video games can elicit. This was real, brutally and disgustingly real. You may have noticed that the ship's gravity is less than your own accustomed gravity. The science officer Volsine continued. Your own planet would be considered by much of the galaxy as a high gravity planet. Your hell... Uh, Earth's gravity is approximately 20% higher than the galactic norm for habitable worlds. It also has slightly reduced oxygen concentration. I blinked in surprise as I digested that. More oxygen and reduced gravity, so on another world I'd be both stronger and may have a bit more energy. The queasiness I felt intensified. The image changed to that of a naked male figure. Fortunately, I did not have to look at his love tackle in a living color for too long before the image shifted to the view of the skeletal structure underneath. Your bones, she went on, while your and your cousin species are extraordinary. A calcium matrix with a surprising strength yet light wave and compressible. Your skeleton is actually stronger than a similar weight of steel. That much I already knew. It had come up in biology class that I had been forced to tank. The teacher had been desperate to bid to get our attention, had tossed out a fact in the hope that we might grow interested. He had become annoyed when I asked why we didn't build skyscrapers out of bone. I knew the answer, of course. Bone is only stronger in low-grade steel. It is also only strong in certain directions, depending on the shape. Too much pressure in the wrong direction, and it snaps like a twig. Lastly... Bone rots, not an ideal building material. Still, even talking all that into consideration, my biology teacher was right. Skeletons were impressive. Your kind also has a slightly faster reaction time than most species. The science officer continued, possibly a product of living in a high gravity environment. You also integrate better with intelligent armor than most your kind seems to be more familiar with allowing something outside of your consciousness to control and manipulate your bodies. I really didn't like the sound of that. But this is all only relevant to ground troops, I said at last. Wouldn't your major battles be ship to ship? No, the science officer corrected me. The logistics involved in a ship to ship battles are too great to overcome. The distances are very large and it's impossible to provide complete coverage. Ship-to-ship -ship warfare is typically very brief where a number of defenses attempt to prevent forces from landing on a planet. Once they have accomplished that, though, it falls to the ground troops. Fine, I said. So why aren't you attacking the ground troops from the air? They fell into silence. Not understanding the body language or tactics, I was beginning to understand why the Chimera was coming up a little corner of hell. I mean, Earth. I let the baffled silence stretch out for a few minutes until everyone was good and uncomfortable with it, and then I decided to press on. Anatomy lessons aside, I said, you avoided my question. Why are you really here? The captain looked at the others before returning his case to me. The mouth flapped a few times and his legs bounced a bit in place, yet he did not stand. This was a new mannerism and I wasn't sure how to categorize it just yet. Discomfort, I thought. Our mission is not entirely official, the captain confessed. We're scouts. Scouts, I asked. Not the type that sells cookies, right? Because I gain ten pounds every year when they show up. He ignored me. When early detection warned of the Chimera were likely to attack, we thought it prudent to investigate the site of their previous weapon factory, he went on. You mean Earth, I said. Yes, he agreed. Your planet, although the blockade status has lapsed on your sector and was thought to be uncontaminated if no official investigation had ever been ordered. This region was the site of many battles and is still considered to be unsafe by many. 
Even with the threat of the Chimera imminent, High Command was reluctant to send craft in to perform a survey. Our authority, then, does not come from them. Whose authority do you answer to? I asked. The Blessed Horizon, he said after a briefest of pauses. I felt my stomach drop. You sound a lot like a church, I said. If it were possible for a semi-insect body to bustle, he's did at that. Do not compare the divine word of some mere body of worship, he seethed. You may mock me, you may mock my command, but the sacred word is only unvarnished truth is... Got you, I said, interrupting his rant. You're fanatics, and you probably ring doorbells at half-past hangover hours to have stimulating conversations with the heathens. So the entire lot of you of what? A religious order? Priests? No. The science officer corrected me. The captain is an acolyte. The rest of us are hired by the Blessed Horizon as, um, advisors and for potential military support. He's a priest and the rest of you are mercs, I stammered. Anything else you'd like to tell me? Does the ship actually belong to you, or was it stolen? The silence, as they say, was deafening. Jesus Christ, I shouted, you mean to tell me that the priest and four mercenaries stole someone's ship and are going around abducting strangers without the approval of your government? Well, the captain said, you are oversimplifying things to an extent. Our mission did not come from the High Command, no, but the Blessed Horizon, and its mission is to preserve the universe's harmony, and it is considered to be a peer to the High Command. Considered to be a peer? By whom? Who says that they have equal standing with the government? Well, he stammered, the Blessed Horizon, of course, but... Oh, how? You are missing the point, savage creature, the captain intoned. My authority is not the issue. The galaxy must know that the Chimera factory is still operational and that your species still exists. Moreover, your kind must choose to stand with us or be destroyed lest the Chimera use you against us. You know, that sounds exactly like the same offer you said the Chimera are offering. You misunderstand, he said. No, I don't think so, I interrupted. Join or die seems to be the same rhetoric no matter who is peddling it. How do I know the Chimera aren't on our side? They seem to be willing to let us live unmolested, which, I might add, is a bit more than your side did. You understand not the role of history nor your own involvement in this. What if I proved it to you? Someone interrupted. To everyone's apparent surprise, it was the science officer, Volsin. What? I asked. Prove what? That the Chimera meddled with your species, she said. That they did not leave you unmolested, but actively shaped you to be a weapon. I glared at her. Okay, I haven't wanted to bring this up, I told her. But we have this thing called a fossil record, and we've got pretty compelling evidence that humans evolved naturally. But you think that you can convince me that it's not true and that we were created? Not created, she corrected me. Altered to be used for a purpose of war. You've already seen your resistance to our energy weapons, which might be naturally occurring quirk, I continued. And you believe your aggressiveness and apparent gift for thinking with strategies is also natural? I don't see why not, I said. Follow me and I'll show you something that is not, she said. She stood up and led the way through the door. I wasn't sure if the invitation extended to the others present, but they seemed to think it did. As it was, I ended up being the last in the chain of pedestrians tromping down the hall to the room that I had originally started the entire affair in. The steel operating table still occupied in the middle of the room, but no one made any indication that I should climb upon it. A good thing, too. The view screen snapped on, and I saw a familiar image of a shriveled-up blob of lumpy pudding and formed a human brain. A normal human brain. A normal-looking ugly wrinkled lump of fat. This is a live scan of your own head, the science officer declared. Actually, now that I look at it again, it's actually a pretty attractive organ. Very streamlined and not at all fabby. Actually, it's downright sexy. And this, she went on, is the brain of a bot. 
A much larger and bulbous brain appeared on the screen next to my own. It was an unfashionable shade of orange, and to my eye, not nearly as attractive. Okay, yes, it was bigger, but it's not the size of the boat, but the happening of the synapting, baby. Now watch this, she went on. The screen flicked and I was watching a video which I assumed was taken from the second wave invasion. I based that on the fact that the velociraptor looking dinosaur with tiger striped skin and dual energy cannon strapped to its sides was racing across the screen with guns blazing while screaming at the top of its lungs. Then, without warning, it stopped firing its guns and collapsed on the ground without apparent injury. A moment later, a large shaggy purple thing that looked like Cousin It from the Adams Family shuffled into view. The video froze when the eight-foot-tall shag carpet reached the middle of the screen. This is a bocked. The science officer went on. They were amongst the more effective troops during the second wave and for the first part of the third. What you have just witnessed was their psionic attack. The bocked was amongst the more powerful size species that we have encountered. The screen flashed back to the side of the images and the two brains. Now I wish to draw your attention to this area. She said as she part of unsexy bocked brain lit up, the highlighted area separated from the mass. The larger brain disappeared leaving only the lobotomized fragma behind. And yeah, she said as a small segment of my own brain became highlighted. I really hoped that this part was being done in post-production and she wasn't irradiating my skull. A segment of my own brain separated itself and replaced the image of my own brain. I really, really hoped that this was post-production. The region on the right, she said, highlighting the bucked brain, represents a brain configuration that is present in all psionic species. Every species that develops psi abilities develops a configuration that is similar to this region. Are you watching? I nodded, but nothing happened. Oh yeah, that's right. They don't get non-verbal cues. I'm watching, I said. The bock brain scaled itself down to match the size of my own, and then the two pieces of brain were overlapped. They were nothing alike. Then the image in my fragment of my brain was flipped 180 degrees, and the image was distorted slightly. The two overlapping slices now lined up a lot better. I frowned. You see, this region is all size species, she repeated, including your own. Well, she almost had me going for a moment there. Yeah, I said, drawing out the word. Oh, about that. You are not psychic, she said for me. You know this is a psionic suppressor that is active on the ship, and you have not noticed. Yet, you seem to be able to read our thoughts anyway. You are also immune to the psionic attack. Have you questioned why this is so? Not really, I admitted. Until you guys showed up, I didn't know psionics was a thing. You are immune and can read our thoughts through whatever method you employ, because, alone in the universe, you are the only species that we've ever found where the neural region is hooked up backwards. I found myself leaning on a steel apparition of the table of support. What? I stammered. What does that mean? Your species was developing telepathy, she said. You even retain a crude version of it, but somewhere along the way, someone altered your genome and reconnected tissue and configuration that protected you from one of our most effective warrior species, and the cost of a level of intimacy few species ever obtain. I stared at the two overlaid images of the brain. It was ridiculous. It had to be a lie. It had to be. Or maybe it was just a coincidence. Maybe something else caused the odd arrangement, or maybe they didn't understand these psi abilities as well as they thought. Parallel evolution across galaxies and brain structure. Ridiculous. It was false. It had to be, because if it wasn't, that meant that every human condition, that maddening need to connect with someone and not feel alone inside their own skulls, to actually know someone to have them know you, wasn't just insanity stemming from a newly minted sapient brain in the ape's skull. It was a racial memory of something that we almost had and lost. I looked up from the screen. Tell me more about the Chimera, I said. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave Part 6 Written by Semi Loki I caught sight of the second one while I was still reaching for the first. 
With my right hand, I grasped the ball that one of the guards had tossed at me, half blind, as I wheeled around to catch the one above Volson, had thrown it to my left hand. Two at once! the science officer exclaimed. Not quite at once, I thought. There was a fraction of a second of delay between the two of them. Otherwise, I would have missed it entirely. I reduced gravity, helped a bit, and the balls fell slower, and the arcs they followed were wider, but left hands were still clumsy and stupid things. They had been doing tests like this for almost an hour. Jump over this hurdle, climb up this barrier, pull on this rope, and stand on one leg. I felt like I was back in gym class in high school. I was tiring, but, according to them, this was the first time they really got a chance to get a good biomechanical data on a human. I was tolerating it for the moment because, after I mentioned I didn't think that I could perform their tasks in a hazmat suit, they had allowed me to ditch the bulky thing, had even found me a pair of pants. That was the good news. I was dressed again. Apparently, when I'd been abducted, they hadn't been able to figure out the devilishly complex way that the blue jeans and polo shirt worked, so they had dissolved them. They can fly hundreds of light years across the gulf of space and find galactic planets around the specific star, but can't figure out how a zipper works. Then again, when I was 16 and trying to figure out how a bra worked for the first time, I probably should have used a dissolver as well. Ah, oh, heck. I'd use one now if they would lend it to me, but that's beside the point. The point was that they had managed to manufacture a shirt and a pair of pants for me after I described how they worked and why I was unwilling to climb knotted ropes without them. The cream white fabric had an unusual texture to it. It made me think of a canvas bag, but they were reasonably comfortable. Like I said, that was the good news. The bad news was they kept spraying me with this purple mist. As if the mere thought summoned twin nozzles poked from unseen recesses in the ceiling and erupted from a foul smelling fumes. I gagged and choked as the mist settled around me and nearly dropped my balls in my hands. Tears burned my eyes and, for the umpteenth time, I cursed the lyrics to a certain Jimi Hendrix song. Will you stop that? I gasped, choking breaths. Apologies, Volsian, said from inside her own hazmat suit, but we are still experiencing difficulties with the decontamination process. The microbes from your world are particularly resistant. Every time I think that you are cleansed, they start to recolonize. Lysol has the same problem, I said, and I finally caught my breath. The captain, who had been remaining silent much longer than I felt comfortable with, launched a ball in my direction. Okay, fine. If catching things out of the air impresses them, this next part should blow their minds. As the ball sailed in my direction, I tossed the ball in my hand upwards in a lazy arc in the direction of my left hand. When the ball reached its zenith, I swept my left hand inwards and launched the hand's ball up before circling it back to intercept the other ball. I caught the ball that the captain had thrown and lobbed it into the mix as well. Up and down, side to side. This is the way we juggle. I was too busy focusing on the progress of the balls and I was tossing from hand to hand to see my audience's reaction. But I heard the scrambling feet. Yeah, I chucked them good this time. Who knew that a party trick that I'd picked up as a teenager would pay dividends later on in life? I lobbed the balls higher and higher in arcs and started counting under my breath. If I got my timing right, this next part would really get them. Instead of throwing the balls into a circuit, I clutched two of them in my hands while the third floated lazily towards the ceiling. I bent one knee on the tiptoe that prepared for the spin. That's when the nozzles reappeared and sprayed me again, with the mist falling on the floor choking for breath while juggling balls bounce off my skull wasn't quite as impressive finale as I'd planned for, but it looked like I'd struck with it anyway. Stop it, I said again, your cure's worse than a disease. I am surprised, the captain said, that you have held out as long as this. We can cease testing. 
To my surprise, all five of them started undoing their hazmat suits. What in the world? I thought you said that I was infectious, I complained. You were, the captain said, but the nanobots we sent into your body have successfully neutralized most problematic microbes. The remaining ones may require sterilization tactics once we leave your solar system, but they are not dangerous. Then why have you been spraying me with an antibiotic mist? I complained. There were no antibiotics, he observed. That mist is used in chemical warfare. Extraordinary. Your resistance to our standard chemical warfare agents extends even to the microbes in your gut. It turns out those guys weren't nearly as heavy as they looked. It didn't make much of an effort to slam the captain to the wall and shove him upwards as his scrawny neck. I heard the guns being drawn but didn't move. You will hit the captain if you fire, Valson shouted. Good. Someone was paying attention after all. I shot a glance over my shoulder to make sure the guards had lowered their guns. When I returned my gaze to the captain, I saw his hand clutching for his bracelet. Uh-oh. I let go of him a split second before he had hit me. The invisible sumo wrestlers were back and I was flung bodily against the far wall. My spine felt as though it was jolted to pieces, but amazingly it actually held. I was bruised but otherwise intact. You promised to stop trying to kill me, I growled. I was confident of your survival, the captain said as he picked himself up off the floor. He was favoring one leg. I'd actually injured him when I dropped him. I'm not confident on your long-term survival, I said. Come on, turn off the force field and face me. Stop acting like a coward. Coward, the captain said. You wish to disarm myself, yet you always armed. You are a weapon. I should face a weapon without one. I growled in frustration. The wall was the floor and a giant was sitting on my chest. Wait, that gave me an idea. Captain, I said in a low voice, you still don't get it, do you? More of your gibberish, she asked. No, I grasped and fainted in a coughing fit. With a great effort, I managed to bring my arms and legs into my sides. My feet were now planting on the wall and they held fast. No, I repeated. This is why. Why humanity will pick the... the Chromera. Because I wish to know the limits of their weaponry, he said in a voice which is probably his species equivalent of scoff. No, I said, because you're... I let my voice trail off into a mumble. Curiosity got the better of him as he stepped closer to hear me better. I mentioned the two universal constants, right? One is hazmat suits. What? he asked. I said... I repeated in my normal speaking voice as I rolled my head in his direction. That's because you're a prick. I slammed my hands against the wall and kicked him off over my legs. The force pressing me down was too strong for me to get up and fully stand to the height side of the wall. That was okay. I only needed to lift a part way to be able to reach the head with my outstretched arms. My back slammed into the wall once again, painfully too. But then so did the captain's head. That looked a lot more painful. He slid down the side of the wall, leaving a trail of dark ooze behind him. The pressure cut out and I fell to the floor in a heap. I heard a click of guns being aimed at the moments before I blacked out, riding a wave of white-hot agony. Pain. I awoke to a world of pain. I hurt all over, and, judging by the feel, I was sky-clad and strapped to a steel operating table. This was starting to become a horrifying trend. I opened my eyes. I was back in the white room that I had started out in, giving me an eerie sense of deja vu, almost as if the past few hours had been a weird dream that occurred while I waited for the probing. Except... Except it wasn't the same... For one thing, my back still hurt. I was going to be sporting some hefty bruises for a while. The muscles on my legs and shoulders still ached from the last surge of effort to lift myself off the wall. That in itself would be enough to convince me that I really hadn't been dreaming. Plus, there was the fact that they had doubled the number of straps and invisible sumo wrestlers' weight was pressing down on me, making it difficult to even wriggle my fingers. 
but to me, bruises were the big selling point. The wall flashed and Valson's figure hurried in. Am I being detained? I croaked between labored breaths. If I turn these restrained fields off, will you attack me? She asked. Captain broke his word first, I said. I kept mine. You did, she agreed. The weight disappeared and I could breathe normally. Thanks, I said, after catching my breath. You have no idea how hard it is to breathe under that. No, I do not, she said. The pressure load would have caused me great harm and potentially killed me. I frowned. You're not still testing me, are you? I asked. No, she said. You were restrained by one of the guards. I came directly here when sensors indicated that you were waking. Uh-huh, I said, and then with all of my casualness I could muster, I asked. Where's the captain? Captain Cock was injured when he's still in surgery. Injured as in injured, or injured as in temporarily killed, I asked. As in dead, she admitted. His body is recovering now, but there may still be some long-term neural damage from the head injury he sustained. I can't say that I'm disappointed, I muttered, and then realization drawn on me. I returned to something I said earlier. His name is Cock. That's too perfect. He repeated his name with the correct pronunciation. Quack, she said with emphasis on the KW sound in the beginning. Cock, I said back. Damn human vocal limitations. Just can't get that sound right. Well, as far as she knew, she gave up. You should probably continue to refer to him as the Captain or Excellency, she said. That is his other title. No, I said. I think I know which of the three is his real title. What happens now? Now? She asked and stepped forward, her hands fluttering all over the buckles and straps, and I found myself free once more. Now, she said, I risk my life under the hope that you really are an honorable creature and will do me no harm even though I was the one who sprayed you with the toxin. I sat up and stretched my aching muscles. I assume you did so because of the captain, I asked. Yes, she said, and I pledge my loyalty to him. Well, I guess that's understandable then. So, why are you letting me go now? Her mouth flapped a few times and began with agitation waltz that I'd seen earlier. The Blessed Horizon, she said, is not a mere religion as you think of it. It is a way of life, a philosophy, and a life's mission. Heard it before with other religions, I replied as I swung my legs over the side of the table and tried to find my footing. Every faith believes they're special and more than the others. This faith was founded as a consequence of the results of the first wave, she said. Before, the sentient races truly united for a specific cause of repelling the attackers. I was far from a historian, but even I knew alliances based on an enemy of my enemy model rarely turned out well. Your galactic government formed because of the Chimera, I asked. And the Blessed Horizon, she repeated. Their faith is one of the protecting life from the forces of evil. Evil, which is easily personified in the form of the Chimera. And that's why he wants to kill me, I asked. Because the Chimera mucked with our DNA in the past. More than that, she said. He is conflicted. If you ally with the Chimera, we will not be able to repel the latest attack. If you ally with us, we may be able to finally crush the Chimera. That's a good thing, right? I asked, and then it hit me. That's a bad thing, I corrected. If the strength of the government and the church come from this every present boogeyman, then by removing it, it destabilizes everything. Yes, she said, which is why I do what I do. Which is what? I asked. She touched a portion of the wall and the compartment opened. Those cream-white garments that they had provided for me earlier were inside, as well as a pair of slip-on shoes made out of a tougher material. I mean to collect a larger sample size with your assistance and convey you back to the High Command, she informed me. You want me to help you kidnap more humans? I asked in disbelief. What makes you think I'll go along with that? 
Because, she said, while the Blessed Horizon is not officially part of the governing body, it does have its influence. The ship's surgery facilities can only perform a limited degree of repair on the captain. For the time being, I can declare him unfit for duty and, as I am a second in command, take command of the vessel. However, once we report back to the galactic post where an actual medical facility can repair him or evaluate his fitness for duty, then the ship reverts back to him. It'll be him pleading for action against your planet. If, however, we provide a number of species and proof of sentient life still exist here, and your potential usefulness as an ally, we may yet save all the life on your planet. Do you know, I said, I think kidnappers may get a bad reputation. Let's get a few gunny sacks and spray paint free candy on the side of a van. I do not understand your words. Then they probably aren't important, I said. How do we get to Earth? We can take a launch, she said. The vessel should be large enough to convey us and four more of your species back to the ship. And from here, we can get to the nearest outpost in three of your days. Fine, I said as I tugged the loose-footing clothing. What's to keep Cock from trying to take back the ship while you were gone? The soldiers and I work for the same employer, she said. I am their supervisor until I yield command back to the captain. They will answer to me alone, for now. Captain cocked up, I crackled. No, he's still sedated for now, she corrected me. I didn't bother explaining myself that time. Just take me to the launch, I said. The doors reappeared and she led me into a hallway that she paused and glanced back at me. Before we proceed, I have a scientific inquiry about your species, the science officer said. Oh, can I wait, I asked. It's a simple query and one I wish to address before we land upon your planet. Fine, I said, sighing in exasperation. What is it? Could you tell me more about this earth thing called, uh, kissing? Definitely not having this conversation now. I snapped and resumed walking. The science officer hesitated before stepping in front of me to lead the way once more. To my considerable annoyance, the launch turned out to be a room that I had first visited and discovered in my initial escape and had dismissed as the dining area. What could I say? A lifetime of sci-fi movies had conditioned me to think of escape pods as either the diving bells or space minivans. A room full of tables just didn't register as a place for making a daring escape. Volson led me to one of the tables and, after making sure where I was standing, she touched a specific spot on the table. Smooth walls appeared and isolated us from the rest of the room. The walls were made of the same glowing white material as the rest of the ship, and they joined seamlessly with the floor and ceiling. It was like being on the inside of a soda can with furniture. Wilson touched another spot on the table, and I thought I felt the faintest jolt run from the soles of my feet and up my legs. Still, I wasn't sure where we were even moving until she touched another point and everything went black. Well, everything except the stars. It didn't grow dark because the lights went out. She had done something similar to that view screen trick from earlier when now the entire inside of the ship was one large view screen. It was like the two of us were hovering in space with the tabletop floating between us. She touched another part of the table and everything rotated until a familiar looking blue marble came into view. I turned around to look behind and saw the white shape of a flying saucer that would have looked perfectly at home in a 1950s Space Invader movie. What's it with you guys in the color white? I muttered. Bolson apparently heard me, but instead of answering, I heard her touch the table from behind me. The spaceship ahead of me burst into a technicolor flames. The aurora of incandescent colors shifted and whirled around the exterior of the ship, while psychedelic blobs merged into one another and constantly shifting patterns along the skin of the ship. The view lasted only a few seconds before a familiar-looking white shape returned. Apologies, the officer said. I find it difficult to navigate if I shift the spectrum over that far. I am half-blind then. 
I was an idiot, of course the aliens wouldn't see it the same spectrum I did. With those insectoid eyes, they probably didn't even see ships the same way. Why had I assumed eyesight would be the same as everywhere? That's alright, I said. Do those colors and shapes mean anything, or is it decorative? Decorative, the science officer asked. I'm not certain that the word translates correctly. The chromatic discharges are a byproduct of the interactions between the ship's engines, synthetic gravity, and the sensor array. We can observe the status of the ship at any given moment from anywhere just by observing the pattern locks. I turned around and looked back at Earth. The planet had grown larger for a brief moment. I had been turned around. I almost asked her to shift the view again so that I could see what my home world looked like to her, but decided against it. Instead, I took a step back into nothingness until I felt the invisible wall press against my back. I leaned into it and yawned, other than a couple of bouts of being shot until I was unconscious, which I didn't think counted. I hadn't slept since the night before. How long had I been awake for now? What is the purpose of that? She asked me suddenly. What? It was as if you were attempting to ingest your own hand, she said. Is autocannibalism a common thing amongst your species? Eating my hand. Oh, she meant when I covered my yawn with a bald fist. No, I said, that's yawning. I was just covering my mouth. Unless the second coming took place while I was away and Jesus went on a Eucharist plunge, I'm fairly certain that we won't find any auto-cannibalism. I'm not following your words again, she informed me. I get that a lot, I said and decided to answer her question. Yawning is something we do when we are tired. Tired? she asked. You've exerted yourself too much. No, I corrected, as in I need to sleep. We need to do that fairly often. Sleep, she recited as if reading from a dictionary, a restorative state characterized by immobility and reduced consciousness. Curious. Your kind doesn't sleep, I asked. No, she said, that would be ill-advised with my species. Why is that, I asked. Many of our biological systems require active and deliberate regulation, she explained. If not, attached to an artificial life support system, a lapse in consciousness for an extended period of time could prove fatal. If I understood it correctly, her physiology required her attention to make it work. It was almost the reverse of my own biology, which required very little attention. I was used to things just working on their own. Suddenly, an earlier comment of theirs made it fall into place. What was it? Something about humans adapting to intelligent armor more readily. I thought about how so much of my life was essentially riding along in a body working on automatic pilot. I didn't have to think about how food was suggested or how to mend the cut to the skin. My body took care of that. Reflexes took care of complicated actions that I no longer had to think about. I didn't have to think about how to place my feet when running or how to balance when riding a cycle. I was used to something else running the show for me, behind the scenes while on my active mind concentrated on more important details. Maybe that's what wearing intelligent armor would be like. Maybe it was more familiar sensation to my species than to some others. I was so wrapped up in my thoughts that I almost missed it when we entered Earth's atmosphere. We flew in a gentle angle and gradually lowered our altitude. There were no microphones, all the craft really did not make any noise when it approached. Silently, we sailed through the sky until we were directly above my city. Then, we dropped like a stone. We rushed downwards like I was in a jet-powered elevator. I gripped the table by the reflex and I was certain that I would be hurled towards the ceiling, but... No, I still felt no motion. It was like a zoom lens from a high pointed to the ground. The ground surged upwards and I was in the park once more, without so much as a shudder when we landed. The outside world faded, and Wilson opened up a compartment from the underside of the table and drew out a familiar looking hazmat suit. I waited while she suited up before I spoke up. We may want to think about the best place to hide the ship before we... I started to say, but shut up when I found my feet upon the grass. 
We were outside once more. The ship was gone. All that remained was a tabletop lying on the grass before us. Carlson leaned forward and touched the tabletop surface. The table flattened before folding in on itself. Two more folds took place and I was now looking at a white rectangle about the size of an ironing board. Could you carry it, please? Walson remarked. Your planet's gravity may make it awkward for me. I barely noticed any shift in gravity. I knelt in the grass and tucked the whiteboard under my arm and started walking. Where are we going? She asked as she fell into step behind me. Her feet were landing heavier than they had on the ship. Back to my apartment, I told her. The sun will be rising soon and we'll probably want you out of sight before someone starts asking why there's a person with a hazmat suit in the park. I'm not sure she understood me, but she followed anyway. I was actually surprised to see that the sky was only starting to turn pink, and it felt like I had been on board their ship for much longer than a single night. We should discuss strategy, Volson said from behind me as we neared the edge of the park. Strategy? For what? I asked. For obtaining specimens, she said quickly. How might we best approach people to explain to them what is needed? Yeah, I said grimly. This might not be the time for full disclosure. We probably don't want to tell people everything right away. Why is that? Well, I said, posing beside my apartment building and allowing Wilson a moment to recover. I'm not sure how things work at your planet by telling strangers that I'm looking for volunteers to plead our case before a space court to prevent human race from being exterminated and a galactic turf war probably won't work. It's just not done. I don't know, a voice slurred nearby. If it's indoor work, I might be willing to go. I leapt backwards in surprise and nearly dropped the folded up remains of the ship. I hadn't even seen that there was someone sitting in the shadows next to the stairs. The man appeared to be in his late thirties and I was fairly certain that he was homeless. He had a scruffy beard covering his chin and wore a filthy sweatshirt and jeans. He reeked of cheap alcohol and despair. In the back of my mind, I wondered if the reason that I didn't see him was because of the shadows or was I so jaded that I ignored the homeless. There's a human here, Volson said. I noticed that, I said. Come on, let's get you inside. Thanks, buddy, the homeless man replied as he struggled to his feet. Not you. I was talking to her. That's a lady, he asked as he shook his head. Son, there's better ways to spend your money. Thanks for the advice, I said, but she's actually my partner in an interstellar kidnapping scheme. He seemed to consider that. My scanner shows that this human is quite ill, Volson said from behind me. There is extensive damage to his internal organs. If he were recruited, he would have to spend much of the trip in the ship's surgery. I looked back and found the science officer was holding an odd-looking instrument in her hand, pointing it at the homeless man. Say, fellow, the homeless man sputtered, what's that thing your friend's pointing at me do? The man pressed himself back into the darkness and looked as if he was prepared to take a flight. The sun had crested on the horizon slightly and I could make out more of his features. I could now see that he was probably Hispanic. Deathly thin with sunken eyes too. It was difficult to tell in this feeble light, but I thought that he had drawn the looks about him as well. I sighed. Change my mind, buddy, I said. You can come with us too. I'll make some breakfast while the lady here tells you all about it. I pushed open my front door and the homeless man and the alien entered behind me. I flipped on the light and the man screamed. Jesus Christ, he yelled. It's not human. Notice that, I said and started for the kitchen. Human, Wilson said to me as I started walking away. Jason, I replied. My name is Jason. Lee Rodriguez, the homeless man answered. Again, he was confused about who I was talking to. I was talking to her, I said. She understands you, Lee said. Of course she. Oh yeah, that's right, I smacked my head. I can only understand her because... because... Why the hell can I understand you? We implanted a symbiote into your system that attaches itself to your brain and links you to the ship's systems to provide instantaneous translation, she said. Because magic, I translated. Magic. 
Right. Lee said uncertainly as he eyed the door. Anyway, we can hook him up to with a symbiote. I asked the alien from the corner of my mouth. That is why I asked my question earlier, she said quickly. I believe there is a way I can induce a fragment of your symbiote to enter this one's body and attach to his brain. Great, I said. What question and what do I have to do? Kiss him. I glanced at the dirty bearded man and then back at Wilson. And, um, what's plan B? I asked. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 7, written by Sebi Loki. Bacon sizzled on the skillet as I whipped two eggs and yolks together for an omelette. There are things you can do in life and things that you cannot. I can make breakfast. From my bathroom I heard the sound of rushing water. Lee can take a shower. Vulcian paced back and forth in front of me. The science officer cannot convince me to kiss the homeless guy, and I don't care how much of a nice he scrubs up. Spurt on his food, I suggest. That's about the same thing, right? The symbiote perishes outside the host, she explains. It's a feature to keep it from becoming a rogue infection. Inducing it to replicate in your saliva glands is pushing it to the limits that will allow. I cannot override the exposure perimeters. Toast popped out as I transferred that to the freshly cooked bacon on the plate. The eggs went into the skillet on the top of the still hot bacon grease. I know, unhealthy, and I imagine disgusting. Tasty, though. The water cut off in the bathroom and Lee had joined them again. Look, I said, I'm not kissing him. But, she said as she planted the thorax on the ground and turned to face me. In my research, I found many examples taking place between humans. It is an acceptable vector of transmission and is the way the symbiote does not have to relearn your language and neural anatomy as it has already has a template. No, I repeat. It's not just done that way. Kissing is a intimate thing. And you will make no exception, she asked. No, I said as I took the eggs in the burner and turned to face her with arms crossed over my chest. Very well, she said. If I work at it, I think I can adapt it to less intimate method of transmission. That is if my research is correct, and I'm inferring correctly from your documentary, Pretty Woman. That one took me a second to figure out. No, definitely not, I shouted. But if it's a matter of one of intimacy, don't believe anything Richard Gere tells you, I interrupted her. Ask the gerbils if you want proof. I do not understand, she admitted. Just... Trust me on this one, I supplied lamely. Think of it as a taboo if it helps. When we interfaced with your internet, we found that taboo dominated the majority of information feeds. We're bad at taboos, I said. Just find another way, or else I'll have to service your translator until we get to the ship. As you wish, she agreed. Even with my fledgling alien bloody language knowledge, I could tell that she was unhappy. Didn't matter. Sometimes you just have to remain firm. I carried the plate to the table and decided that I had stalled long enough and it was time to deal with another bit of business. You said that it would take at least three days to get your closest outpost, I asked. How long will it take from there to plead your case to the High Command? The High Command will likely demand that we attend them at the Overseer, she explained. The central government planet located near the Galactic Hub. Our current vessel is slow, but uh, even if we did secure a more rapid transport... It would take several of your weeks to voyage to Overseer. The trial itself may take a day or a year. It's a difficult matter full of subtleties. Right, I said while holding up one finger. Hold that thought. I gotta make a phone call. My cell had disappeared along with my clothes and my wallet on the ship the night before. I'd only been able to enter my apartment because I kept the space key taped to the back of the light fixture above the door. Fortunately, it still retained the landline in my apartment. I picked up the phone from its cradle and punched in the number. Hey, boss, I said soon as I heard him pick up, not giving him a chance to speak. Reese, he said, aren't you supposed to be here in five minutes? Oh, I would be, I told him, but the line here at the free clinic is really long. Anyway, I don't have your daughter's personal number, so can you tell her for me that someone in the gangbang had the clap? What? Don't worry about it, I said. They've already got her name on file down here and everything. She knows the procedure. Heck, her and your wife are pretty much regulars down here. What? 
Just tell her that I already called the guy with the clown makeup and he's on his way to get checked out, I said, but she's going to have to contact the football team herself, since she's the one that brought them. Reese, I'm going to- Oh, I said, not getting him to finish. Tell your wife that the biker guy really did cut his lip shaving, so she's in the clear. Don't bother coming in, you're fired! There was a slam following the ringtone. Okay, I said, time away from work is taken care of. Now to settle things with my landlord. I had to look up the next number. Hello, I said. Is this the tip line? Yeah, I'd like to make an anonymous tip of the location of a meth lab. I was about to go on when I heard someone say behind me, Man, you're burning more bridges than I ever did. I gave the address and hung up before turning around. Lee entered the room mopping up his hair with a towel. Oh well, I assumed it was Lee. I had given him an old t-shirt of mine, but he was half a shade shorter than me, and none of my pants would fit. He still wore his grubby sweatpants, and he had showered and borrowed a razor to shave. The combined effect was staggering. He looked both younger and stronger than before. The shirt clung tightly to his chest in ways that it never did with my own. It had been hard to tell under the baggy clothes and filth, but Lee actually had quite a bit of muscle tone. It was probably only a fraction of whatever it once had been before he had hit upon hard times, but it was still enough to make me envious. We may be gone for up to a year, I said. Might as well have a good reason. So you're going to have the police raid your empty apartment in a drunk bus? No, I said. That's my landlord's address. He let out a low whistle before he caught sight of the table and two plates of steaming food. I saw him stiffen with the effort of self-restraint. He really must be starving. Sit, I commanded, eat. I told you I would serve you breakfast. He didn't need any additional encouragement. He picked up the fork and practically shoveled the eggs into his mouth. I'm barely average chef, but from the looks of the bliss on his face, I was able to surmise that it had been a while since he last ate. You're okay with being gone for after a year? I asked him as he bit into the slice of toast. He rolled his eyes in my direction. Well, he said after swallowing, I might have to consult a real estate agent to find a choice alley like the one that I've been sleeping in, but I guess I can give up the life of Riley for a year or so. Fine, I said, holding up my hands in surrender. One down, but I don't think that it'll be as easy to find the second. The phone rang, huh? I picked it up without even bothering to look at the caller ID. Reese! The voice screeched in my ear. What? Have you been telling my father? He kicked me out of the house. Don't even think of trying to weasel out of this. I'm coming over there to kill you. She hung up upon me without even letting me get a word in edgewise. I looked up at the alien creature still quietly in my living room. Okay. I went on as if the interruption never took place. Don't expect it to be easy to find a third recruit. Forty-five minutes later, the door shook in the frame from the force exerted by the pounding fist. Heather was definitely mad. I drained the sink and wiped my hands on my pants and went to the answer the door. If I was going to be gone for a year, there was no reason to leave the sink full of dirty dishes. The staccato burst of the fist thumping repeated punctuated with a few choice shouts of profanity and false accusations about my family tree. I remained silent and waited in front of the door for her to stop shouting, and waited until I thought that she was winding up for a fresh assault on my door. I yanked it open, stood aside, and a fist flashed through the door frame with such a force that it actually dragged her inside. Hey there, Heather, I said as I looped my arm around her shoulder and pushed her the rest of the way in. How are you doing these days? She shook my arm free before responding. I kicked the door closed behind her and she wheeled her face me. My daddy cut me off all because you're spinning some wild stories about a drug-fueled sex parties. I never said anything about drugs, I protested. I'll call him right back and tell him that you're a sober slut. Whenever they carpeted my apartment, earth tones must have been on sale. At first glance, it seems to be just a uniform sandy brown, but upon closer inspection, it turns out that there's a very subtle pattern amongst the fibers, almost like cross-hatching. I never really noticed it before, but you are doubled over, clutching your stomach, with your eye inches away from the floor. You get a long time to really look at the carpeting. You ass, she shouted, I'm going to... Who are these people? 
Heather, I said as I was pondering how cozy the carpeting looked right about then. This is Lee, and this is Volsian. At least one of them is an alien. Don't look at me, Lee supplied. I was born in LA. Heather screamed. That was my cue. Despite the fact that she had just sucker punched me and possibly liquefied my pancreas, Heather and I go way back and she deserved to have this handled a little delicately. Calm down, I said as I pulled myself upwards. She showed me this book called How to Serve Mankind, so I think that they're on the level. I darted away from a foot which lashed out in my direction. Tell me, this is some sort of Halloween costume, she demanded. No, I said, looking over at Lee. He always dresses that way. What's going on, Reese? she asked. Sit down, I am waving at the table. This is going to take some time. Are you willing to kiss this one? Vilsian asked suddenly, Heather yipped in surprise and stared at the alien wide-eyed. For once I saw to was glad that I was the only one who could understand the science officer. Willing, yes, I said, but I don't like my odds of survival. I used to carry a bit of a torch for Heather, a bit more than a birthday candle, but not quite a votive. When I started working with the daddy's company, things had been soured a bit between us. Once I realized that half of her DNA belonged to the Prince of Lies. My boss, now former boss I guess, is just pure evil. He runs his company like a tight ship, a gaddy in fact, except the gaddy of slaves have a better union. But I didn't realize that until I set foot into his company. Akea Management Solutions, with stars in my eyes and an unblemished resume in my hand. The only thing that keeps Vincent Akea from being considered a pure scum is that scum won't sink to his level. He abuses his employees, cheats his clients, and he keeps a small army of half-starved rabid lawyers on a short leash. How this man managed to convince Heather's mother to not only leave Ireland, but marry him, is a mystery that I'll never understand. I assume that there is some sort of blackmail involved. Heather is their only child, half Italian, half Irish. She started out life as a gawky and awkward-looking girl, with a face full of freckles and a bony frame. Even though her family was wealthy, they managed to alienate half of the town in becoming so. Without looks or rich kid status to help her out, Heather tended to float about the lower echelons of the pecking order of school, which put her close to my orbit. We weren't exactly friends during that time, but we were friendly. She was kind, she was smart, and she had a good personality. By the time we were in high school, seeing as she was one of the few people near my own social level who didn't have a Y chromosome, I started to slowly and methodically make my move. If things had gone to plan in about six or seven years, I would have asked her out. Unfortunately, puberty hit both of us at the same time. To her, I gave curves and an exotic sort of beauty that has a heart to define. To me, it visited several biblical plagues upon my face. I hit the pause button on any thoughts of romance until after I could go out in public without a burlap sap over my face. During that time, Heather slowly shot up the ranks with the outcast to Super Babe, the kinky, dark locks of hair because of waterfall of turbulent waves of the color of a warm mocha. The freckles faded and meddled into her face with high cheekbones, emerald eyes, and full lips. Below the neckline, the changes were even more enticing. She now had multiple suitors for her affection, and I was cast back into the pit once more. For those keeping score, that meant Heather and I went from strangers to acquaintances to potential lovers and back to down to friends, down to acquaintances, and judging by her current attitude, down to bitter enemies. Still, I thought I could rescue the situation. First of all, I said as she sat down at the table, it really could have been anybody who was dunking urinal cakes into your dad's coffee, and there'll be ever be anybody to prove it was me. Jason! Fine, I said. Here's the situation. I needed your dad to fire me because I might be away from this planet for a year or more, because an alien race of genetic slavers that used to use Earth as a weapons factory of cyborg dinosaurs and Neanderthals in mech suits might be coming back any minute. I've got to talk to the other side into not preemptively wiping out our entire species because they are afraid that we might side against them. They've already tried getting us off all for once before, and I don't know if I'm up to making a good sales pitch, but since no one else is volunteering, I'm going. 
I had to pant to catch my breath and then reflected on what I had just said. Ever hear a story so off the wall that it can't possibly be true? Now add robo dinosaurs and killer Neanderthals to it. I didn't even believe me and I was the one who had the alien sitting on the floor to prove it. Let me try this again, I said. You're crazy, Heather declared. Jason, we are wasting time, Bolsian spoke up. If you'll kiss this human, I can explain everything. I don't think she'll go for it, I muttered back. Go for what? Heather asked. Is that monster talking about me? It's not a monster, Volsian protested. Your kind are the monsters. Ladies, Lees, I said, holding up our hands in a placating expression. Ladies, Heather asked, are you telling me that it's a woman? It's about to ask the same question, Volsian admitted. Could you please identify the characteristics that identify her gender? Wait, stop, I said, looking from side to side. I'm having trouble keeping up with two conversations at one. Two conversations? Heather asked. That sounds more like someone banging on a guitar with too much feedback. You can understand that. Yes, I said, shooting a look at her. They abducted me last night and put something inside of me. I've heard about that, Lee said, nodding. Need a pillow to sit on. Not like that, I protested. It's in my head, I think. Anyway, it allows me to understand them. This is another one of your dad tricks, isn't it? Heather asked. This is some dumb joke or something. It's probably a puppet or something. Lee shrugged. Once again, don't look at me, he said with a shrug. I just came because he promised me a hot meal. I was getting frustrated. Look, I began. If you could just give me a moment to explain this, I'll... No more games. Heather snapped at me. No more puppets, no more tricks. I'm taking you to father right now and you can tell him that... I didn't have time for this. I ran towards her, and before she could flinch away, I placed my hands on her cheeks, and I kissed her. Slaps hurt. A lot. I managed to muddle through the pain of the first two, but the third knocked me onto the floor. Please tell me that did it. I groaned from the floor without looking up. I believe so, Balson said. It will take a moment for the integration to fully seat itself. Heather screamed again. That creature just spoke, she yelped. It all sounds like noise to me, Lee said. You can understand it. Uh, a little, Heather admitted. What's going on? Symbiote, I said as I slumped into a seat position. Only way to transfer it. If you'll transfer the symbiote to the last year, then perhaps I can help illuminate the situation. I am not kissing him, I said. Hey, Lee spoke up. You ain't the only one who gets to vote, yeah? I'm saying no as well. Fine, Heather said while throwing her hands up in the air. But no tongue. Ten minutes later, and we were sitting on the floor as Volson brought our projector out and the image of dinosaurs fighting spaceships appeared on my apartment wall. I tried not to glare at Lee or the goofy grin on his face. The projection on the wall of my apartment lacked the depth and resolution of the videos that I had viewed on the ship. Still, it was hard to completely remove oneself from its chilling depiction of the violence of the second and third waves. Seeing is really believing. As Volson spoke and the videos rolled, I could see the skepticism of the other two humans in the room start to wane. I really wanted to pay attention to their reactions, but could not, as some of the Volson was saying was new to even me. The Chimera, she explained, as the videos shifted to an image of a dark green ship, have shaped their entire civilization for one purpose, the unification of all species into one organism, or, if you follow their beliefs, a reunification. The image zoomed in on the ship, and it had a shape of a tapered cylinder, with three tall pyramid shapes sprouting from the back at an angle, giving it the appearance of a dart. According to their beliefs, she went on, all life in our galaxy was seeded. Panspermia. Heather interjected. In a sense, the science officer agreed, but with one important difference. They believed that life was seeded from an ancient and superior life form, the super sentient species. They maintain that this species held sole dominion over our galaxy, as well as several others over the millennia. Then, through some unknown process, they were shattered into component pieces. The Chimera view themselves as a remnant of the super sentient. The mere shadow of the tiniest part of what was once the great and powerful being. 
They have dedicated themselves to reassembling the pieces that were scattered about the galaxy and reforming the parent species. How do they plan on doing that? Lee asked. They are superb genetic engineers, Volsian explained, far superior to the skill level of any of the allied species. The Chimera view evolution as a uh, distillation process, a method of concentrating the strongest part of the individual particle that originally seeded the planet. Therefore, whenever they encounter a planet with indigenous life, they seek out the dominant life form and absorb it into their own makeup. They genetically engineer themselves to accommodate whatever trait they feel is the most key from the species and reshape the species into a new chimera. Like the Borg, Heather hissed, I leaned in closer to whisper in my response. Two things I whispered to her. From my own personal observation, I can confirm that any comparison to Star Trek is going to leave you disappointed. Two, are you actually secretly a nerd? I had to retreat a bit before the backhand swung from her. Confirmation, enough, cute, smart, and she liked Star Trek. If her father wasn't the Antichrist, I'd think that I'd have found a golden fleece of hotties. Every time the Chimera reappear, she went on, they are like a new species. We cannot predict their appearance, their capabilities, or their technology. The only constant is the fanatical belief that they are reshaping themselves into the great creature. How do humans figure into all of this? Lee asked. The hazmat suit made it hard to read her body language, but I thought I detected such shift in posture that made me think that she was trying to present a smaller target. She was afraid that the next part might anger us. We believe, she said slowly, that the reason why the Chimera have returned to your planet time and time again is that they, uh, believe that, um, the particle that landed here was the, um, um super sentience, uh, aggression. The reason they did not assimilate your species into their own was that they likely did not feel that it was completely expressed yet. We're not evolved enough, I asked. Nor were the dragons, she pointed out quickly. But yes, they are likely waiting for an ultimate violent specimen to claim dominion over the world, to claim possession of its genome. Until that time, they feel that any resculpting they do for your genetic code only accelerates your predestined outcome. Lee rubbed his scalp. My head hurts, he said. Got anything to drink around you? Your discomfort is secondary to the binding process of the symbiote, Volson said helpfully. It must learn your unique neural pathways. The sensation of it affixing itself to your brain is interpreted as pain. However, as your own symbiotes are the descendant from the one affixed to Jason, they already have a working template and the process should be much more rapid and less discomforting. You honestly think my brain has similarities to his? Heather asked while pointing at me. Almost the same time Lee added, That's not why my head hurts. Basically, I felt the love in the room and I was certain the mission was doomed before we even left the ground. Oh yeah, nothing every minute of this. Priorities, people, I spoke up, just to add a general confusion. We've got to make the best of the situation while we can. What situation? Heather asked. That an alien race is bearing down on us to turn us into foot soldiers for their war machine, and our only hope is to be foot soldiers for another war machine. Not that situation, I corrected. I mean the part where the captain is currently out of commission, so we get a reprieve from him destroying the Earth. Why is the captain out of commission and why does he give us the reprieve? Heather asked. Crap, I muttered, we haven't got to that part yet. Um, long story short, the ship came here and was chartered by a religious order, and they hate the Chimera so passionately that the captain can't bring himself to not destroy us. He tried to kill me, so I sort of bashed his brains in. Just a bit. But while he's recovering, Volson has control of the ship. Mouthwash will do, Lee went on. Or a cough syrup, even. Just tell me what you got and I'll give you the dosage. And why does she want to help us? Heather interrupted, giving me a chance to respond to Lee. Because, uh, I stammered. Wait, I hadn't asked that part. Why was that again? Oh yeah, I was too excited about not being dead part. I turned to face the science officer. She definitely retreated from my gaze this time. Is it enough to know that I have reasons? No, I insisted. It is not. We're trusting our lives to you and all I know about you is that you and Captain Cock both had me kidnapped. Other than that, all I know is what you told me and, um, oh hell. I'm an idiot. 
I've been saying that for years, Heather agreed. She's a merc, I went on. Captain Cock hired a bunch of mercs to crew his ship. She found an entire planet full of violent psychopaths. You think she wants to recruit our species to her company? Heather asked. Valson made herself even smaller. I could not see her mouth, but guessed that had I seen it, her mouth would be flapping. You know, Lee said at last, cologne works too, in a pinch. I yelped in pain as someone gripped my earlobe and tugged. A word with you? Heather said in a low voice as she tugged me by the ear out of the room and into the kitchen. Mercifully, she let go and allowed me a chance to rub some feeling back into my ear, before laying into me with a verbal assault and battery. What have you gotten us into? she hissed. Me, mostly, I said, and maybe Lee, but you are still free to walk away. Answer the question. I am answering it, I replied testily. I just not something that I can jump into, all right? I need to build it up to it. She crossed her arms across her chest and tapped her foot patiently. Okay, I said, you know the gist of it. Humanity may be doomed if we don't put on a good show and prove that we aren't worth wiping out. Looks like we have a merc outfit that may be on our side, but a church that wants to exterminate us. If we don't convince the high and mighties to save us and somehow we survive their attempt to wipe us out, another group may enslave us and tinker with our genome for their own amusement. I got all of that, she said. But why us? Why you? Oh, I thought about it. I'm like mostly. I was the one they picked up to abduct. So why are you still sticking around? Don't you think that you should find someone more qualified? Like who, I asked. Tell me who is an expert in intergalactic negotiations and I'll phone them up. In the meantime, we're sort of past for time. I got us into the situation and if there is some way that I can get us back out, I'm going to try. Besides, I took a deep breath before confessing this part. It's a chance to see a brand new world, I said in a lower voice. How can I pass that up? And Lee? She asked, cocking an eyebrow at me. I shrugged. Volsen says he's sick, I said. She said that it would take the entire trip in the nearest outpost to fix him up. That's three days. They brought a guard back to the dead a few hours ago. So, if he takes three days to fix him up, I figured it was something pretty bad. This may be his best shot at survival. So you are going to just whisk him off to help you in some interstellar rescue mission? Didn't you even ask if he has family? Or what about his job? I lost my job six months ago, Lee interrupted us, and I don't have any family to speak of. Your friend here is right, by the way, ma'am. It's bad. Pancreatic cancer. I looked up in surprise and Lee had entered the kitchen without me seeing him. He was leaning against the doorframe and staring fixedly at us. Noticing that he now had our attention, he casually stepped into the room and shrugged his shoulders. Medical bankruptcy, he said. I didn't always live on the street, you know. Yeah, Heather stammered. How much did you hear? Little tip, he said. If you want to keep things secret, try not shouting. Heather glanced away and had the decency to look sheepish. Lee turned his gaze upon me. Do you really think that they can patch me up? I nodded. Balson seems to think so, I admitted, and part of the reason that we were supposedly effective soldiers during the last invasion was that we were considered easy to repair. I would think that that would still be true after a few thousand years of advancement. He took a step back and rubbed his chin. How many are going on this little trip? he asked. Five total, I said, so me and four others. If the two of you are going, then that means we have room for two more. Lee nodded once and looked around. I need to find my shoes, he said. I gotta get out of here. My heart sunk slightly. So, uh, you're out, I asked. No, I'm definitely in, he said. If they can cure me and I need to make sure that I live long enough to enjoy my pancreas. But I have someone in mind for a fourth member. But, I stammered, and I know who to ask to be our fifth, Heather interrupted. Can you give me a lift downtown, Lee asked her. She nodded. It's on my way, she agreed. Wait, I said. Do we need to discuss this? Did you consult anyone before you drafted us? Heather asked. There wasn't anyone to ask, I muttered. Call for a vote then, Heather said with a roll of her eyes. All in favor of Lee and Heather finding recruits to fill out a rank say aye. Aye, she and Lee echoed. Eyes have it, she said. They pushed past me and marched towards the door. Wait a minute, I shouted. You're just gonna leave me here. No, Heather called back. You've got the most important job of all.
Which is, I ask, working out with your alien pal over there how we keep five people alive in space for a year. That is, unless you want to leave Lee your credit card and have him do the grocery shopping. What flavor of MD 2020 do you favor? Lee asked helpfully. I slumped in on myself in defeat. Fine, I said, but exactly how am I supposed to figure that out? Well, Leith said thoughtfully, if I were you, I'd think a good place to start would be to introduce the Lady of Wonders to the internet. But mind you steer away from the cat videos. We're on a deadline. With that, they were out the door and leaving me alone in my apartment with a mercenary alien. I closed my eyes and counted to fifty under my breath. Someone once told me it was a good relaxation technique. All it does was give me a chance to think up 50 ways to strangle my companions who left me to play babysitter to the alien. Fine, we'll do it their way. I walked into the living room and dug out my ancient battered laptop. As I booted it up, I looked over to see Volson was still cowering in the corner of the room, staring at me, as if I might attack her at any moment. Come on over, Volson, I said smoothingly. I'm going to introduce you to the art of sifting useful information out of an ocean of porn and YouTube commenters. Introducing the alien to the wonders of the internet turned out to be a bit of a mixed blessing. The symbiote, as it turned out, could translate verbal language almost instantly. Written language, however, was another story. So few creatures possessed visual information in exactly the same way that it was beyond limitations of such a small implant to decipher them. Fortunately, the science officer had a solution of sorts. I stared at the brick of hard plastic she placed on top of my laptop and it pulsed with an eerie green light. What is it? I asked for the fourth time. Her answer changed each time she replied and I was hoping the one of them would eventually make sense. It's a biosynthetic intelligence with adaptive interfacing, she said. It decrypts native information storage and provides real-time translation conduit to the ship. I'm going to need a version of that explanation with small words, big pictures, and mazes that I can solve with a crayon. I said testily. What does all of that mean? My species devised methods of information storage prior to developing into the stellar travel, she said slowly. Do you comprehend so far? Yes, I said. They invent books before the rockets. That's just it, she corrected me. They don't all invent books, or rockets in fact. Different species rarely pick the same methods of information storage. Some use song, other use knotted fibers, while others use patterns of sticks and rocks. Each system evolved independently to best suit the minds and the habits of each individual species. Now, can you imagine what happens when two different species meet and wish to share information? I thought about it for a moment. Language barrier, I decided. One would have to adopt the system that the other, or they would have to agree on a third information storage method. The latter, she agreed, almost without exception as no species is willing to admit that its own storage method is in fact inferior. In fact, since their own storage methods are custom tailored to the unique species, they are rather reluctant to surrender them. So you created a universal intermediate language, I asked. Too many different methods of communication, she said sadly. You cannot use verbal sounds with creatures that lack hearing organs, or hear outside of the range in which you can make sounds. You can't use light for the blind, and you cannot use smell for those that cannot smell, and you cannot use touch with those with hard surfaces. How do you construct a universal language when there is no universal medium? I chewed my lip as I thought about it. You need multiple intermediate languages, I concluded, and multiple more intermediate languages in between the intermediaries so that they can transfer information between unrelated systems. She bounced her hands together. She had done that a few times since I had spoke to her, and I guessed that it indicated that she was pleased. Precisely, she said, you need intermediate languages with an overarching meta-languages which are, in turn, combined with meta-languages until you reach a true universal abstract that is so far removed from any language and comprehended by no one, which is why we had to build one. The symbiote, I guessed. Yes, she agreed. The synthetic creation that is neither an organism or a machine, by linking to your brain and mapping your language skills, it creates a meta-language to translate from other levels of the hierarchy to you. But it is just not a symbiote. 
This device that I'm using now, the Ankna, performs a similar task by mapping stored information. I got it now, but it still sounded like magic. So, I said, if I put it on a book and you'll be able to read the book. It will absorb all the data in the book in a gestalt, she corrected. The translated into a format that could be relayed to read by the ship. It's too primitive to read on its own. It is instead designed to adapt to create the needed interface. Okay, right, so it's not reading my computer, I asked. And all the computers it's linked to, she said. It's downloading the entire internet, I squeaked. My data plan isn't going to be enough to cover that. I do not grasp your meaning, she said. I waved her into silence. I was going to have to leave the planet just to escape the wrath of the cable company. As I stood there, I saw her dig into my pocket of a hazmat suit and draw out a flat screen. It lit up and fractured symbols and colors raced across it. Curious, she said. Your species actually has a rather advanced study of medicine considering your technological level, although much of it seems to rely on your body's ability to self-repair. So you're getting a translation now, I asked. Yes, she said after a brief pause. A partial one. I set up parameters for information to be sent back to me and I'm working up a plan of action. Great, I yawned. I was worried that I would have to figure out how much food to purchase to maintain five people for a year on my own. According to these figures, she said, I believe that if we hollowed out the ship and jettisoned all personal equipment, we would still only have enough room to maintain your kind for half the time. Your species has an incredibly fast metabolism. Inefficient as well. Thank you, I said. So the plan is for now to starve. No, she said as she studied the screen more intently. I believe I have a solution to the problem, but I'll need to make some adjustments to the ship's surgery. Oh, no thanks, I said, stepping away from her. No offense, but if you're planning on lopping off body parts to make human sandwiches, I don't think that's a good long-term strategy. She paused and glanced up in my direction. I do not understand what you're saying, she said. Why would I remove your body parts? You said surgery, I reminded her. Yes, she said. The healing place on the ship. Oh, I said. I now recalled that she had called the sick bay in the surgery before. I just hadn't given her much thought until she started talking about using it on me. So what are you planning? I asked. She didn't answer for a moment. I did not want to say it just yet, she confessed. It may not work. I am basing this on some of the research your own kind has done on some of the other indigenous life on your planet. If you'll allow me a chance to confirm my hypothesis, I believe that I'll have a workable solution within a few hours. I shrugged. Whatever, I agreed. I'm going to go to bed and take a nap. If someone knocks, do not answer the door, unless they say that they have a copy of a watchtower, and, in that case, by all means, open the door. I do not comprehend your... Never mind, I said. Just do your research and come and wake me if something happens. I left the room before she could protest, propose instructions, and went to my bedroom, fell asleep before my body hit the mattress. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 8, written by Simi Loki I was running down a long corridor, the walls were bare metal, and only light came from a flickering fluorescent tubes that seemed to die as I passed it. The darkness was following me and threatening to swallow me whole. With each step I could see a racing shadows gaining on me, flowing past me. The balls began to flicker and die before I could reach them. This was bad because something was chasing me. Something that would bring me back to the pain if I caught up with me. Heart thundering in my chest, I tried to coax my legs into a last-ditch burst of speed. If I could just outrun the darkness, maybe I could outrun the thing. Even as I thought the darkness accelerated and shut before me, the corridor became as dark as the bottom of a tar pit. I stopped running and turned around. Somehow I knew, before my eyes locked on, the figure who it was I would find standing there. Captain Quark towered over me. His head was still caved in from where I'd hurled him into the wall. It left one multifaceted eyes staring at the ceiling, while the other glared at me menacingly. Dark blue ichor oozed from the wound down his wrinkled face and across his lipless mouth. In his right hand, he held a gun. 
Before I could say a word, his finger moved. Pain. Pain so intense that the room I convulsed. My body thrashed against the floor. Thud, thud, thud. He shot me again, and the pain and the convulsions began again. Thud, thud, thud. They shouted my name in a mockery of Heather's voice. Jason, he cried out, open up. He fired again, and the seizure struck me again. Thud, thud, thud. This time, I awoke. I was laying face down on the top of a rumpled covers on my own bed. I couldn't remember how I got there. Thud, thud, thud. Jason! Heather called out again. Heather? Why would Heather be? The events of the night before came swimming back and I bolted upright. That couldn't be real. I ran to the doorway of the bedroom and peeked into the living room. There, in the corner of the room, I saw a familiar figure of a balloon-shaped hazmat suit cowering and staring at the door. The knock repeated one last time. Coming, I shouted as I staggered in that direction. The door stopped bouncing from the frame, but I could hear the voices murmuring outside. I must have really been in deep sleep to have missed it before. The walls of my apartment complex were so thin that I could generally tell this radio station of the cars that drove past. I opened up the door and found Heather and Lee staring at me with a set of defiant look on their faces. Behind them were two strangers. Really, they had actually found two people that desperate. I stepped out of the way to allow them to enter. Heather entered first, followed by Lee. Afterwards, more reluctantly, an African-American woman of about sixty followed, lastly a kid of about twelve. The kid was scrawny and had a complexion that suggested a mixed ancestry. It gave the kid the delicate features that reminded me of the old China dolls. Unfortunately, it also made it impossible for me to determine the kid was male or female. The elderly woman glanced around the room inquisitively before her gaze landed squarely on the form of Vulcian. The woman let out a startled sound, but otherwise managed to keep her composure. My, was all that she could say. Her accent was odd. Due to her dark skin, I wanted to think of her as African, but other than a few safari documentaries on television, I actually knew next to nothing about the continent. She could be from the Netherlands for all I knew. Her hair was mostly grey now with streaks of black. It puffed up around the head and like a cloud. She was slightly on the fat side, but despite that seemed to be in a remarkably good shape for her age. In fact, she carried herself with a certain refined elegance that made me think of her youth that she was probably quite beautiful. My, she repeated. The kid on the other hand was far more blasé about the whole thing. The eyes took in the surroundings, alien included, and settled into the guarded expression. It was like looking at a coiled spring, one with a very sharp knife stuck at the end of it. I waved at Lee and Heather. I led the way to the kitchen and motioned for the other two to join me in a huddle. My leadership skills were, naturally enough, immediately called into question as both elected to stand their ground with arms crossed. Okay, so I went on the offensive. What are you two doing? I asked. This was a bad enough idea when I just just me. Am I the only one questioning why we are doing this? Yes, Heather said firmly. According to what you and your alien girlfriend have said, this may be our only chance of survival. Not just for us, but for the planet. That doesn't make this a good idea, I said. I'm sorry I dragged you two into this. This is my mess. If anyone here is going to rack up bad karma kidnapping other people, it should be me. That woman, Heather interrupted me mid-babble, is Professor Naladia Madakai. She taught anthropology at the university until earlier this year. I took a class and she's probably the most brilliant person that I have ever met. She's published dozens of journal articles and can speak more languages than you can count without taking you off your shoes, even without your little kissing bug. Now, considering our situation, don't you think having someone with an actual brain in our merry band might be a good idea? It was a tough argument to counter. I tried anyway, because I'm pig-headed and apparently bound and determined to provide ample proof that I am not the brains of the outfit. And you think someone like that is going to leave everything for a year just because we have a spaceship under a nose? I blurted out. No, Heather said calmly. She'll do it for a cure for Alzheimer's. She didn't want to retire. She was forced to by the university.
I didn't really have a follow-up to my original card agreement. I was going to repeat it until she got tired of listening. But those words, though, those words stuck in my throat. Heather must have seen my expression because she nodded. It must be terrifying, Heather continued speaking in a low voice, to have such a brilliant mind only to feel the eroding away. She climbed so high in her life and now she's been sent tumbling all because of some stupid disease. I can't let that happen, not to someone like her. I couldn't meet her glare. Her eyes burned, daring me to contradict her. I didn't. I shifted targets. Fine, I said while looking at Lee. But even with kidnapping the elderly doesn't excuse actual kidnapping. Are you going to tell me the kid's dying or something too? Lee shrugged. Jack's fine as far as I know, he admitted. But he won't be much longer before wearing her older brother's clothes is going to fool anyone at the campsite. I thought that I'd been sucker punched by Heather's words. Lee's words landed with a fully loaded 747. She's homeless, I asked. He nodded. Only family she knows of is an older brother, and he's the one who dropped her off in the camp under the 14th Street overpass, he went on. She stayed with me a few times at the shelters. I told people that she was my son, until a couple of weeks ago, when my son needed me to help out with purchasing certain products she couldn't be caught with. He sighed and rubbed the side of his hand. Life in the streets is tough for anyone, he said, but it's worse for a kid. She's not safe from the real sickos, even by pretending to be a boy. We've been lucky so far. So far. I shut up. I guess I wasn't the only person who wasn't bothered by fleeing the planet for a year or so. Still, I looked at Heather helplessly. Daddy will have calmed down by the time we get back, she said. If we get back. I shook my head and entered the living room once more. Do not touch my instruments, Volson was saying to the kid. The kid had picked up the acne from the laptop keyboard and was hefting it as it was testing it for weight. She's asking you to put that back, I translated as I entered the room. The kid, Jack, looked at me sideways for a moment and put the brick of plastic back. She did so on a disinterested manner as if to suggest replacing it was her own idea, and not because she had been asked to do so. I decided not to press the issue. Has everyone been brought up to speed? I asked. Not even in the slightest, the professor corrected me and then pointed at Volson. What is this thing and how are we capable of understanding it? I sighed and ran my hand through my hair. Okay, I said. Then we have a lot of catching up to do and not a lot of time to do it in. This, uh, person in a hazmat suit is a science officer, Volson, and she's the best equipped to give everyone here a big picture. The problem is, to understand her you need to, um, well, kiss one of us. The professor's eyes darted from me to Lee and back again. Is there a plan B? she asked. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, chapter 9, written by Semi Loki. As far as I could tell, it was now the third time that I'd heard the same history, but it wasn't as if I was getting tired of it either. Each time, Volsen seemed to reveal little more tidbits. I wasn't sure if I was for my benefit or because she just remembered them or for some other alien reason. This time, however, I was fairly sure it was due to the professor. She was adapted to arcane skill of academics cultivate of being able to formulate questions while being on the receiving end of a lecture. Why do you use ground troops? Professor Madakai asked Valsen, stared at recite her previous answer concerning logistics of ships to ships contact, only to be interrupted by Madakai. You misunderstand, young lady, Madakai said with a crisp voice. Why are you using ground troops? Why, with all your advanced machinery, are you still using flesh and blood creatures for the actual fighting? It was a damn good question now that she broached it, and judging by the science officer's waltz, one that Volson had been hoping to avoid. The hazmat-suited alien had been dancing with agitation for a while now. The sight of five high-gravity creatures with even higher aggression bickering in her presence has not set the alien at ease. As the professor had balked at the idea of kissing the purpose of obtaining a transition symbiote and the science officer had scoured in the corner while rhythmically bouncing off the wall as her waltz brought her to close. During the argument, I had tried to be the voice of reason by pointing out that, as far as we knew, 
It was the fastest and least painful method of transferring the symbiote. I politely refrained from mentioning the other method that Volson had hinted at, which probably would not hurt, but would be far more embarrassing. Meanwhile, Heather scolded her former teacher like the woman was a small child refusing to eat her vegetables. Lee just shrugged and did his best to look helpless. In the end, it was the kid Jack who ended up the discussion. I was preparing myself for what was promising to be the fifth repetition of the same old arguments when I felt a small but incredibly strong hand seize my hair in the back of my head. My head was yanked back forcefully and downwards with the stiff lips locked in place with my own. My eyes swam back into focus and I saw Jack's androgynous in front of mine. Her eyes were open glaring at me angrily. She half pushed and half threw me away from her and stomped over to the professor. She kissed Madagai with the similar look of impatience mixed with disgust. When they broke apart, they both looked as though they might wretch at any moment. We're wasting time, Jack hissed. It was the first time that I'd heard the kids speak. Her voice was raspy and, much like her clothing, seemed to be a product of a deliberate effort to mark her gender. She then crossed her arms across her chest angrily and flopped heavily into a chair. Unless glowering could be considered a communication, she had been silent since that time. Now, for some unexplained reason, I found myself looking in the direction of the silent youth. Jack's eyes had narrowed and his shoulders had tensed. She was eyeing the alien strange dance as well. Somehow, Jack was able to sense me looking at her. She glanced in my direction and, for a fleeting moment, grimace crossed her face. It was gone in a flash and was almost instantly replaced by a skull, which I was already coming to associate as a default facial expression. But I had seen it. What's more, it had been meant to be seen. Watch out for this one, an expression had read, a warning that had been issued to me without uttering a word that might be translated by the symbiote for the benefit of our guest. I glanced at the other three, but as far as I could tell, they had missed the exchange. Did they signify something in and of itself? I shelved that thought for a moment and focused more on the immediate problem. Wilson, I said, we've got tanks and unmanned drones on our technological level. We've already developed methods of armed fighting that is making hand-to-hand -hand combat obsolete. Why are you still using it, and why are the Chimera? There are reasons, she declared at last, complex reasons that you would not understand. No, we wouldn't, Lee spoke, surprising all of us, because you haven't told them to us. More dancing, she was preparing herself to try and deceive us. A lie or a hard truth, I guessed. Synthetic intelligence are not used in warfare, she said. That is the way that is always done. Says who? I asked. Her legs were no longer waltzing, they were stomping invisible ants. My question had greatly disturbed her. Why? Why had the question disturbed her more than the one that possessed by Mordecai or Lee? I saw it, then the others had asked why, and I had asked who. You and the Chimera aren't the only players in the drama, are you? I asked pointedly. The science officer Walt stopped, and she curled her arms and legs tight into a thorax and dropped heavily to the floor. It was definitely a defensive posture of some sort. My words had struck home. It took all four of us, Jack still sustaining from the conversation, to prod the information out of our reluctant teacher. She tried dodging the question a few more times. She even tried playing mute. We were relentless, however, and bombarded her with questions mixed with educated guesses. Any time the poor creature denied any point, she seemed to inadvertently reveal more than she realized. Slowly, but steadily, we unwound the truth from her. She had been presenting her side, a group that identified itself by a word that was translating as conflux. As the united front within the galaxy struggling against the smaller but powerful enemy known as the Chimera. But as she gradually broke under the questioning, we found out that there was not even a quarter of the real story. The conflux, as it turned out, was a real loosely defined alliance of civilizations that spanned a portion of the galaxy. This part, as far as we could tell, was true. What she had left out was that they actually only claimed a fairly narrow wedge of the galactic real estate. In terms of the Milky Way galaxy, the Conflux and all of its allied species were the proverbial new kids in the block. 
species that, in galactic terms, had only recently obtained space-sparing technology. Technologically, if humans could be likened to Stone Age savages, then, in comparison, the Conflux members were just beginning to enter the Industrial Revolution. Spanish galleons and printing presses, that sort of thing. The Chimera was slightly further ahead in the curve, steamships and cannons. The next closest competitor was the Empire of Ron, which was a cruising around with nuclear submarines. The Ron Empire took up the lion's share of the galaxy. They weren't the most technologically advanced, just the largest. There were smaller groups, the so-called isolationist systems, which had highly advanced species that were completely disinterested in the events of the outside of their system. There was also a few scattered groups like the envoys and the fire traders who didn't lay claim to any parent system, but instead floated free and unfettered like an interstellar gypsy caravans. Lastly, there were the abjugators. Who are the abjugators? someone asked. I think it was Heather, but in all the confusion, it could have been the male man stepping in to join the discussion. Belson did not want to talk about it at this point. She balked and tried to dismiss our concerns. In the end, I had to resort to more drastic measures. Who has a knife? I said aloud. It was an obvious answer was, I do, this is my house. But I didn't want to leave the room just yet. I heard clicking sound behind me and glanced to the chair where Jack slouched. Why was I not surprised that she had a switchblade in her hands? I'm going to ask the question again, I told Jack. If she doesn't answer, I want you to perforate her suit. Now, who are the... I didn't even have to finish the question. As the story unfolded, every human pair of eyes seemed to draw on towards the switchblade, as if it had grown a gravitational field. We were all thinking it. Maybe we should peripherate a suit anyway. The abjugators, the science officer revealed, were vast intelligences that lived in a hub of the galaxy. They seemed to require no body nor ship. When they needed to make themselves known, they were just there. Perhaps they were an organic that had sublimed themselves to a higher form. Perhaps they were synthetic intelligences dancing around on the wavelengths of undetectable network. Little more than programs grown fat with the centuries. No one seemed to know who or what they were or once were. All anyone knew for certain was that when the abjugators took notice of you, it never ended well. How so? I asked. Fifty thousand of your years ago, they ruled that the Kakatato were the never to depart from their native system. They sent out a single probe to the comet cloud between the system and the next and in an instant the entire star system was removed from the galaxy. Its light winked out in an instant. From there the news got worse. The abjugators, it seemed, were fine with allowing two little kids to settle their own grudge match. They kept their distance and let the Chimera and Conflux fight. At the same time, however, they seemed to have provided strict orders for the Empire of Ron to leave both groups alone. If a system allied itself with either the Chimera or the Conflux, was to be left alone by their more powerful neighbors. The abjugators, it seemed, liked for conflict to be on what they considered a level playing field. Furthermore, to make sure that that was the case, they put limiters on both warring parties. Limiters? Lee asked. So you can't send a robotic soldiers or unmanned ships? Not with synthetic intelligence, Bolson corrected while laying flat on the floor. Torpedoes are permitted as missiles, but they cannot be guided by anything but the most rudimentary intelligence. The abjugators declared that we would feel our losses and, as such, all offensive and defensive measures must place the lives of the conflicting species in direct peril. They're cops, Jack said suddenly. I looked at her. She frowned as if she was reluctant to expand upon the thought. Still, she relented. Gang wars, she said. Say, there's a bad neighborhood with two warring gangs. It's too much effort to go in there and stop the war entirely. But you can stop some of the arms dealers from selling bigger guns. Keep it from spilling over to the nice neighborhoods. Containment, Professor Madakai agreed. These abjugators are containing the violence. They scared at the alien. And you want us to side with your conflux, she asked. You must, the alien squeaked. The other member species are very exclusive. They will not have you. 
Your only alternative is the Chimera, who wish to acclimate enough species and strength to gain permission to turn its attention to one of the other groups. The Conflux is their stepping stone. Which, I went on, is why when they retreated they go all the way to the other side of the galaxy, rather than setting up shop here. We're in a territory of the abjugators designated for your side. She didn't answer. That, in itself, was an answer. This changes nothing, the professor said at last. We are in the same situation. The conflux is the lesser evil. Still evil, he grunted. Agreed, she said, and directed the next part at me. And from what you've told me, this is not unified. There are factions that may be against us. So, I said, it's still decided. We go to their council, or whatever, and plead our case, extermination or modification being our only realistic alternatives. Yes, Heather agreed, which brings us back to getting food for the trip there. You were supposed to work on that, Jason. I opened my mouth and stammered. She had told me to work on that before storming out and I had gotten sidetracked. Why was that? You will not need provisions for the trek itself. Bolson muttered into the floor as she struggled to regain her feet. I believe I've discovered a potential solution for that part. Great, I said. At least one part of this may be easy. What's the answer? You sleep on it, she replied. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 10 Written by Semi Loki Wilson explained her plan for how to get the five creatures across the gulf of space in a ship designed for creatures with a much slower metabolism. As she talked, my confidence, already growing ever feebler with each realization of a new obstacle, began to flicker and was almost snuffed out entirely. It's impossible, I declared a word that I should know to not trust by now. No, the professor of all people protested. The science is sound. It's been done for thousands of years, if you think about it. But not in humans. Hibernation. Nature's own form of suspended animation. The professor was right, of course. It had been done for aeons when the wild. According to Valson's own research, there were even evidence that it could occur in primates. The fat-tailed dwarf lemur of Madagascar actually hibernates for up to seven months out of the year. Why not? The differences between humans and a lemur weren't that extreme. Not when you compare, say, a ground squirrel and a black bear. Yet both of them hibernate. Mammals all across the world hibernate. Why not humans? Of all the ideas that had been tossed around, why was I having a problem with this one? An image of my grandfather's body thrashing under the thin sheets of the hospital bed flashed my mind. Ah, yes. That was the reason. Comas are always quite things on television. The actor just lays there in his deep sleep while machines beep softly in the background. They never show the other types of coma, the ones where the person moans and articulate sounds and flails his limbs, where the eyes flutter but never open, and the comas where you have to explain to your grandmother time and time again that no, Ho George was not about to wake up this time, and that the stroke had taken something from him permanently. I know all about Glasgow Coma Scale and the age of when most classmates are interested in learning the names of all the Pokemon. Eye movement, verbal response, and motor response were all each given a number between one and five, with five being the least impaired. The numbers then were tallied and gave the doctors a rough idea of the extent of the brain injury. Numbers of 13 or higher were good with minor injuries. Slap a band-aid on and you can go home. Numbers between 9 and 13 were bad. They indicated a moderate injury. My grandfather had an 8, a severe brain injury. The stroke had occurred while my grandmother had been at a weekly poker game with some other woman from her church. Benny Stakes games were my grandmother's dished out that racked in more loose gossip than loose change. She had come home to find her my grandfather slumped in his easy chair in front of the television. To all appearances, he had simply dozed off while watching daytime programming. It was such a typical sight that it took my grandmother half an hour to notice that something was wrong. By the time the ambulance arrived and both too late and at the same time too soon. 
a persistent vegetable state is what the doctor called it. My grandfather's brain injury was too severe for him to ever make a full recovery. What we were witnessing, the eye flutters and the erratic movements of his arms and legs were not signs of awareness, just short circuits in a damaged brain playing themselves out. Legally, he occupied a weird limbo state, too alive to be considered brain dead, too dead to be any hope of recovery. All of us understood what we needed to do, all of us, except my grandmother that is. I think guilt drove her more than anything else. The thought that if she'd skipped her weekly card game, she might have saved him, or even that if she had tried to wake him up when he first came home, she might still have been time. I don't know. All I know is that we couldn't legally pull the plug without her consent, and she wouldn't give it. The bulls piled up and my grandmother ended up selling her house and moving in with us. My father quietly contacted a lawyer. Three months later, it turned out to be a moot point. My grandmother died of a heart attack two weeks before Christmas. Her funeral was delayed long enough for the plug to be pulled on my grandfather so that we could arrange a double funeral as their deaths had occurred the same day. In a sense, they may actually have. We later discovered that my grandmother had been flushing her heart and blood pressure medication down the toilet for months. I often wondered about the last part. It makes me think that, despite her protest, she was fully aware of my grandfather's condition. She was just too afraid to allow him to precede her in death. She distracted us and stalled his death so that she could set up her own, a passive form of suicide with a long con on her ears. There was no payoff, save knowing that she had to live in a world without a husband in it. She died penniless, leaving no legacy other than the bitterness and remorse. My parents divorced a year later, as if to offer further proof that there was no such thing as a peaceful death. I gritted my teeth and tried to stand my ground. There has to be another way, I insisted. The alien seemed to withdraw from me slightly, as if afraid that I might lash out and crush her. Two members of the party will need to remain in surgery for the duration of the ship in any event, she said. As for the rest of all of you, will need to go through an intense decontamination process, including yourself, Jason Reese, as you have re-exposed yourself to the world's contagions. I have been trying to teach the science officer the concept of human naming conventions. The results were mixed in that she treated my full name as if it were one word. Observing this, the others had wisely only given Volsen a single name apiece. Fine, I said. So decontaminate us, but we stay awake for the trip. I think it's too risky for us to be put under. Someone put their hand on my shoulder in a comic gesture. I shrugged my shoulders to remove it. From the corner of my eye, I saw there was Heather. I suppose, the science officer said, if we created a minimalistic diet, we could be able to sustain you for the trip. Great, I said. So for three weeks we put on a starvation rations. I'm fine with that. No, Valson corrected me. If you are conscious, that would put the trip four weeks. Five weeks if more than one of you is awake. What? Why would my being awake make the trip longer? I asked. She hesitated. Humans need a daily intake of water, she stated. Each of you require approximately 2.2 kilograms of water per day. That is 11 kilograms of extra mass per day of the trip. For three weeks voyage, you would require 241 kilograms of extra mass. If we assume an additional kilogram per day for each to maintain a minimum nutrition, that equates to 346 kilograms of extra mass. However, your oxygen consumption also is considerably higher with the rest of the crew. Ideally, the botany lab should be expanded to accommodate as the health of the entire crew may be compromised with an expended period of low oxygen. To fully expand the botany bays will require an extra week of preparation and an extra week of travel time as extra mass of your bodies. Your food requirements, your water and the mass of the botany bay will consume more fuel. The ship's fuel storage is finite, and in order to maintain a safe level of fuel reserves, we would be necessary to have extend our travel time to consume less fuel. This requires more water and food and increases the transport mass. The equilibrium point is achieved approximately five weeks travel time with an extra week's delay before we can depart. 
Six weeks, I said, with five of them in starvation rations. Lee stepped up to me and, in a voice low that only I could possibly hear, whispered, It's not worth it. Do you want to face the powers that be on an empty stomach? I banished all thoughts of my grandfather and sighed. Fine, I said, but what about the year or so we'll be out there? To this question, the alien science officer seemed to relax as if she were one more familiar ground. I believe if we take a smaller quantity of your foodstuffs as templates onto the planet synthesizers, we'll be capable of replicating the desired nutritional requirements. On planet synthesizers, I asked. Our ship is of older design, the Adirin explained. One designed specifically to transport a species such as my own, one with minimal requirements. Synthesizers require vast stores of power, while new high-end ships are equipped with compact variants. The ones that are on site at a permanent location can make use of greater energy reserves in space. Meaning, I said, as long as you pack enough food for it to get an idea of what we'd like to eat, then it should be able to churn out something acceptable for the rest of our stay. Yes, she agreed. A representative sample should be adequate. So, we raided my pantry. My pantry, by the way, was stocked with typical bachelor fashion. Spaghettios, ramen noodles, expired cans of tuna fish, and peanut butter made up the bulk of it. Heather shot me a withering look as she searched for something that wasn't microwavable, while Lee and Jack emptied cans into pillowcases that they had pulled from my bed. If either of them saw anything abnormal in my culinary choices, they kept it to themselves. Anything that was remotely edible went into the sacks. Soup cans collided with packages of stale crackers, while boxes of instant mashed potatoes were tossed in on top. I think they were motivated more by providing lots of suitable templates rather than criticizing my health regime. Professor Madakai looked in my fridge and found three half-finished containers of Chinese takeout. To my surprise, her only reaction to this was to extract one and dump the contents onto a plate before shoving it in the microwave. I hope you don't mind, she said, but I skipped lunch and if we're going to be living off body fat in the near future, I think it is wise to stock up. Good point. I pulled out the other containers as well as a TV dinner or two. I handed the TV dinners to Lee and Jack and they stood in line for the microwave. I looked over at Heather expectantly. What's your poison? I asked. Lean cuisine or hungry man? She grimaced. You don't happen to have anything vegetarian organic, do you? Well, I said thoughtfully, there is something green and leafy in the fridge, but I don't think it started out as a vegetable. Lean cuisine, she decided. I tossed the box at her and dumped the twin boxes takeouts on my plate. Orange chicken over mugu gai pan it is then. It took about 45 minutes of shoving before everyone had a turn at the microwave and found a place to sit down. Lee and Jack elected to sit on the floor with the backs resting against the wall. The professor and Heather jostled elbows at my too small table and I sat in the abandoned easy chair. I didn't really have a lot in the way of drinks. Lee and the professor took my last beers without asking permission first. Jack found a can of coke, Heather rinsed out a glass and filled it with water, and, as for me, I cracked open a bottle of ginger beer. Probably the last one I would taste for another year. For some reason, that tragedy resonated with me more strongly than any other so far. Without quite knowing why, I lifted the bottle high and called for a toast. To the galaxy, I called out, and every pair of eyes in the room, human or otherwise, shot me a quizzical look. May be ready for humans, because we're ready for it, I continued. There was met with a chorus of hear, hear from the humans, and a faint whimper from the alien. I pretended not to hear the last as I tipped the bottle to my lips and swallowed the fiery liquid. I silently hoped that they really was a universal myth of Pandora's box, because the galaxy had just opened it. End of chapter the Fourth Wave, Chapter 11 Written by Semi Loki We finally departed my apartment after sunset. Heather and the Professor had made a hundred phone calls to make arrangements for their absence. It disturbed me that I only marginally had more loose ends to tie up than Lee and Jack. Was I really that far disconnected from humanity? 
My rent and utilities were paid through an automatic draft. When my bank account ran dry, I assumed that they would be cut off. Truthfully, sicking the police on my landlord had more to do with petty revenge for his recent rent hike than anything else. A few months tangled up with the legal system should distract him from the mystery of the disappearing tenant. I had gotten myself good and fired so I didn't have a job to go to. I didn't really have friends to speak of. My father recently married a woman barely half his age and moved to Arizona. He never called or visited. The other than this yearly Christmas card he seemed to have wrote me off as just another reminder of his former life that he had abandoned. As for my mother, well, after the divorce, my mother never remarried or dated. She seemed to dedicate her life to trying to compensate for my absent father. She also seemed to worry about money most of the time. Even with the alimony check that she received, she seemed concerned with the idea that she might lose everything. So she often took a second job to try and make up for the money that she felt we needed. Then she'd realized that most of the extra money was going right back out in making arrangements for my own after-school care, summer camps, or whatever other method she had of covering for her absence. She'd quit her job, a second job, and then go back to focusing on being an ultra-involved in my life. Then she'd have another anxiety attack about money, and the process would repeat itself. Much of my childhood was spent in a parent who was either always there or never there. There was never a happy medium with my mother. Maybe that's why I finally did move out and I actively avoided calling her. I wanted to figure things out without my mother's bungee core parenting style. For the first time in my life I had a chance to define myself and I wanted to do it in my own way. It was pretty selfish of me, I realize now, which is probably why I didn't realize that my mother might also feel the drift now that I was gone. A year after I moved out, someone suggested that yoga might help with some of the back problems. For any normal person, that might have been an innocent suggestion. For my mother, well, it became something else to put the center of her life. Yoga was a gateway exercise to Eastern philosophy. She read every book written by anyone with the name Swami. From there, she branched out into meditations and mysticism. She tweaked her chakras and made sure that her chi flowed like a faucet. She started the day with meditations and took a spirit animal out for walkies in the evenings. She gave up coffee with half and half in favor of high colonics with yin and yang. If it involved spiritualism, my mother probably practiced it. During my mother's conversion to New Age philosophy, I never really said much to her. It seemed pretty harmless to me, heck. The yoga seemed to actually do her a lot of good as she stopped complaining about her back pain. I never really thought that there was any reason to worry about her. Then six months ago she called me up out of the blue to excitedly tell me that she had finally saved up enough money for a spiritual master's course. That's the term the guru that she follows uses on his webpage, by the way. He's based out of New York and for a fee, you can enroll in his Academy of Enlightenment. These can be as cheap as 300 for his study at home course, where he mails you a few books to read at your own leisure, or to the more advanced workshops that can cost $500 a session. For the ultimate enlightenment though, you could spend $10,000 for the privilege of living in this karmically balanced abode, and absorb the energies and wisdom over the course of a year or while sleeping on a straw mat at night and doing his housekeeping and other chores for him during the day. Essentially, people paid him $10,000 to be indentured servants for a year. We had a few harsh words about that. She told me it didn't matter as she wasn't allowed to contact with the outside world until after a course was over. She then hung up on me. So, it would be another six months before I could even find out if my mother had cooled off enough to speak to me again. Even if she is, I am not sure that even a symbiote would give me the ability to pass whatever nonsense that she'd be speaking. So, my ties were easier to cut. Lee, Jack, and I sat in the living room playing cards, while the responsible and socially aware duo actually did their things to settle affairs. When nightfall came around, I helped Jack carry out a pillowcases of canned goods, while Lee carried the fold-up spaceship launch. I looked at the door of my apartment for the last time and hid my spare key back in its usual spot. The act seemed tinged with the finality and banality at the same time. 
We walked out into the middle of the park and I helped Lee unfold the platform back into its familiar tabletop shape. Moments later, the lawn sprang up around us and we were once again airborne. The others gawked at the novelty of the wraparound view screen and the way we moved without any sense of inertia. I, on the other hand, watched Volson's hands as they danced along the top of the controls. I tried to figure out a pattern to her movements with the motions of the ship. I thought that it might be useful to know at a later date. The return flight, if anything faster than our descent, maybe Volson was just eager to leave Earth. We docked with the alien vessel and I watched the other humans stagger as they adjusted to the diminished gravity aboard. Volson instructed us to leave the food behind and led us directly to the surgery. I have already sent instructions to the system and we can be underway within the hour, she said briskly. I thought surgery might be the room where I'd been first examined. This didn't turn out to be the case, which naturally made me wonder what that room was normally used for that would require a table with an arm and a wrist restraints. Surgery, as it turned out, was a room near the other end of the hallway and was filled with a dozen egg-shaped pods. Like most things on the ship, the pods were white and seemed to emit a soft glow. Each one was approximately 12 feet long and 5 feet tall. Like an egg, they tapered at the tip and were fat at the bottom. Wilson touched something on the wall and five of the eggs opened. They didn't swing open like a lid or a hatch. There was just simply a hole at the top of them where someone could climb inside. You will need to undress before you get inside, she instructed absently. Whoa, I said, holding up a hand. Something you should know about humans. We have this taboo about nudity and... Someone tapped my shoulder. I glanced in that direction and saw it was Lee. He jerked his hand over his shoulder and I saw behind him Professor Medikai had already unbuttoned her blouse and was nonchalantly removing her skirt. I quickly jerked my eyes away from her. Okay, I corrected. Most humans have a taboo about nudity. I am an anthropologist, I heard Medikai say from somewhere behind me. If you plan on studying certain cultures, you have to learn to be flexible with cultural norms. Um, okay, I replied, still not looking around. We are in a hurry, Jason Reese, Volson said quickly. May I remind you that the authority to complete this mission derives from my declaring the captain incapacitated. Still, I said, we're in mixed company and you can't expect us to... Fine, I heard Heather say from behind me. I'm naked. Now what? I sneaked a peek. She was still fully clothed. I thought so, she said. Pervert! Professor Medikai, now wearing a bra and white cotton panties, rolled her eyes while reaching behind her back. Children, she muttered and spun around again and kept my back to them. Lee stepped beside me. The easiest way to do this, he said without looking at me, is for us to stay here while our backs turned and allow the woman to get into the pods. Then you and I undress and get into ours. Fine, I said, exasperated. Fine, I heard Heather say, but no peeking for real this time. Your head moves, Jason, and I'll kick you so hard you'll land back on Earth. Is that feasible? Valson asked in surprise. Hyperbole, I said. A promise, Heather countered. Lee and I faced the wall and heard the rustling of cloth from behind us. Prof's got some big knockers, Lee muttered out of the corner of his mouth to me. I noticed, I agreed. Thank you. The professor replied, we shut up. Okay, Heather said at last, we're all in our pods. Your turn, guys. No peeking, I said as I turned around and tugged my shirt over my head. Not even tempted to do so, I heard a voice echo from inside the depths of the pods. I jumped into one of the empty ones and Lee followed suit as the last remaining pod. If Valson gave any more instructions, I never heard it. The top of the pod reappeared, plunging me into darkness. For a second, nothing happened. I was lying down in something that felt like a foam, rubber, or maybe a soft plastic. Then the plastic began to mold itself to contour of my body, not just under me either. To the sides and the top as well, my legs, arms, and torso were enveloped in the blink of an eye. The plastic flowed up from beneath my head and covered the sides of my head. Only my face had been left uncovered. I couldn't move. I wanted to scream, but I didn't. Instead, I waited to see what happened next. 
What happened, as it turned out, was that I felt a slight tingle against the skin of my calves, followed by an intense feeling of drowsiness. I fought it for as long as I could, but I was asleep within seconds. Are you receiving me? As far as dreams went, this one was pretty uneventful. I was floating in a featureless void, there was no light, no sense of up and down, just that stupid voice that filled my head. I tried to tune it out in the hopes that more interesting dream might show up. Are you receiving me? Yeah, I blurted out. If I'm going to spend the next three weeks dreaming, why couldn't it involve Swedish models in tiny bikinis? You are receiving. You are not dreaming. Not dreaming? Could have fooled me. Fine, I'll play along. Where am I? You are in a medical pond in a ship that is accelerating beyond the orbit of the fourth planet in the solar system. That pretty much sounds like a dream response. Silence as it stretched out for a while. Apologies, the metaspace burst was just initiated. Communications can now resume until relativistic velocities are once more achieved. Yeah, that was definitely a speech I'd only hear in a dream. Your comprehension has been impaired. If this is corrected, will this be sufficient proof of your non-dreaming state? A dream is going to prove to me that it is not a dream. What are you going to do? Wake the Red King. Correction in process. What happened next was difficult to describe. It was like a movie played in a theater with a migraine. My mind was fairly assaulted with information, raw equations, diagrams, charts, machinery. Images flashed through with such a rapidity that I couldn't see them. I couldn't recall them. I just knew of their passing due to the pain they caused as they rolled by. Suddenly, the passing images combined to form a new image. This one was more diffuse, but at the same time more welcoming because I could hold on to it. I saw a model of a ship of flying saucer like the craft I was in, accelerating rapidly through the star-speckled night sky. Its speed built up until finally they blinked out of existence. Further away it reappeared and coasted to a near stop before its engines fired off once more and began sluggishly accelerating again. I understood what I was seeing. The faster the light drive, the metaspace drive. Needed the ship to ramp up to speeds near light speed before it could activate. The ship's engines only worked in our universe, not in metaspace. When the ship's faster than light drive was activated, the ship was translated to metaspace and all movement from that point forward was dictated by the momentum that carried with it. Metaspace was more compressed than normal space. Two points are side by side in metaspace, maybe hundreds of miles apart in our universe. The further into metaspace one penetrated, the more compressed the space, but also the greater the resistance. The ship used an archaic Type 1 meta drive. It barely breached the surface of metaspace where the compression was not much greater than our own universe. To compensate, for the ship would accelerate on its own sublight drives to relativistic speeds and then translate over to metaspace and coast along the surface until it was forced to translate back to our universe. Each hop leapfrogged it over the vast expanse of space in our universe. It made me think of a flying fish cresting in and out of the water in an interstellar sine wave. Correction complete. Metaspace communications are impossible. Communications are openly permitted during periods of subluminal acceleration. However, transfer rates must be adjusted to reflect changes due to suppressed neural activity and reflexive effects. You are having to adjust how fast you talk to me because I'm doped up and because time slows down when we approach light speed. I translated. Correct. Humans are supposed to be resistant to psionics, I commented. Correct. So you aren't talking to me telepathically. Silence. Correct. Apologies, there was another transition event. Whatever, I said, so you're communicating with my mind, but it isn't with telepathy. You are able to adjust seamlessly to communicate with someone accelerating to near light speed without any noticeable effects. Am I to assume that I am talking to an abjugator? Incorrect. That surprised me. I am not talking to the abjugators. How kind is called that, but you are not speaking to an individual. How many am I talking to? Many. Ominous. Okay, fine. So what do you want to talk about? 
Is the human race on trial or something? Is John Delancey going to show up? Your species is of little concern at a time and did not require intervention. So why are we talking then? Silence. Apologies, very little time remains for your questions. Oh, I thought it would take three weeks to get there. Correct. A week and a half has elapsed as we have been speaking. I got a sinking feeling that I was not going to get a dream about Swedish models after all. Fine, I said. Get to the point. We wish the human isolation to end. Great! We're on the same page, I said. I'm going to go plead our case to not get destroyed right now. We do not concern ourselves with politics. Your extinction is unimportant. The isolation is our only concern. So what? You want us to get more involved with our neighbors? Silence. Time is critical. Your comprehension is impaired. Correction in progress. I was about to protest once more, and I was assaulted by the data feed. This one was less brutal. Fortunately, it mostly involved a model of the solar system I was familiar with. Well, mostly familiar with. The blacked-out zone extending from the sun to just shy of the orbit of Mars was a new one. What is that? I gasped. The isolation. Once again, the knowledge arrived without me thinking about it. You mean you are isolated, I said. You can't see or interact or do whatever it is you do with Earth. Correct. How is that possible? It should not be. It needs to end. How do I do that? No data. Big help, I muttered. And if I don't end it, unacceptable interference will be removed. Do you mean that you'll figure out how to undo the isolation yourselves? Area of space as well as all contents therein will be deleted. No, I sighed. That's not what you mean. You'll remove the solar system if I don't figure out how your signal is getting jammed. You don't know how that's possible or how I'm supposed to do that. This is just great. You are the first of the degenerate species to cross the boundary. The task has fallen to you. Wonderful, I said. And are you going to mention the deadline before my solar system is deleted, or maybe even give me a hint where to start? Additional queries cannot be answered. Final destination is imminent. Terminate the isolation surrounding the degenerates and the feral kind. Wait, I said. What do you mean by degenerate and feral? Two isolation events both need to terminate and face deletion. Both involve human populations. Determine how this is done and why. Wait, I shouted. What do you mean two isolation events and how are humans involved with both? Communications terminated. I awoke with a shudder and molded sighs and the pod retreated from me. Above me, a hole appeared in the surface and blinding white light speared my eyes, forcing me to flinch away. My body was covered in aches and pains and I could tell without testing them that my joints would be stiff. The hibernation dreams were still with me, but had grown a bit fuzzy now that I was awake. Dreams. We're dreams of hibernation sleep. That's all it was. Or at least that's what I told myself. I made a mental note to ask the others what their dreams had been like. Hopefully they had some as well. Otherwise, well, I didn't like to think of that otherwise. I gathered my strength and sat up. I'd been right. My joints were stiff. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 12 Extricating myself from the medical part wasn't the hardest thing I'd ever done in my life, but it wasn't the easiest either. Every movement seemed to hurt more than the one before it. Sitting up? That was painful. Reaching up to the hole at the top to grip the edges? You bet. That was painful. Extending my legs to push against the gravity to lift my body out. Describing it as murder is a bit too forgiving. It'd be like calling the Crusades a theological discussion. I felt that I'd been burned, frozen, drowned, ripped to shreds, and then stitched back together with barbed wire. I wanted to scream, but my throat hurt too much to bother. So I just stood there and looked around. My eyes refused to focus at first. Everything was blurry, fuzzy, while growing shapes on top of the background of a more distinct white fuzz. In a few seconds, though, my eyes began working normally again, 
and I realized the pain was settling down and more tolerable level. Alien tech, it seemed, came in two flavors, uneventful and excruciating. I realized that I was all alone in a strange room. The five egg-shaped pods lay scattered about the room as that scarred like petulant giant. Beside the pod I had just climbed out of, I found a stack of neatly folded white garments. The clothes were like the ones that had been synthesized for me on the ship, except that these seemed to be a bit better made. The fabric was softer and smoother, not like the cotton, but it didn't have that papery feel to it either like the others had. I tugged on the pants and then the shirt and found a pair of simple white shoes underneath it. There were no laces, buttons, or zippers anywhere. Everything from the shirt to the shoes just fit like it had been custom tailored to my body, which I suppose was exactly what had happened. Now that I've dressed, I decided to take my surroundings. The room was familiar. The walls were blank and soft glow of the ships, but I knew that I was somewhere else. This room was larger, not as brightly lit, and, well, older. As strange as it sounds, the room felt ancient, like a march of the centuries had behind a stain. The weight of the history pressed down on me in a way that diminished the gravity could not. I took a few haltering steps towards the door. Unlike the ones in the ship, the door didn't appear to disappear. It was a permanent opening, a gap carved into the wall to allow entrance and egress. How accustomed had I become to the alien tech that something was trivial as the standard door struck me as strange. Movement helped. By the time I reached the door, my legs felt stronger and less rubbery. My gait had improved from the drunkard stagger to something approaching a normal limp. I wouldn't be running marathons anytime soon, but I could enter a hallway, which is what I did. The hallway is a featureless and extended out from the doorway to the room about twenty feet and bent sharply to the left. I was halfway to this turn when I was startled by the sight of a human female rounding the corner from the opposite direction. She was good-looking, mid-forties if I were to guess, but she had a sort of ageless quality about her that made it hard to tell. She wore clothes similar to mine, pale white fabric set on the darkness of her skin. Her eyes widened as she spied me. You're awake, she declared. I recognized the voice. Professor Madakai, I stammered. She smiled and hurried to my side and gripped my elbow as if trying to assist me in walking. I was about to tell her that I was capable of walking on my own when I realized that I had no idea where I was going or how far I might have to walk. A big extra help might be a good thing. Gratefully, I let her take a bit of my weight. She steered me in the right direction that I had been heading. I was just coming to see if you were finally awake, she told me. Professor, I repeated. She smiled at me, dimples. She had dimples. I didn't notice them before. The medical pod couldn't differentiate between damage due to disease versus damage due to old age, she explained. To it, they were the same thing, damage in need of repair. You look great, I admitted. Thank you, she said, still beaming, an unexpected benefit. We lapsed into silence for a few seconds as we rounded the corner. More hallway, this time it bent to the right at the end. Do, do I look the same, I asked. She laughed. Your hair is longer and you've lost a bit of weight, she told me. You've been living off your own body fat for almost an entire month now. But otherwise, no major changes. You were closer to what the pods considered optimal health. I wasn't sure if I was pleased or disappointed by that. It'd have been nice to step out of the pod or buff with the face of a male model. On the other hand, not finding much they needed repair despite my diet of hot pockets and diet coked was probably a good sign. The conversation lagged again and I was trying to think of a good way to ask if she had weird dreams during the hibernation as well. I couldn't think of a good way to broach the topic without sounding like a lunatic though, so I opted for something safer. Who else is awake? I asked. You're the last, she informed me. Everyone else has been out of their pods for a good hour or so. That was the last. Why? She hesitated. The medical pod, she told me, I found something unusual in your brain. My brain? I sputtered, like a tumor. No, she said, just 
unusual neural activity. It's probably nothing, but the pod wouldn't release you until it did more of a thorough scan. I thought back to the dream conversation with the abjectators. I still wanted to believe that it was just that, a dream. But this latest tidbit was just sowed fresh seeds in a field already overburdened with doubts. I changed the topic again. I hurt everywhere, I muttered. That's partially the muscle stimulants and partially due to the seizures, she explained. Seizures? I asked. I thought you said that there wasn't anything wrong with me. It was an induced seizure, she explained patiently. The pod forced you to have a seizure. It did the same thing to all of us. Summoning up my impressive command of the English language, I looked at the professor dead in the eyes and said, Huh? Not a seizure, she corrected herself. It was a full-body convulsion. A seizure, I said. Why did it give me a seizure? Two problems with which prolonged periods of inactivity, she explained. Muscle atrophy and joint freezing. We don't walk and move around or our muscles rot away, I agreed. I understand that part. What do you mean by joint freezing? You ordinarily move every joint in your body multiple times a day, she explained. Your body is designed to move. Joints are not designed to stand still. When they do, they begin to lock into place permanently. Fibers grow and turn the joints solid. To break up these new growths, the pod caused your muscles to contract and release over and over again. A seizure to force the body to fix condition that was only there because of the medical pods to begin with. No wonder I hurt all over. Where are we? I asked. It's hard to explain, she declared as we went around another turn. More empty hallway. Try. I ordered as I gritted my teeth from exertion. The pain had been to retreat for a while, but now I realized that it was just a strategic retreat to lure me into a trap where the agony reinforcements could surround me. First of all, she said with a sigh, we have a name for the star system. We call it Tau City on Earth. It's about twelve light years away. Is that it? I asked. Three weeks and we've only gone twelve light years. She glared at me. That means we've traveled four light years in a week, she said. That still means that we're traveling 208 times the speed of light. No, I muttered. We never went faster than light. We just skipped over large chunks of the distance. What? Never mind, I said. So I know where the star system is, but that's not what I was asking you, and you know it. She slumped slightly as she seemed a bit, well, reluctant to answer. Once we got here, the captain was able to take over the ship again, she said. There was a bit of a, um, disagreement. The science officer was trying to push us planet side. The captain would rather push us towards an airlock, I think. They made a lot of noise and, uh, I guess you could say, Port Authority got involved. Got involved. How? She shook her head. Prof, I said. We're not on the planet, she admitted. Where are we then? I asked. Quarantine? Jail? Neither? And both, she said reluctantly. This place is sort of like a, um, museum. A museum? From the second wave, actually, she said. Although I saw some use in the third wave. What saw some use? I asked. She waved a hand as if to indicate the walls on the floor. This place, she said, it's, um, a moon, kind of. But it's also sort of a ship, kind of. I stopped walking and leaned against the wall. I was too exhausted to walk and think at the same time. Want to run that by me again? I asked. She seemed thoughtful. Okay, she said. You know how sometimes the sites of old battlefields where there have been abandoned forts you can still visit. This is sort of like one of those, except that it was made from a hollowed out moon and left in orbit around one of the planets here. We're in a fort, I said. She nodded. A fort that is over 60 million years old, she clarified. This, uh, ship, military base, relic, whatever you want to call it, it predates all human history. It practically predates all mammalian life. I suddenly felt dizzy and was glad that I had already been leaning against the wall. I had felt it, all right. The place was really ancient, impossibly ancient. So old that my very youthfulness and practicality was an insult to its halls. How? I stammered. The ship we came in on was a relic too, she said quickly. Not quite this old, only about two thousand years or so. Two thousand years, I said. 
and it still flies. That's not uncommon for them, she said. She was frowning now. From what I've been able to gather, their technology is fairly hardy, she went on. It hasn't changed much in the last million years or so. Million years, I muttered. How old are these creatures? She let go of my arm and began pacing the hallway. That's what I've been trying to tell you, she said. There's something wrong here. Not just with us finding a 60 million year old artificial rock still inhabitable. They apparently use this place to store refugees or other beings that create interstitial political problems. They use it as a holding area, sort of. It doesn't belong to anyone specifically and is far enough away from the planet to fall outside of the planetary government's jurisdiction. But it is too close to the planet to fall under interstellar jurisdiction and... Prof, I interrupted. The ship's lasted millions of years. I can't. What's got you so upset? She rolled her eyes and glared at me as if I was practically a slow-witted child. These civilizations are old, she said. Some of them predate life on our planet. With me so far? I nodded. Our entire species evolved while they've been sitting around almost unchanged, she went on. No technological advancements, no real shift in power dynamics, no biological evolution. Really stable? I asked. Really stagnant, she declared. I shouldn't be possible, not with our understanding anyway. This is unnatural. It shouldn't be this balance, not without some sort of outside agency at work. I suddenly had flashes of the dream of the abjugators. We evolved in an area where they couldn't directly influence. Coincidence? You think something is holding them back? I asked, deliberately stopping their growth. Yes! She snapped at them in a clamor of the voice, and maybe, no, it's hard to explain. We spent a bit of time exploring this place. It really is a museum of sorts, lots of old weapons and war machinery, but... But what? No art, she said. So it's a history museum, I said. People lived here, she corrected. There are thousands of living spaces, but everything is spartan, all utility and no art. How can you have this many beings living in one place and no signs of personal touches? Maybe they've just been removed, I said with a shrug. It is a museum. She frowned, but nodded. Maybe, she agreed, but that's not our biggest problem. What is our biggest problem, I asked. She swept her arm out again to take in the battle moon. The station, she said, was in a war where dinosaurs were used, up until dinosaurs were wiped out. Do you know how long dinosaurs walked the earth? I shrugged. A few million years, I think, I admitted. I'm not a history buff. So what's your point, I? I stopped then, and the words caught my throat. She looked at me and nodded. Good, she said. You figured it out as well. I'm sure it'll occur to the others as well. You haven't told them, I asked when I could speak once more. She shook her head. Not yet, she admitted. I was allowing them to adjust. And you hit me with this right off the bat, I counted in an almost shout. Why me? Because, she said, if you figured it out before I could speak to you, then you might say something to the others and cause a panic. Oh, so now I get to panic by myself. Good job. Dinosaurs. They were weapons of war. Millions of years of Earth churning out living war machines. All this time, I'd been thinking of the Chimera invasion as wars that were playing out in human terms, battles that took months or maybe years at the longest. But this was much worse. These battles that took place over millennia. Civilizations could rise and crumble before the last gasps of a battle were settled. The fourth wave could outlast all of us, I said. Or maybe not, she said. The third wave appears to have been a shorter duration. Only because my voice trailed off. What is it? She asked me suspiciously. Why did they retreat? I asked suddenly. Twice. That we know of the Chimera came in attacking and seemed ready for the long haul. Then their weapon depots got smashed and they retreat. After millions of years of establishing a beachhead, why run at the first setback? She had no answer. I was about to go when the room started spinning. I clutched the wall of all security. The professor ran towards me and grabbed my arm once more. We need to get you fed, she said. Your energy levels are probably sapped. I nodded and together we started walking down the winding corridor once more. Prof, 
I said after we went around yet another curve. Yes, she asked. When we first met, you didn't want to kiss or transfer the symbiote, I said at last. She shot me a sidelong look. What are you getting at, she asked. Just that a few hours later, you made a bit of a deal out of the fact that it's an anthropologist you have to put aside taboos and were willing to strip naked in mixed company. She smiled. Ah, she said simply. Sorry, I said. I didn't mean to embarrass you or anything. It's just that you were told that I had Alzheimer's disease, she interrupted. I blinked in surprise, but nodded. She smiled at me. It was a sickly smile. It's a terrifying illness, she said, feeding your mind, slipping away. It comes and goes, though. You clear up just often enough to really appreciate what you're losing. I didn't say anything, she sighed. So, she went on, a former student and a bunch of strangers tell me that they can cure me. They have someone in a Halloween costume and want me to kiss someone. Can you blame me for being a bit suspicious? But then they start proving that they have something. Instant, translation, fold-up, spaceships, amazing things, and the promise for a cure. So, what would you be willing to do if it was the case? I nodded in understanding. I wasn't personal if that's what you're thinking, she told me. I'm sorry if I bruised your ego. I shrugged. It's okay, I said. Heather slapped me when I kissed her. The professor snorted. My turn to ask a question, she said. Okay, I guess that's fair. Did Wilson give you the symbiote? She asked. I think so, I admitted, but I was knocked out for that time. Only after I spoke that I realized what she was really asking. No, I said. No, not like that. I wasn't passing judgment, she said soothingly. I didn't kiss Volson, I shouted. We had stopped moving. I was about to ask why when I realized it was because we had reached our destination. We were now in another large room and a low tables built into the floor. The others sat around one of the tables. They all wore identical white clothes. Lee was grinning broadly. Pay up, he said to Heather. I told you it was the captain. No, I shouted. I didn't kiss either of them. Jack looked up at the one and flashed a brief smile at me. She then turned to Lee and held out her hand just to palm up. Lee groaned. I still say that you should have been more specific than security guard, but a bet is a bet, he said grumpily. I didn't kiss any of them, I shouted. Why don't any of you believe me? It wasn't like that. That's not how I got the symbiote. So how did you get it? Heather asked. I don't know, I shouted. I was all cold when they did it. I just woke up butt naked and strapped to a table and... I stared at four pairs of eyes shooting me identical looks of abject horror. You know what? I said at last. I think I was happier when you all thought I'd kissed Volson. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 12.5 The Third Wave, Firstborn Written by Sebi Loki the armor had saved his life. Sergeant Firstborn had slipped into that peculiar tunnel vision that he'd sometimes experienced on the battlefield, crouched behind a boulder that had already fractured from the repeated plasma blast that it had suffered as he had used it as an improvised shield. He had become so focused on taking out the sniper that he'd lost sight of the rest of the battle. A stupid mistake, but uh, fortunately... His armor, melt in sensors, had detected incoming shell for him. One moment he was staring through the scope, seeing out soul of incoming fire, and the next he was up and running. He was now exposed by the enemy fire, would be converging on him at any moment. The armor was programmed to move him away from the imminent threat, but it wasn't smart enough to seek out new cover. So... He wasted precious seconds searching for what had set off the proximity reflexes before issuing an override to the armor. He could naturally override and suppress any of the automated reflexes any time he wished, but in moments like this, as long as he was already running, he found it advantageous to allow the armors to stumble along blindly until he had a chance to figure out how he needed to flee it to escape the danger. He brought up the sensor log and located the incoming shell. It was a warp bomb. No matter how far he ran, it may not be far enough. He overrode the automated system, but it didn't alter the straight line trajectory in which he had been headed. He didn't want to stop running. He just wanted to go faster. 
The war bomb struck the rock and he had been hiding behind in a heartbeat later. The impact triggered the tiny, uncalibrated meta drive blocked inside. The drive itself was not very powerful, barely large enough to project a field to transport a lump of surrounding matter across the threshold of meta space. And even then, the power banks were exhausted almost as soon as it was activated. The field would collapse in meta space and the innate resistance of the strange alternate universe would shove the offending matter back into reality. Using the transportation device as useless but as a weapon, it was highly effective. The fractured and scarred rock as well as a clump of earth the size of the firstborn's own chest disappeared, only to reappear as a shockwave of shredded atomic particles that spread outwards from the point of impact. Firstborn ran an additional three steps before diving face first into the ground. The dampness blocked the hearing and vision before the plasma ball could blind and deafen him as it rolled over him. Still, even the armor couldn't protect him fully from the heat of the blast. The dampness dropped and the stench of burning hair filled the air. He patted his head quickly to extinguish the remaining fires. His gloved hand came back marred with a bit of soot and no evidence of active flames. He'd survived. At least he had for the moment. Scrambling to his feet, Firstborn took advantage of the momentary confusion to seek out some other bit of cover that he could resume looking for the sniper. Sergeant Firstborn! A voice snapped at his ear. The voice had a shill quality to it while also being thick and booming. Infantry. Firstborn! He identified himself as he died behind a rocky outcropping barely large enough to shield his body. Rear guard is under fire, the voice responded. Mobile command is compromised and where? The voice cut out. Not that Firstborn was complaining. It hadn't been telling him anything that he hadn't already known. They were outnumbered, outgunned, and outmaneuvered. Now, to top it off, someone had either taken out the mobile command or had found a way to jam the signals. The results were the same. With communications out, there was no hope of coordinating this disaster. He ground his teeth and glanced over his shoulder at the ridge where the plasma fire had originated. He saw a flash of blue light. There. Rolling onto his stomach, he shouldered his own rifle and pointed the muzzle in the direction that he'd seen the flash of light. He didn't even bother to aim. He squeezed the stock to signal it to charge up the ammo to wide dispersion, followed by explosive volley. He didn't carry many of either rounds, but with a bit of luck, he wouldn't need to after this. He squeezed the trigger while twitching his wrist to the side. The shift in angle wasn't much on his end, but by the time the spray reached the ridge and the arc was wider than the standard assault vehicle, the wide dispersal rounds powdered the earth and rock to create a cloud of dust. The explosive rounds were sent in rapid succession. Finally, he eyed his scope. As he had hoped the cloud of dust had disoriented the sniper, he saw a helmeted head poke out of the dust cloud for a moment while tentacles writhed around it. A Fengalax Mimic! No wonder the sniper had been so hard to locate. It probably camouflaged itself between shots. The sniper apparently realized his mistake a moment later, and he was already beginning to color match the surroundings and duck back into the cloud. It didn't matter. The bombs arrived then. The explosive charges detonated at random. Firstborn hadn't been aiming. He'd been guessing at the trusting it to luck. Luck, as it turned out, had earned that trust. One of the charges detonated slightly to the right and ahead of the sniper. Not close enough to kill, but instantly, but it was close enough to wound it. The firstborn squeezed the stock and switched to high velocity. This time he aimed. The sniper jerked as three rounds punched through its helmeted skull. One problem down a million and a half to go. Firstborn half crawled, half ran away from the rock towards the clearing. Repeat, a voice crackled. This is Lieutenant Lux from Clouds. Are there any survivors? The voice also sounded like infantry, but this one at least sounded like it had a clue. Firstborn replied. Sergeant Firstborn of 8 Commando Squad reporting in, he said. Firstborn, location. Grid G1-55, he said. I was under sniper fire. 
You've fallen behind, the voice informed him. The mixed regiment is retreating. No surprise there. The changing ones did not use the commando and infantry races for their troops, but in Firstborn's opinion, any outfit that was not at least mostly human was to be treated with suspicion, if not outright contempt. The mixed regiment was uh, ineffective, to say the least. Where are they? Firstborn growled. G1-48 and heading your way fast. Looks from Clouds replied. The changing ones are displeased. Again, no surprise. The changing ones never liked having to make their presence known. Firstborn had only seen the race overseas twice in his entire life. Once as a child shortly after the fiery ships had appeared in the sky and plucked him away from the dirt and starvation of his home world. They had taken away many of his tribe that day, mostly the children. A sister ship had taken the children from the tribe and the ugly ones from the valley on the other side of the hill. He later learned that hundreds of ships had appeared that day and carried away thousands of children of both his own breed and the ugly ones. Thousands of children who were carried away by the parents cowered in the darkness of the caves as their offspring were taken into the sky to the academy with which teaching machines. Machines that instructed them on the art of war. That was the first time Firstborn had caught sight of the Changing Ones. Then the creatures had appeared by walking trees, tough, leathery skin and covered in trunk-like body. From the top sprouted limbs that split into twin parts every hand span or so. What started out as two thick stalks and branched and rebranched into millions of dancing cilia by the time it reached the distal end. The second time he spotted the Changing Ones was when he graduated from the Academy and was assigned to the 18th Human Regiment. The ceremony had been brief and informal. In the back of the room he had spied the spindly creature with long, spidery legs and squared off head. He was told later on that there was the same creature as before, but at this time he had scarcely believed it. That was the nature of the Changing Ones. They redesigned themselves so frequently that they almost never had the same appearance twice. Firstborn began running in the direction of the approaching regiment. It did not take long before he spied them. The faces of two dozen different races, all fleeing some unseen enemy, giving chase. This was not a retreat, it was a rout. The firstborn made a rapid decision. He spied a Krish mutant and ran in its direction. The mutant was so terrified of what was behind them that it never noticed the commando running towards it from before it. By the time it rotated its massive head and tiny neck to see where it was going, Firstborn was practically on top of it. Firstborn's fist slammed into the mutant's enormous maw without even breaking his stride. The armor could augment Firstborn's strength. He hadn't bothered allowing it to do so. He wanted to make a point not to take the mutant's head off. The mutant stood a head taller than the firstborn and was half again broader as its bulk. It flew backwards, anyway. For a moment, all four of its crab-like legs were off the ground. Firstborn's gloved hand throbbed with the pain of the impact. He ignored it, however, and reached down to grab the mutant by the scruff around its throat. Where do you think you're going? He bellowed in its face. The others in the regiment slowed as they caught sight of the lone human who had so easily felled a Koresh mutant. Seeing as their attention had been tossed as the mutant aside and said his voice transmitter to amplify, he wanted to make sure that they all heard this. I am Sergeant Firstborn, he snarled, and until I issue the order to retreat, you will hold. I don't care if the world splits or you get sucked into the void. Until I give the order, you hold. Cling to the grass with your teeth if you have to, but you do not move until I give the order. So, a particularly brave, or perhaps exceedingly stupid, larval fig spoke up. There are psionic troops out there. We were being cut down before we knew that they were there. The enemy is not to be feared, Firstborn said. I am. You hold. Sir! It was particularly stupid after all. Firstborn had stepped closer and kicked the hard on the lava's foreleg. The joint snapped under the impact and the creature howled in pain. 
You are unable to run, soldier, Firstborn informed it. I suggest you hold. Anyone else need motivation? They didn't. It was sloppy, not at all like the precision seen amongst the human ranks, but they all turned to face their attackers. The ones closest to the periphery fell without making a sound. The psionic was near, not acceptable. This regiment was a disgrace, but they were his troops. Firstborn ran to the front, howling with rage. He spotted the psionic attacker rapidly enough. The creature was a tall with shaggy fur. They were a favored warrior species of the Conflux enemies. He raced towards it, and the creature spun to face him. It hesitated upon seeing his charging form. It probably had tried to kill him with a lethal burst of psychic energies. The sort of attack was useless against humans, but it was almost instinctive for the creature all the same. The mistake costed its life. Firstborn caught the creature in a low tackle and gripped its head. He twisted hard and heard a snapping sound. The wooden pipe was shattered. The creature would drown to death and fluid filled its lungs. He stood up again and unslung his rifle. Four more of the shaggy creatures were approaching. Unlike their predecessor, these had drawn weapons. He fired twice and took two of them out before the other two managed to get a bead on him. He dived to one side and fired a third time. Another dropped. One left. This one, having witnessed four of its kind slaughtered in the space of a few breaths, seemed to be considering retreating. Firstborn tolerated this idea even less in enemy troops than he did in his own. He fired a short burst that took out the creature's legs. It fell down and he stomped towards it. His hands fell in his belt as he reached his knife. The creature jerked spasmatically as a rifle shot slammed into it and flipped its body over. Oh, now the troops remember how to use guns. Typical. Firstborn turned to face more of the enemy. The psionic attackers were just the vanguard troops, sent ahead to soften up the regiment. He could see the dust rising in the approaching enemy. Beneath his feet he could felt the earth vibrate with the passage of so many marching feet. This was not a squad. It was at least half of the attacking ground troops converging on them. This wasn't intended to be a fight. It was meant to be a slaughter. Riley, firstborn, gripped the hilt of his blade after all. If it was a slaughter they wanted, he'd give them one. He had minutes before they would be upon him and his troops. If he was lucky, and he'd been depending on luck too much as it was, he thought, then he was more than enough time. He issued the command to his armor and felt a prick in the back of his neck to let him know that the alien pharmaceuticals were being injected into him. The Changing Ones knew humans. They understood them. They knew humans better than humans knew themselves. The drug was more proof of that. The color drained from the world and everything dulled, and then everything sharpened. His eyes saw more and focused with the predatory instinct. He felt the chemicals burning along his arms and legs. The pain was there, but the intensity was intoxicating. Everything was growing much more intense. He felt as if he could punch a hole through the planet. He felt strong. His fears eroded. He was powerful. Still, the chemicals worked throughout his body. Did the other know about the switch, or was it just the changing ones? Did the enemy even suspect? Did they understand that humans really were? Firstborn thought back to the image of his parents cowering before the glowing wheels in the sky and tasted the disgust in the back of his throat. His was not a species to grovel before the light. His species was of the light. Not the cold light of the space vehicles, light that burned hot and consumed forests. His species was primitive. It was the flame. The switch was thrown. The alien pharmaceuticals were very precise. The changes were subtle yet wide-reaching. Sergeant Firstborn was no more. In his place was a creature without a name. An animal without fear or remorse. A creature of rage and hunger. The intelligence was preserved but was operating at a near instinctual level. What happened inside the head of the creature that had been human could no longer be described as thinking. He was analyzing its prey. The former human howled in an articulate rage at charge. 
where it touched the enemy scattered. It took a long time and that lot of firepower to finally bring the thing that had been the sergeant firstborn to a halt. When he did fall, the drug had finally run its course and released his grip on his sanity. Firstborn's last act was to smile defiantly as he saw a larger conflux army stagger to retreat from the ragtag assault of the mixed regiment. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 13 Lee and Jack moved to the one side of Professor half me to the spot on the floor just before the table. Following some unspoken signal, I found a plate laden with some sort of brown loaf placed in front of me. A moment later, a cup bearing a brown liquid was placed next to it. With an effort of will, I was able to track the hand that had placed it there. I followed it back to the point of origin. Heather. We saved you some, she explained. One of the mercenaries brought it in before the ship was forced to leave us here. I looked back at the odd-looking loaf. It looked like bread was too smooth in texture. I touched it experimentally. My finger left a dent in it when I poked it. I looked back at Heather quizzically. The synthesizers haven't really had a chance to examine our food supply, she explained. This is what they managed to manufacture for us in the meantime. I was going to call it Lembas bread, but Lee insists on calling it Neutralof. I shot him a look. He caught my expression and touched a finger to his lips. A suggestion of shushing motion. I did my best to keep my face blank as I looked back at the odd-looking stab of food. Neutralof is one of the several names given to a particular bit of prison cuisine used in the punitive measures against unruly prisoners. From what I was led to understand, there was no single recipe for the dish. Each prison had its own method of preparing one, but despite the variety that went on, the end results were practically the same. A compact and nutritionally sound food that was slightly less palatable than a good used gym sock. The fact that Heather didn't catch the reference didn't really surprise me. Lee casually dropping such a reference did. Hopefully he knew about the unorthodox punishment method in the same way that I did. Idle, curiosity, and too much free time. In which his casual reference was probably more a reflection of his opinion on our situation and not because the meal brought back memories. Or at least I hope such was the case. I took a bite out of the loaf and grimaced, flavorless and with a texture that made me think of butter rolled in oatmeal. I really was unpleasant to eat. I wolfed it down greedily, and then I realized I was parched as well and chugged down the brown liquid as well. It tasted like a really dilute gravy. The liquid is mostly just water with a few vitamins and minerals mixed in, Heather explained. Wilson was worried that the hibernation might have depleted our bodies with an unhealthy level. I chewed more of the tasteless loaf than didn't comment. Unpleasant or not, it seemed to help with the ache and fatigue. I gulped more of the brown liquid and felt some of the strength return to my limbs. Impressive! A new voice spoke up. We all looked at the far end of the room and saw a creature that looked like an upright eel, except that it didn't have a tail. It had eight of them. They slapped and then curled around the floor an octopus on land. It gave the creature a strangely silent yet fluid movement across the surface of the floor. Quark did warn me about your recuperative abilities, but I thought he must have been exaggerating. The creature went on and drew nearer, yet here I witnessed the miracle itself. Your first meal upon waking and I can see your recovery taking place already. None of us had jumped in surprise when the creature had entered. I didn't because I was too tired. The others? Meh. I think everyone was starting to get used to the idea that aliens had no manners. Barging into a room without announcing yourself just seemed par for the course. So we just eyeballed the stranger and waited for someone else to take the lead in dealing with him. I was still eating after all. The prof stepped forward. You don't have any hands, she said flatly. Not the tactic that I would have chosen, but hey, at least to put one of them on a defensive. Is this significant? The alien asked. Some of its tail tentacles writhed strangely. I had grown fairly adept at reading the body language of other aliens, like before I allowed the blend of intuition and observation to take over the fold of blanks. Confusion, I decided. Perhaps, Professor Malachi said as she turned her attention to Heather. 
Do you recall my lectures on the importance I placed upon the hand? Heather seemed to be caught off guard but rose to the challenge. You said that the development of the hand was one of the most significant points in human evolution, Heather recited. It provided us a way to manipulate the environment. Intelligence is almost pointless without a way to use it. The professor agreed and eyed the eel thing again. Yet here we seem to have some organism professing intelligence with no clear way to manipulate its environment. I beg your pardon, the alien said. The voice hadn't changed, but the skin color had shifted from a deathly white color to a bluish white. Maybe the physiology followed similar rules to humans. If its blood was blue, then the color might reflect more blood being pumped to the muscles, preparing to fight. It was angry. I smiled and continued eating silently. Maybe it was what they say tinkered with. Lee spoke up suddenly, apparently picking up on some signal from the others. Like with the chimera, they took a dumb squid and gave it a brain. I was not genetically manipulated, the alien protested. Possibly, the professor added, ignoring the alien outburst. But I was thinking that maybe it's a false intelligence, an imitation supplied by remote control. This is outrageous, the alien said indignantly. True, I said without glancing up to meet the eyes of the creature. Treating someone like they're just a lab animal for you to examine and experiment on is sort of insulting, isn't it? I could see the tentacles on the floor from where I sat. They lost their bluish tinge and curled inwards. Yes, I think that struck a nerve. I have insulted you, the alien declared. It wasn't an accusation, it was stating the facts as if they were trying to piece together a particularly tricky puzzle. I could almost see the thinking about it. My words did not insult you so much as my manner, he concluded. You reversed this on me expertly and used my own attitude against me, your attitude of superior being insulting me. Then you drew my attention to the fact that you were imitating me. Extraordinary. Does your kind do this often? It would be extremely beneficial to political discussions, I would think. I looked at Heather, who looked at Parf, who, in turn, looked at Lee. Lee exchanged a look with Jack, who then sent the look back at me. Oh, wonderful. I just got to deal with the idiot hot potato. I sighed and pushed the plate and drink away from me before standing. How can we help you, Excellency? I asked. Are you here on behalf of the entire Blessed Horizon? The eel ducked his head close to his chest as his tentacles curled so tight that I thought it might tip over. The move looked to be a defensive one. Again, we had guessed right. This is a false telepathy the quack spoke of, he asked. How is your kind able to read the thoughts and emotions of others despite the suppressed technology? I was beginning to think that the professor had a point after all. The creature really didn't seem to show much in the way of intelligence. Figuring out it was Blessed Horizon was pretty easy. From what the others had told me, we were in a political limbo situation as the government boys tried to figure out what to do with us. The church, on the other hand, seemed to be content by playing by its own rules and not wait for official sanction. Plus, there was the fact that kept dropping Quok's name. I figured once I woke up from the own medical pod and was apprised of the situation, he would run directly to his good brothers and buck the problem up the chain of command. Seriously, I wasn't exactly donning on a deer stalker cap and chasing Moriarty through the gaslight streets of London. It was just being human. I almost lost my footing as the realization hit me. The alien thing was right looking at body language and trying to guess what was going on in the head of another person. That really was a human thing. We were so used to dealing with other humans, other beings that could do this, that it made creatures seem slow-witted in comparison. Let's not get sidetracked, I said to it. Why is the blessed horizon here, and what do you want from us? No, oh, it said. Yes, I was to extend our apologies on behalf of Quok. I am novice stilts. And I am here to make the amends for our early actions. Novice, Heather spoke up. That sounds like you're still a student. The eel looked at Heather and wriggled slightly along its length. Pleasure. That is correct, it said. But I hope this experience will escalate me to acolyte. It is a great honor. Time out, I said, slamming the tips of my fingers in my right hand to the palm of my left hand to form a T-shape. You're the lower in the church organization. 
It's not exactly a church, the creature said. It's a philosophical movement with... A yes or no is all that is required here, I said testily. Well, yes, it admitted. Then why are we dealing with you rather than someone more official capacity? Oh, it said. Cox suggested we use the suspected telepath protocols for all the communications with you. The standard procedure when dealing with the suspected psionics is to place more senior members in reserve and appoint subordinates as their point of contact. You keep the guys who have the secrets in the back and make sure they only deal with the stooges. I translated and nodded. Score one for Quack, actually. Can I talk with someone in charge? I asked. I will be happy to relay any message. The novice Sulths offered. How about a phone call, though? I asked. I do not understand. Can we talk to someone other than you? I asked. Just talk. They can call us by some communicator. Quack has recommended all communication with you to be through an intermediary. The novice informed of his states you have a method of putting in words that the speaker did not intend to say. I confess that I did not understand what he means. Stooge firewall in place. It was a nice bit of outmaneuvering by the captain, but wasn't ready to admit defeat yet. Could we see your ship? Heather asked. My ship? Sulth's arsters perked up. You are mistaken. I do not own a vessel. No, I said. Not a personal ship. The one you arrived in. It has departed. I was dropped off here and told that they would retrieve me in a quarter turn of the planet. Until that time, I have no ship for you to observe. Captain Cock was really living up to his name. Do you have a communicator? I asked. Yes, it agreed. It is keyed directly to my biosignature and allows me direct access to the seniors. Great, I said. So can you tell us anything about the discussion taking place on the planet about letting us talk to someone? It goes well, the alien said cheerfully. The mercenary group has absconded without even being removed from the proceedings in jail. That was the group that had been advocating for us, in other words. Did the Blessed Horizon get expelled from the proceedings as well? I asked. Most assuredly not, it said readily. In fact, it was one of the delegates that recommended the expulsion of the mercenaries as they have no political presence. And the Blessed Horizon does. We have a social presence, it said. I looked at the others. They met my gaze and the words were passed without being spoken. I stepped up next to the eel and wrapped my arm around its high collar it wore below its head. Silths, I said. May I call you Silths? Most assuredly, it agreed. Have you ever toured this facility before? I asked. Oh yes, this relic has been the subject of much history. I am familiar with every part of it. Would you let me show you around? Could you? I asked. My friends and I are really interested in what you think the most secure and easily defended portion of this relic is. I do not know what might meet the criteria, it admitted. How about a place with really thick walls and only one way in or out? I asked. Oh, it said, there's a brig near the center of the moon. Perfect, I said. Show us the brig. Are you sure that you would not prefer to see some other area as well? The weapons cache is particularly interesting. That sounds marvelous, I agreed. Let's make a day of it. Show us where you keep the weapons and then take us to the brig. This is most exciting, it said. I am pleased to be of service to you. I hope this will bring me to the seedier's notice. I'm sure they'll have a lot to say about you very soon, I told him. Novosul shivered with pleasure and slapped his tentacles on the floor to lead us towards the door that he had entered. I thought I saw a flash of silver from Jack's hand as she pull-palmed her switchblade and held it at the ready. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter Number 14 Silthus was as good as his word and led us down the hallway to what appeared to be another bare patch of wall. One of the foot tentacles came up and waved a bracelet in front of the wall. A slit appeared and the wall separated to reveal an elevator. What is this? Lee asked for all our sakes. Apologies, the novice asked uncertainly. If you prefer to walk, that is possible, but we would likely require extra equipment and I would need a requisition a map. What sort of extra equipment? he asked. I am unsure of your rest periods or energy requirements, the alien said hesitantly, but for my own kind, I would need run nourishments to sustain me for a several-day voyage. 
Several days, I interrupted. How large is this place? It's a moon, the alien reminded me. The areas which you expressed interest in are near the core. I do not know any units of distance that you might be familiar with, but if we can find a straight path, I suspect that it would take three days at my best traveling speed to reach them. We pushed into the elevator. Sulthus followed a moment later and waved an odd bracelet again to make the doors close. What is that? I asked. An extract from the cells of the previous captain. The alien explained. The ship uses genetic filters as a control mechanism. We have been unable to isolate the controls since we captured. Jason, Heather hissed in my ear. I turned around and raised my eyebrows. She mouthed a word with three syllables. I couldn't figure it out, though. I raised my eyebrows again, and she stomped her foot and shot me an angry look. She repeated the word. A hard syllable, a wide mouth, softer syllable, and an open mouth vowel. Banana? Did she want a banana? I saw her annoyance grow and turned my back on her. How long will it take to get there? I asked the novice. Apologies, it said again. I am not familiar with your units. This transport vessel is capable of high velocities, so it should not be a long wait. My ankle smarted. I looked down and saw Heather's foot retreated from where she'd kicked me. Again, I looked at her and again she mouthed her syllables. I was fairly certain the first syllable was a curse sound now. Canada? I shrugged and looked away as she rolled her eyes. I decided to continue making conversation with the alien. So you're using the bracelet to make the ship think that you're the captain, I said aloud. That's curious. Why is that? The novice priest asked with a wide-eyed look at his easy head. It just seems that you should be able to reprogram it by now and not have to exploit an old system like that, I explained. Oh, it said, military vessels of the third wave were a state of the art. They used intrusion-resistant systems and sophisticated layered encryption. The only reason that we weren't capable of traversing the ship is because we succeeded in powering it down to a nominal state. Otherwise, the ship's automated defenses might trigger us as a boarding party. Again, she kicked my ankle, and again, I wheeled on Heather. She once again mouthed the three syllables, followed by a shorter two-syllable word. Kahuna Pullmans! I shook my head and looked away. So after a few thousand years, you still haven't broken the system? I asked. That's odd. Can you use the ones who designed it? I suspect that they would not be accommodating to our request, the Sultus admitted. We are now entering the levels meant to be occupied by the ground troops. You should feel more at home on these levels. What is that supposed to mean? I asked suspiciously. I meant no offense, it said quickly. I just thought the dimensions of the interior should be more comfortable for you. I personally find them distasteful, but I am led to understand that your own kind found them otherwise. My own kind, I asked. Most assuredly, it said as the door was opened. Did you not realize the Chimera would want to keep prisoners on the deck with the highest concentration of available soldiers? Um, I stammered and slithered out of the elevator. I guess I didn't think about that. Oh yes, it agreed. That is why the weapons cache is here as well. Come on, follow me. I looked around and noticed the hallway was really did feel more comfortable. It was a subtle thing, but I noticed it now. The other hallway had been more squared. These were taller and then had wide space to allow multiple people to walk past, just jostling one another. Sulthus' words finally registered with me. I spun to face the others. Did you realize that this was a captured Chimera ship? I hissed at them. I still had no idea why Heather decided to kick me in the ankle again at that moment. End of chapter. Chapter number 15. The others walked while I limped after the slithering form of Sulthus as we worked his way down the corridor. As I trailed behind, ankle throbbing, I noticed something else different about this part of the ship. There was color here. The walls and the ceiling emitted the glow that seemed to be the source of illumination. But unlike the rest of the ship, the walls were colorful here. The walls were a soft, pastel blue, while the ceiling was a cream white. The floor was covered with a dark green material that reminded me a bit of industrial carpeting. 
The carpeting muffled the sounds of footfalls, while the colors seemed to have been selected to evoke a feeling of being in a terrestrial plane. When we rounded the corner, the colors began to slowly shift towards earth tones. By the time we reached the bend, I felt as if we were walking through an unusually smooth and regular cavern. Before even a hint of claustrophobia could set in, I detected another shift in the colors towards a lighter color scale. It was as the professor had said, there was no art in the other parts of the ship, but this, this served no practical purpose other than to delight the pedestrians as they traversed the ship, something that existed for its own sake alone. Art, in other words. Why did we see it here but not in the other parts of the ship? Was alien art too far removed from our own understanding, or using senses we did not possess? Maybe aliens sticking the live electrical feed up their noses and feeding how it sparked off factory sensors with random smells was the highest form of art. Wait, did the old factory system work that way? Never mind. The point was, until viewing the section of the ship, the utilitarian design hadn't registered. Now that I was seeing the art again in the absence of any other places seemed much more glaring. The prof was onto something... What did it mean? The eel being Sulthus came to a stop before what, at first, appeared to be the blank section of the wall. I was about to ask why we had stopped when I noticed that the wall before us had a milky white appearance to it. Elsewhere on the ship, I might have ignored it because it stood out as the colors on the floor and ceiling parted around the section and continued the meandering march across the color spectrum on the far side. So, I looked again at the wall and realized it wasn't a wall at all. I could see through this one. Our guy did something to the controller. I didn't see what, but I did see the results. The lights in the corridor dimmed while those on the other side of the barrier brightened. The sounds of multiple people sucking in breath echoed down the corridor. I'm sure my own was there as well. This was not a weapons cache. It was an armory. The room extended as far back as the eyes could see. A mile? More? I couldn't say. It extended to the entire length of the corridor, forty feet wide at the very least. For any other room, that would have felt spacious, but for this room, it made it look like a staring down a bore of a rifle. Inside the room were racks that stretched from the floor to ceiling. The racks themselves seemed to be designed to move as needed. The ones near the sides had been pushed together to expand the central aisle, wide enough to allow people to march through and grab equipment off the racks. Upon the racks, well, there were guns, guns, and more guns, a bit of armor, and a hell of a lot more guns. I don't know how long I stood there, slack-jawed and staring, but I can say that the sulphur's voice made me jump a little when he spoke. Impressive, is it not? he said. There are other entrances, but this one gives the best view on the length of the cache. What? What is this? Lee murmured. Scholars think the troops would enter from the entrance as well as two others at the midpoint. The novice priest explained. They would collect armor and weapon and continue down towards the exit at the far end. They were equipped in a manner similar to what you would call an assembly line. That's insane, I said. That's enough guns for an army in there. Yes, the novice agreed. A great loss for the historians that the barrier cannot be breached. I was busy gaping at the assortment of guns when his words hit me. What do you mean can't be breached, I asked. The priest tapped the tentacle on the milky white barrier between us. It made no noise, but his tentacle flew off to the way. A grade 7 repulsion field, Sulthus explained. It reflects back any force hurled upon it. Our best tools cannot cut it. So no one has been in there since the third wave, Heather asked. The eel slid its jaw to the side. I guessed that was the equivalent of a nod. This was a chimera space for the most of the invasion, it explained. It served to protect the Hal world, Earth, from attacks and the Comflux eventually used one man ultralight fast courier to break through the defensive and release a pathogen to the, uh, planet. The pilot was killed soon afterwards, of course, but the mission itself was a success. With the supply of the Hal world, um, 
humans began to dwindle, the Chimera were put into retreat. When the Conflux recaptured this vessel, it went to the state of secure lockdown as we attempted to counteract its defenses. And you still can't penetrate them, I stammered. The eel looked at me. The ship's fuel reserves are intended to last for billions of stellar orbits, it explained. Battle boons were considered long-term fortifications that needed minimal support. But surely in a few thousand years your science has advanced enough to... My voice trailed off as I looked at the thing. A thought struck me. You've been attempting to gain entry into this room for thousands of years, I said, but you also said that the moon is powered down. Yes, it agreed. Could you destroy the ship? I asked. Yes, it agreed. It would take a much concentrated fire, but I believe that we have the resources. We could tow it to a decaying orbit to the star, if nothing else. But it would be an enormous loss if we did. Not just a loss for historical reasons, I asked pointedly. I apologize, it said. The question does not seem to be translating correctly. Would you please explain? Can the conflux make weaponry like this? He asked while gesturing at the sealed off room. In a moment of carelessness, the back of his hand brushed the field. It was flung away as if it had been struck by a baseball bat. I winced but kept my gaze focused on the alien. Some of it, they said, much of this was standard equipment for both sides. The photon grenades, the pulse plasma rifle, and the neural disruptors were used by both sides of the conflict. Designs for these weapons are likely similar to our own. The intelligence armor, like those upon the walls. At this point, with the tip of one tentacle, the suit of armor sitting in the recess in the wall, what struck me was the strangest part of it as how familiar it looked. Dark brown with black gauntlets and boots that slid over the forearm and shin guards, sculpted to cover thighs and arms without confining with the thicker armor over the shoulders and pads covering the knees and elbows. The armor was the thickest over the chest, but it looked a lot like modern body armor, except, at the same time, it had hints of medieval European armor and feudal Japanese armor as well. I realized I must be looking at the common ancestor of all three has a few refinements that we are not able to fully duplicate. The novice went on, and other weapons that were still completely unfamiliar with. The nanite cannon over in the corner is a good example. It pointed again, this time to a weapon that looked like a bazooka with a hose running off of it. The hose terminated into what looked like a clamshell backpack. That weapon would emit a stream of nanobots, it explained, millions of them at a time. They would then set about digesting a target as they replicated. If left unchecked, they would consume worlds. The Chimera had a counter agent to stop it, a spray that served as an off switch. The educators banned the use of nanite weaponry not long after the introduction, but our scientists would very much like the ability to examine a working one. Grey goo, I heard the professor murmur. I didn't understand the reference, and she seemed to be absorbed in her own thoughts. I decided not to press her for more information for the time being. So, in a few thousand years, you haven't developed technology to surpass this? I asked. The Chimera were ahead of you in the last battle, and they've had all this time to get better. What have you been doing? The eel rocked its head from side to side. I don't understand the question. Jason, someone said. I blinked and looked at Heather. Ah, uh, I said from the corner of mouth, trying to gather a bit of extra information here. Fine, she said in a normal speaking voice, but I thought you'd like to know that you're bleeding all over the museum. I glanced down at my hand and cursed, but she was right. There was a barricade that struck me, there was a shadow cut. It wasn't that painful. Well, not in comparison to the bruise already around it but there was quite a bit of blood leaking from it. As I watched a few drops struck the carpet, oh, great, I mumbled and wrapped my other hand around it. You're damaged, the eel squeaked as its tentacles writhed. If the seniors find out, I'll be demoted to a yearling. Its tentacles continued the mad jiggle as it let out a pitiful keening moan. Aliens have really annoying stress reactions, I realized. I'm okay, I said. You're damaged, it said. You leak. Yes, I said, but it's not much, and I have a lot more where that came from. If we get a bandage, we shouldn't have a problem. 
It stopped writhing and looked at me. Its eyes seemed to be wetter than before. You can leak fluid and not be compromised in health, it asked. Some of it, I said. Human bodies bleed to keep the wound clean. An interesting adaptation, it said. But is it not harmful? Not if we get it cleaned up soon, I said again. Can we do something to fix this? Most assuredly, it declared. There is a surgery nearby. We should be able to find something to cleanse your wound there. The alien touched the control for the lights again, and nothing happened. It touched them again. The lights remained on. The ship is old, it declared. Something must have broken. I nodded. The surgery, I reminded it. Of course, it said. This way. The tentacles churned as it snapped its way through the carpeting down the corridor. The others fell in step behind it, leaving me and Lee to pick up the rear. Shame, I said with a sigh. Then we can't get to the guns, he asked me. That, I admitted, and that I ruined the carpeting. Blood stains never come out, it was the only place the nice flooring that I've seen. He glanced downward. Carpet's fine, he said. I followed his gaze. He was right. The carpet was spot free. Huh. I could have sworn that a rust-colored stain had been there a moment before. Must be self-cleaning, I guessed. He shrugged. Maybe we should follow the squid and get you a band-aid, he suggested. I nodded assent and fell into step behind him. The surgery, as it turned out, really wasn't that far. Two more branching corridors, and I find myself in an eggshell white room with rows of familiar-looking pods. I was about to protest the necessity of using one, but it turned out that I didn't need to. The novice priest whipped its way through a small box structure and touched the top. Shelves popped out of the side and it was some sort of medical supply cabinet. I realized it pulled what looked to be a small gun out of the top and I felt my heart skip a beat. Ah, it said, I thought this contained a dermal repair sprayer. It took a second to look at the gun and saw that it had a small blob at the end of it. The alien approached me, and reluctantly, I extended my injured hand. It pointed the gun at me and pulled the trigger with its tentacle. The yellow mist of the nozzle then settled under my skin. A moment later, the back of my hand grew numb as the mist hardened and became a flexible bandage that covered the gash. The lingering pain and the bruise was cut, and I actually felt a momentary sense of relief. What is that? I asked. A dermal repair spray. It explained, synthetic skin to cover your damaged skin. It absorbs the damaged tissue and facilitates repair. When the new skin in its place and synthetic skin will automatically dissolve. I touched a yellow patch of the back of my hand. It was numbed slightly, but I felt the touch. I flexed my fingers. They moved normally and the yellow patch rippled like it was my own flesh. Nice. As the alien put the spray away, I caught Jack's eye and pointed at her hand. She twisted her wrist to show that she still carried the blade. Well, the situation had changed slightly, but it might be salvageable. We still had one weapon and numbers on our side. Maybe we could find something to barricade ourselves in as we made a call for help. Maybe. So, I began with what I hoped was a reassuring smile at Silthus and returned putting the medical sprayer away. About our tour... I was interrupted, not by anyone in the room, but the ship's lights going out. We were plunged into absolute darkness for a few seconds. A moment later, a dim red light saturated the area. Silthus wailed again. What's happening? Heather said. I get here before you, I replied as I looked around. Salavata A voice boomed from overhead. It was a weird distorted quality to it. The novice was no longer waiting. He was screaming. I clapped my hands over my ears to drown out the noise when I picked out where the words were in the scream. Impossible! 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 He shouted over and over again. It cannot be! It cannot! I think it can, I replied. Now tell me what we're disagreeing about. The ship is waking up! The idiot shouted. Genetic signature detected, the ship's voice said. The voice still slightly distorted and understandable. Lockdown sequence terminating. Uh-oh, I mumbled and I looked down at my injured hand and the ruddy light. The ship, the professor said. It used genetic detectors throughout the identity of the crew. We're the first species it recognizes as friendlies. 
You mean it thinks the crew have regained control of the ship? Lee stammered. Identify a ranking officer, the ship demanded. Answer enough, Lee said agreeably. You're up, Jason. Me? I asked. Jason, the voice said. Name, not recognized on crew's manifest. Ship's chronometer indicates that 35,947.71 years since lockdown status. Crew manifest must be updated to descendants. Identified Jason, rank acting captain. What? I asked. As senior officer of the descendants of the original crew, you are hereby promoted to the rank of captain until officially recognized, it explained. Identify your first officer. To my surprise, Lee stepped forward. Staff Sergeant Lee Rodriguez, he said. Rank of Lee Rodriguez elevated to acting commander, the ship replied, identifying remaining crew. I looked at Lee. He shrugged. Where did you think I got the diagnosis of cancer, he whispered. Hobo Hospital. The VA isn't the best, but it's all I can afford. Lee was a vet. Until he met me, he'd been living on the street. Yeah, there was some probably bit of social commentary in there that I could make, but I was sort of pressed for other concerns. I pointed at the professor. Madakai, she said. Science officer. What? she asked. I pointed at Heather. She was pretty good at driving in the snow. Why not? Heather. Navigation, I said. Jason, she said, eyes wide. I ignored her and pointed at Jack. Weapons officer Jack, I said. Jack nodded as there was the most natural thing in the world. Well, one last thing to take care of. I pointed at the alien. Silthus. Prisoner, I said. Confirmed, the ship said. Crew roster updated. There was a click and the panel on the ceiling appeared, and a moment later something that can only be described as a really big gun popped out and pointed at the Silthus. He wailed and kicked up a notch. Do we really need him alive? Jack asked as she slammed a hand over her ears. Can you read the instructions? Because I can't, I yelled back. She sighed in annoyance. Prisoners need to be taken to the brig, she yelled out. Verified, the ship called. Lethal countermeasures suspended. The prisoners wailing faded lower volume and thrashed its tentacles against the floor. I will be expelled from the order, it whined. Yeah, I agreed, but you'll be alive. Want to show us where the brig is now? I shot a significant look at the ceiling mounted gun. The ship might not like the tour go someplace else, I added. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 16 Silthus wailed and dropped to a pitiful whine. As it slapped its tentacles along the floor, the lighting gradually increased. With the increased illumination, I noticed some other unusual changes taking place. I felt my legs grow heavier as we marched. Not painfully so, just familiar weight settling upon them. Gravity was shifting towards Earth normal, I guessed. But that was just the most obvious change. Other changes were subtle. I would not have called air stale before, but it seemed to grow sweeter by the second. Some pleasant scent tasting at the edge of the senses. The temperature had been comfortable before and slightly on the stuffy side. That was also corrected. The ship was adjusting the environment to the preference of its human passengers without being asked. Silthus, I asked when I followed the alien, how intelligent is the ship? I don't know, it wailed. The ship has been on lockdown mode since it was captured. It would not have more than a Type 3 non-sentient matrix. Anything more advanced explicitly banned by the educators. Like a nanite cannon, I asked. Yes, it agreed, but failed to grasp my point. I began to wonder if we were doing a fellow favor by taking it prisoner. I wasn't sure if I was ready to deal with the outside world. We arrived with the brig and I felt a surge of emotion. Not remorse, anger. That brig was larger than my apartment. I glared at the room enviously. The place was a prison cell, yes, but it was also a nice prison. The walls and ceiling were carpeted as well as the floor, although it was a bit difficult to say where one ended and the next began, as all the corners were rounded. I realized the padding and soft corners would make suicide attempts difficult. The room was meant to restrain violent people as well as prisoners of war. The furniture wasn't so much sparse as practically non-existent. 
A mat was built into the floor that was suitable for sleeping all. Everyone was so inclined, performing rhythm gymnastics. One round the corner of the room was recessed in nozzles and drains. Apparently, water could be supplied in various other ways of including filling the room like an aquarium. As the eel creature stepped inside the section of wall bulged outwards and began to mold itself into a strange shape that reminded me of a closed umbrella with the strange funnel at the tip. The grooves appeared to have long sides and were roughly the shape of a sulfur's tentacles. Wait, was that an alien toilet? As the alien crossed the threshold, a familiar, milky white barrier snapped into place between us. I took a step back from that and stared at the novice priest. Do you still have your communicator? I asked. The eel wiggled its jaw side to side and dug into a spot just below its collar with one tentacle. It held the top of a small fob-like device that made me think of a novelty keychain. Good, I said. Go ahead and use it. The alien seemed taken aback. You will not kill me if I call for help? I asked. No, I said slowly. I want you to call for help. Why? it asked. Just do it, I said and took a step away from the brig. I nearly collided with Jack. She had entered the room a moment after I did, and I saw instantly what had caused her delay. Are you sure you can figure out how to use that thing? I asked, pointing at the rifle. She shrugged. You point at the dangerous end at anything you don't like, she said. Pull the trigger and watch it die. I think there's probably more to it than that. You got any better instructions? Not really, I admitted. Make sure I'm on the other end of the ship before you take up target practice. I exited the room and spoke to the empty corridor. Ship? I asked. Yes, Captain Jason, came the disembodied voice. It was less distorted now and could almost be mistaken for a human. Can you intercept the prisoner's transmission? Transmission intercepted, it agreed. Terrific, I said and started to walk back towards the surgery. I stopped and thought about it. Ship? I asked. Do you even have a name? I can't just keep calling you Ship. Ship designation Heavy Assault Class Battle Moon Dire Blade. Dire Blade, I repeated with a shudder. Not big on subtlety, were they? Okay, how about I just call you Dire? Captain's preference acknowledged, it said without emotion. I took that for an agreement and joined the others in the surgery. Okay, I said. I got the ship to eavesdrop on our prisoner's phone call. Heather waved me to silence. We know, she hissed, pipe down so that we can listen in. Been taken prisoner, I heard Sulthus' voice well, and they somehow woken up the ship. It's been threatening to exterminate me. An exaggeration, I murmured to the others. All threats and compliments of Jack, not the ship. They hissed me into silence. Where are they now? A gruff voice responded. Buddy, you would think that one alien voice would sound pretty much like any other, but then you'd be wrong. Good old Captain Cock was up to his old tricks, it seemed. In the brig, the lover screamed, I shall go mad with the confinement. I rolled my eyes at that. Be strong, novice, Cock said. Whatever tortures they bring forth, you must be strong, even if they do not believe you. Remember, you know nothing. The response was unintelligible, weight mixed of blubbering. Really, Captain Cock needed to work on his pep talks. Dyer, I asked. Captain Jason, can you break into the transmission so that I can talk to him? I asked. Which party do you wish to speak to solely? The ship asked. Oh, okay. I guess I was underestimating the fine control of the ship. Sorry, I said, clarification. I want to break into the transmission that can both hear what I have to say. Acknowledge, awaiting your transmission. I had to play it cool. Diplomatically. Hey, cockboy, I shouted. Tell me, when your scar went splat against the wall, did you lose more or less IQ points than when you pinch off a loaf? Or was it about the same... This is supposed to be a secure channel, he barked. I don't think the comment was addressed to me, but I was still feeling helpful. I know what you mean, cockface, I agreed. When you start calling scared little boys in prison, you expect the call to be all private, but then the operator starts demanding 99 cents each additional minute, and you realize that you should have hit the button for the naughty nuns instead. What is this? A new voice cut in. 
Ignorant Quack suggests that the humans speak nonsense when they are attempting to frustrate an adversary. Adversary, I countered. We weren't adversaries until you lied to me and tried to kill me. Then you attacked me again with that false field. But shucks, how was I supposed to know that you were such a flimsy creature? All I did was tug you a bit closer. How could I have known that someone who called himself a priest and a captain was so weak? Silence, you savage monster! Quack shouted back. You will not antagonize me! Well, that was an obvious lie. Oh, that's okay, Quack sucker. I agreed. I mean, I was just in first contact with a race of potential allies. How could you know that you were embarrassing all of the Blessed Horizon by showing you were all completely without any honor and your word means nothing? His voice stuttered when he responded. My actions were for the preservation of the Blessed Horizon. Do not defile our name by speaking it. I would kill you a thousand of you. Nay, a million if we preserve the order. Dyer, I asked. Are you recording this? Yes, Captain. How would you recommend broadcasting this last bit to the planet below to reach maximum saturation of the population? I think a lot of people would love to hear Quack's speech. Preparing a wideband broadcast on multiple open channels, Daya responded. Cease! Yet another voice interrupted. Quack, you are relieved. I was about to ask who this new person was when an eel boy saved me the trouble. Your high eminence, Sultus squealed. Okay, so, uh, big shot. Hey there, I said, and I am now speaking to someone in charge. You are, the voice agreed. I am first senior Zemeh. Which of the humans am I addressing? The name's Jason, I answered, and apparently I'm the new captain of this moon that has been orbiting your planet. Indeed, the priest replied coolly. It was a flat statement, not a challenge or a question, a simple acknowledgement. For the first time, I felt somewhat uncertain about my position. I pressed on anyway. I hear, I went on, that a certain band of mercenaries had been kicked out of the negotiations. Quasar Corp, Zemeh asked. That was to your benefit as to our own. Their arrangement that they want is little better than slavery. We did you a favor. Uh-huh, I said. Funny. We don't see it that way. You have an incomplete picture, the priest reassured me. Allow us a chance to explain. That's okay, I said. I have a better idea. Since you seem to define the idea of doing someone a favor as cutting them out of the picture so that you can strong arm your own advantage, I think we shall do a favor for you as well. I see, the alien said. And how does this favor work? We go to the overseer, I said. Without you. I see, Zemeh said. Your plan is to take the stolen ship and fly to the seat of high command and plead your case under penalty of open fire. Not how I would have phrased it, I said, but it does have a nice ring to it now that you put it that way. Thank you. I see, the alien continued. What is to stop us from opening fire on you now and destroying you? Dyer, I said, do we have any weapons capable of shattering the planet below? Geolance and the Howl Bender cannons are recommended. Thank you, I said. Power up both. The sinister, throbbing sensation vibrated in the floor below us. Interesting. There are five billion innocents on this planet, the priest warned me. And there are seven billion on Earth, I retorted. Stand down your weapons, the priest said. We have no authority in any case. That was a bluff, I asked. A poor one, Zeme agreed. Yours was better. I didn't bluff, I said. Which is why it was better, the priest agreed. So why bother, I asked. Why, indeed. Captain, Dyer interrupted. Long-range scanner indicates several inbound vessels to an intercept course. Ah, yes, the priest said. That's why. When you powered up your weapons, that would trigger the interest of the military. Oh, great. The first alien I've met with half a rain, and he uses it to outwit me. Terminate the transmission, I said to the air, and then looked at the others. They did not appear to be happy with me. Ah, I hazarded. Should have discussed the plan with you beforehand. Lee and the professor nodded. Heather just glared at me. Should have had a plan before doing any of that, I asked. She rolled her eyes. Dyer, she called out, do you know how to go to the overseer? Confirmed, the ship agreed. 
Get us there at maximum speed, she said, and broadcast a recording a quack like we threatened to. Acknowledged. The vibration changed under my feet, but otherwise there was no change. Gaia, I asked. Yes, Captain, I replied. Um, I said slowly, is the ship moving? The ship is leaving orbit at maximum acceleration. How fast is that? I asked. How long until we can make metaspace jump? Hey, what? Heather asked. I waved her to silence, no time to explain now. Fifty standard Earth days, it said. Oh, how? Why in the world did I imagine something the size of a moon might be speedy? Captain, Dyer said, there's a transmission from the lead ship. I groaned. May as well get this over with. I groaned. Let's hear it. The voice I heard was a surprise. Head for the Nexus Gate, Volson shouted. Do it now. Volson, I asked. The Nexus Gate, she repeated. Dyer, can you bring that ship inside? The ship will be in range of docking, webbing in 17 microcycles, the ship replied. I paused and thought about it. What's that translate to in human terms, I asked. Docking web deployed, I replied. Good answer, I said. Next question, what's a nexus gate? In answer, one wall of the room turned transparent and I saw myself staring out into the gulf of space. The star Tau Ceti burned bright and angry at the center of the screen. Through the glare, I caught the faintest hint of a donut shape passing before the star. Nexus Gate is a Type 2 faster than light transportation method, the ship intoned. A tame wormhole bridge is artificially stabilized by energizing collapsed string material on both ends. A sublight vessel is then able to transverse the wormhole without fear of destabilization. What? I asked. English. It's an Einstein-Rosen bridge, the professor spoke up. They aren't supposed to last more than a fraction of a second. These beings have figured out a way to hold them open. I shot a look at the professor. For an anthropologist, you seem to know a lot about astrophysics, I muttered. It's a tunnel through space, she said, at a near shot. What goes in one side comes out someplace very far away. What? I said. So they have the space trains going through it. Dyer, Heather said, aim for the Nexus gate. Ah, uh, what if it takes us someplace we don't want to go, I asked. The screen flashed at that moment and I saw a glimmer of smaller starship. But okay, they were all smaller. Dart away in the darkness, another blast hit us. Right, I said, any place is better than here. Dyer, Captain, the ship replied, how long until we can make the gate? Three-fourths of a soda cycle, the ship replied. Not good. I shouted as the screen flashed again, and another bolt of energy hit us. They seem to not want to let us go that way. I'm not sure how long we can stand up to this sort of fire. 574 years, Captain, the ship replied. Ever have your racing heart just freeze in place in your chest? It's not fun. Uh, what? I asked. Hull breach predicted in 574 years, the ship responded. Damage areas can be contained to the outer levels. If present fire continues, the ship will be significantly compromised in 814.9 years. Ship possibly crippled in an additional 201.3 years. Should I enact offensive countermeasures? Um, I glanced at the wall flashing with light. Never mind, just uh, keep moving towards the gate. I think uh, maybe it's time to talk to a former science officer. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 17. The four of us, Jack still eliciting to stand over the Sulthers, and look menacing, piled into the elevator and waited, and waited. I half expected to hear music piped in, but fortunately, the abomination seemed to come after a dire blade's time. I never felt any movement or change in direction, but when the elevated doors opened, we were in the completely different part of the ship. The gravity was lower again. Maybe this part of the ship was normally used by a different species. It would make sense as I heard humans refer to as ground troops, and this appeared to be some sort of hangar. The room was enormous, obviously, but that cannot be stated enough. It was big, huge, mind-blowing in scale. Toss a skyscraper in there and it beat like chucking a tic-tac into a cathedral. The fact that I didn't have an own weather system was a hint that enough fine control Dyer held over the environment. 
If the room had been empty, it would have been impressive on its own. An artificial cavern large enough to store, well, a small country. But it wasn't empty. All around us were ships. Most of them followed the familiar saucer design, but there were a few that were just... strange. Cigar shapes with stubby wings, balls, and spikes that looked like metallic sea urchins. Then something that could have passed as a minivan if you had to slap a my kid as an honor student in Blayman Elementary. Bumper sticker on the back and shoved a soccer mom in the driver's seat. There were just a few of the hundreds of designs that I saw scattered around us. There may have been more, but the curve of the horizon hit them from view. Ships on the horizon to horizon. One particular ship stood out amongst the rest. It was a standard saucer shape, but it differed with notable ways. For one thing, unlike the others, were arranged in nose and columns. This one sat in a set of doors large enough to admit Godzilla without making him duck his head. The second thing they sat apart was, unlike the other ships in the moon, this one was smoking and had charred holes drilled into the side. Wilson, I called out, and as it approached, the ship disappeared, leaving the insectoid officer standing next to the tabletop. The tabletop was already charred, I noticed. No sooner had she appeared than the floor around her exploded as the deck plates forming a circle around her slapped open. Standard issue big guns and mechanical arms whirred out and spun at her face. Hostile life form detected, Dyer warned. Stand down, Dyer, I instructed. She's an ally. Life form identified as Conflux member, the ship replied, gun still bearing on the science officer. Ah... Uh, I thought about it. Your database is out of date? There was a pause. Confirmed. The ship replied and the guns retreated into the floor of the deck plates and snapped back into place. Request updated history. Ah, uh, sure, I agreed. Not likely is what I thought, though. We are hip deep in what the ship thought of enemy territory and its own allies clear across the galaxy. The last thing I needed was for it to realize that humans had dropped off the ally list and the unaffiliated to start blasting its way through the galaxy to get home. Volson rocked her head from the side to side as if to make sure the guns were truly gone before walking our direction. She had a noticeable limp now. Volson, I stammered, what happened? My betrayal on the contract of the duty was noted, she explained, and I was relieved of my position within the company. Either I was getting a lot better at this whole alien body language thing, or the sound of bitterness was universal. You were fired for helping us, I asked in sudden belief. My primary aim was to never aid you, she reminded me. I wish to bring you forth for potential recruits into Quasar Corp. So I heard, I agreed. We spoke to the ground poobah of the Blessed Horizon. If I understand your meaning, she corrected me with a limping forward, leaving the folded wreck on the ship behind. He is not Grand Poobah. Zeme is only a senior of the local chapter. He was instrumental in my termination. How could he get you fired? I asked. By blocking our attempts to negotiate for our planet status, she explained. If my gamble had been successful, I would have been promoted. As it failed, I was assigned the blame. I sort of felt sorry for her. True that she had planned on trying to enroll my entire planet onto the private army of a militia for hire, and her reasons for helping us were entirely self-serving, but, uh, no. Come to think of it, I didn't feel sorry for her. In fact, why are you here, Volson? I asked. I was forced to flee, she explained. I was fired and received unfavorable status for my former employee. My options are limited. Which option did you exercise to come here? I asked. After I observed you were able to revive the ship, I thought my scientific background might be useful to you. She explained. And in exchange you get up a close look at the Chimera technology. I finished for her. Yes, she agreed. I liked it better when Volson was afraid of us. Dyer, I asked, is there something that we can classify this guest as Sir Sheik's limited access to the ship, but not considered a prisoner? Refugee status, the ship suggested. Update crew database to show person as a refugee. Updated, Dyer said. The guns reappeared. 
Refugees are not permitted in the hangar deck, the ship warned. Please exit the area and return to your designated zone. I looked at the guns. I do what he says, I offered, and led the way back to the strange elevator. Dyer didn't ask for the destination. We entered and were whisked away to another part of the ship. The ride was longer than the others, almost ten minutes if I had to guess. Even though I felt no motion or heard any sounds of any machinery, I could almost picture the elevator blurring along an interior of the moon-sized ship and leaving a sonic boom in its wake. Well, probably not. The elevator shaft was likely in a vacuum. Does every member of your species constantly look for angles? I asked Wilson as we rode. Even when you help us, it's nothing to do with altruism. The last word does not translate, the Volson answered. I didn't think so. Lee and Professor shuffled around to the back of the elevator and stood on either side of the former science officer as they were some sort of guard. I suppose they were. Heather, on the other hand, shuffled over to the corner and I heard her say, Dyer, is it possible to talk in private? In answer, I felt a puff of air blow outwards from Heather and the acoustics of the elevator changed slightly. Lee and I both staggered slightly while Professor Madakai nearly squirmed uncomfortably. It wasn't the puff of air that was the problem, it was a sound change. People with good vision forget about it, but the brain doesn't track where things are by sight alone. We spent a lifetime listening to the echoes and the brain gets pretty good at figuring them out. Echolocation isn't some superpower reserved for the blind alone, sighted people can do it as well. We are just not as good at it, but even sloppy echolocation is enough to be disorienting when sections of the room were echoing with suddenly is not. I felt as if the corner of the elevator was just a hologram and I might fall through if I stepped up close. Had the slips moved silently, she discussed something with the ship. She must not have liked the answer, her eyes grew wide and appeared to be shouting. The sound dampener disappeared a moment later and I could relax as the echoes returned to normal. Jason, she said, we have to get off the ship. I thought about the military vessels swarming outside, raining down energy blasts upon us. Now may not be the best time, I said. I just asked how long it would take to get to Overseer, she said. Do you know what it told me? Twenty-nine years. We all took in a deep breath. Lee and I chorused. How long? While well, the third voice asked, how soon? Lee and I looked at one another and then turned to the face of the professor. She was still staring at Heather in amazement. Lee looked at me and then looked at Professor, and he expected me to have something intelligent to add that was sorely mistaken. Fortunately, he decided to take the mantle of the first officer and save his fledgling captain's life. Lee cleared his throat. Care to explain upon that? he asked the Professor. It took us three weeks to travel twelve light years, she said. Slow ship, I offered, she sighed. That means we traveled 200 times the speed of light, she pointed out. Oh, I didn't bother checking the math. That was never my strong suit. Besides, everyone knew that space was big. Just how big was hard to grasp. But I was starting to get an idea suddenly. Now where is the overseer world, she pressed on. Near the galactic hub, I said. She nodded. That's nearly 30,000 light years away, she said. At our current ship's velocity, we'd be traveling for around a century and a half. Long time to nap, Lee commented dryly. So you're saying that we're getting there before we're in our nineties means we're burning rubber. The professor winced at that comment, and with rejuvenated face and heart to remember that a thirty-year jaunt would put at least one of us in their nineties. Exactly was her only response, however. We lapsed into an uncomfortable silence I broke at this time. How do you remember stuff like that? I asked. Like how big the galaxy is. Monty Python's galaxy song, she confessed. Ah, well, at least she had good taste. Wilson, who had been relatively quiet until this point, spoke up. The female is correct, she said. The battle moons were amongst the fastest ship in the third wave. This ship is going to take 50 days before it can make its first jump, I said. That's longer than it took for our entire voyage. Yes, the alien agreed. It has poor acceleration due to its mass. However, the same mass allows it to transfer deeper into metaspace and stay there longer. A battle moon's bypasses distances greater than the span between the star and your own. 
That was an interesting idea. Okay, I said. So, if this ship is so fast and it would take 30 years to get to the overseers, how come you only estimated we would be gone at most a year? The Nexus Gate, Heather answered for us all. It must bridge distances even wider than the ship can jump. Correct, Bolson agreed. My intention was to book passage on a train going to Overseer. So, there are really are space trains, I asked. Awesome! The rest of them ignored me. This gate, Heather went on, is it large enough for the ship to pass through? The alien did not respond. I knew enough about her to realize we'd be asked a question that she didn't want to answer. Fortunately, I had another source of information. Dyer, I shouted out into the air. Can you fit through the Nexus gate? Affirmative, the ship responded. Ship's dimensions are within 0.001% of opening. Tight squeeze, I muttered. The alien was still quiet and I realized I'd missed something still. Can you go through the gate? I asked. Not advised, the ship replied. The mass of the ship passing through the Nexus gate would be unstable oscillations that would make time to resolve. Meaning, I asked. The Nexus would be unstable until the oscillation ceased, I replied. Oscillation, duration, and frequency is determined by length of the wormhole. Valson tapped her feet nervously. It's a fine ship, she said, but I'm afraid that we will have to abandon it at the gate. Why? I asked. It seems that we'd be able to get through it just fine. The science officer feet jittered. But you want to block any further passage for anyone else for an undetermined time. Including our pursuers, I agreed. Dyer set course. Confirmed, Captain. I think Volson had more to say on the subject, but I never heard it. The doors open, and bracing my hands behind my her back, I shoved the alien out the door and onto the floor of the level of the ship that had designated as the refugee area. The door shut, and I stared at the other two. Now where? I asked. Check out our rooms? Lee asked. Capital suggestion, First Officer. I cheered and looked up at the ceiling. Dyer, I asked, where are our rooms? The response arrived slightly slower than normal. Officer's deck and human habitable areas are in different levels, the ship admitted. The officer's deck for the Dyer blade was set to accommodate Blankvis. The environment can be adjusted to accommodate humans. The human level can also be adjusted to create acceptable quarters for officer level personnel. Which options will be faster? The latter, the ship admitted, former under-captain third son, was human, and his quarters, as well as his first staff, could be designed as officer quarters. Let's do that, I yawned. I'm suddenly very sleepy. The others agreed with us, and the elevator doors opened back up, and the colorful level with the brig. A colorful, glowing stripe appeared on the ceiling and led down the hallway in the opposite direction from the way we had gone earlier. Please follow the guide, the ship said. We followed the glowing line of branching corridor and through the dead-end hallway. Five doors opened, two on either side and one at the far end. Science officer, the first door on the right flashed blue. Navigation, the door next to it flashed blue. Security, then the first door on the left flashed red. First officer, the second door on the left flashed red. Captain, the door at the very end of the hallway flashed green. I shrugged and walked towards my cabin. The others followed suit. I yawned. Dyer, I asked, are they still attacking outside? Affirmative, Captain. Anything we should worry about? I asked. They have escalated the attacks to use gravity bombs, the ship replied. Sustained attack will crack the exterior hole in approximately 203 years. Keep me appraised, I said as I watched the door swing open before me. I looked around the room and wondered if I had somehow taken the wrong turn in the hallway. The room was a strange mix of rainforest meets I dream a genie harem decor. Silken wraps dangled everywhere, making it almost impossible to tell where the corners of the room were. A far away, I had a guess, pillows lined the floor and a bed the size of an Olympic swimming pool lurked in the corner. Beyond it was a fountain spraying silent jets of water and spiraled into complex shapes in the air, while dark green trees draped on what appeared to be a Spanish moss crowded around it. The air smelled floral in here, and the songbirds could be heard singing in the distance. This is the captain quarters, I asked. Under captains, the ship corrected. 
The captain has a nicer dig than this, I asked. The captain's quarters are most spacious and designed to be more engaging. The ship confirmed. Man, I muttered, I have to learn a lot about being a captain. You are requiring more information, the ship asked. I walked over to the bed and allowed the mattress to engulf me. I sighed in contentment. Not exactly, I confessed. Just I don't know a lot about the galaxy and what's going on. I've been confined to Earth until fairly recently, and I don't even know how to operate this ship. The ship was quiet for a moment. Maybe it needed to sleep as well. Prepared, Captain, the ship intoned. What is? I asked stiffly. I heard something whir beside my bed. You requested more knowledge on the operations of the ship and being the captain, the ship informed me. I have prepared the knowledge for you. I'm a bit tired for a lesson plan at the moment, I said. I'll study later. Unnecessary, the ship explained. The information has been obtained from the memory RNA of the previous undercaptain and support staff. You did what? I asked. You took their memories. Memories were copied and have been attached to a modified virus that will affix to the relevant RNA to your memories, it explained. Yeah, I said, sitting up in bed. I'm not keen on this whole virus thing. Just how about we... My suggestion of looking into the ship's library for captaining for dummies, which I was sure probably at least was co-authored by Quok himself, was cut short as an aerosol bottle appeared beside my head and sprayed a cloud of mist on me. Before I could stop myself inhaling, I felt the inside of my nostrils burn as my head began throbbing. I fell back on the bed as if my strings had been cut. I blacked out as a million angels opened up their mouths and screamed at me in union. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 18 Written by Semi Loki I was standing in the eye of the storm, or at least that's what it felt like. All around me there was a suggestion of light and noise. Blurred shapes danced here and there as flashes of lights penetrated the haze. The ground would explode showering the area around me in clods of dirt, but not where I stood. I was surrounded by a bubble of calm that extended at an arm's length away in any direction. It was quiet and calm here while, all around me, bodies moved in a murky haze of shadow and light. I tasted something metallic in my mouth. I guessed it was blood. Glancing down, I saw I was wearing a strange body armor that I'd noted in the armory. A rifle hung limply from one glove hand. This had better be a dream, I muttered to myself. Sort of. A voice said from nowhere and everywhere at the same time. The ship didn't separate out personal memories from the memories of how to operate the ship nearly as clearly as it claimed. This is some of the junk left over. Not another abjugator, I groaned. A dry chuckle. No, it said, and believe me, I sympathize with that reaction, but no, I am not an abjugator. In fact, right about now, the modifications I made to your symbiote should make it very difficult for them to talk to you again. What does that symbiote have to do with anything, I asked. Quite a bit, actually. You really didn't think the conflux invented it, did you? I was about to ask who did, and then the answer hit me. The abjugators, I guessed. Right, boy, yes. The abjugators gave the technology to everyone. It's so incredibly useful, no one has ever thought to ask why. Fine, I'll ask why. Another chuckle. Oh, come on, the voice chuckled to me. You already figured out this at some level. I thought about it. The abjugators said that they weren't talking to me through telepathy, I replied. So, the symbiote links up with the language centers of the brain, and it wouldn't take too much effort to add a transceiver of sorts. The voice cheered, top of the class, except in your case that transceiver is damaged. In the others, it doesn't work at all. The symbiote didn't latch on to you correctly. It tried to follow its original programming, but your body fought it off. The others received the descendants of your symbiote, so it followed the new pathways that worked. The abjugators talked to you through the damaged connection that your body is destroying. There is a reason they could only talk to you when you are hibernating. Your natural cognitive defenses keep them at bay. Uh-huh, I counted. Unlike you who waited until I was wide awake. Ha! <laughs> Good one, kid! 
Nah, your brain has just got some pretty impressive defenses. They're just occupied right now. Wonderful. I said as I plopped down on the ground, I felt that I cold even through the armor. Was not armor supposed to keep your butt from getting damp? Then again, this wasn't real armor. Is this going to be a thing from now on? I asked. Someone knocks me out and then someone tries talking to me. Hope not. If this is it, then I've screwed something up. Great, I sighed. How about telling me who you are? Aren't you supposed to try and figure out that I'm a hallucination or not first? Don't care at this point, I said. Just want this over with. Fair point, it said. But names are tricky things. I don't exactly have one. What do you friends call you? Don't have those either, he confessed. Can't imagine why, I mumbled. Who wouldn't want a dream intruder? Ha! <laughs> no, it's a bit more complicated than that, kid, it said. But for the time being, just think of me as a, well, not a friend, but we can at least be on a first-name basis with one another. Except, I pointed it out, you don't have one of those. Got it in one, he chuckled. Okay, how about I tell you why I'm here and let you get back to your screaming as the lifeline of memories gets pumped into your head. Not sure I like either option, I confessed. Yeah, I wouldn't in your shoes either, it agreed. But down the business anyways. What you have to understand, dear kid, is that you and your friends have gotten yourselves dragged into the middle of an ancient war. Yeah, 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 I said with exasperation. The conflux and the chimera. No, he corrected me. That's small time. This is older and bigger. So, I'm getting sucked into two different wars, I asked. No, it's all the same conflict. It's just a matter of scaling. So what? The conflux and the chimera of someone's proxies, I asked. Two sides too big to fight each other, so that they use smaller intermediaries. Not quite, it said. It's more like they're pieces in a game. Oh, the whole your species is just a pawn in the game of chess speech. Haven't heard that one yet. Go on. Actually, the game is more like Red Rover. It corrected me. Except between full-grown adults and a handful of kindergartners, the two sides aren't even evenly matched. You have the big guys who are an establishment and a smaller band of rebels who keep trying to break up the status quo. And which side are the abdicators on? I asked. Both. It's complicated, it said. But that's not the point. The point is that right now you're a wild card. Both sides are going to try and play you. Why am I a wild card? I asked. I could hear the irritation in my own voice. I certainly didn't volunteer for this, I said. You did, and you didn't, the voice said. Like I said, it's complicated. How in the world this is complicated? I asked. I was kidnapped. Look, it said. It would take too long to explain. Let's just say that the you that is talking to me right now isn't always in the loop with what the other you is up to, okay? What other me? I asked. Are you saying that I'm a schizo or something? No, it said. We're getting sidetracked. Humans are just, uh... A bit more complicated than anyone yet realizes. They underestimate you still. Even after all you've done, they still can't get past the idea that you aren't just a primitive savage. You can use that against them. And do what? I asked. Take over the universe and rule with an iron fist. Is that what you really want to do? I shrugged and remained quiet. I glanced down at the ground and wondered why it was so cold. What did that mean? Okay, kid the boy said, with a theatrical sigh. I get it. You've been led by the nose ever since you got involved, and you're tired of it. I understand. Really. But you're still not seeing the big picture. So what's the big picture? I asked with a snort. Are you going to say that if I'm on a mission to save life as we know it? Not even in the slightest, it said. That's not the big picture. Think about it. Why is everyone so up in the air about humans? Because they're soldiers? I grumbled. Do soldiers write poetry? I asked. Sing love songs below balconies? Do soldiers climb mountains and dive into trenches? I shrugged. If they want to, I said with a smile, who's going to tell them otherwise? Finally, the voice said. Finally, you're getting the big picture. I am? Yep, I declared. Because those are the questions everyone else is forgetting to ask. They say you as ground troops. You're not. 
Right now, the universe is one great big china shop, and they're just invited a big-ass bull. I started laughing. I couldn't help it. I was sitting in a dreamed blood-drenched battlefield with cyclones of violence spinning around me, and I was getting a pep talk from some nameless and possibly imaginary entity. And how much ridiculous could my life get? So my job is to break the universe, I laughed at it. It's already broken, I counted. You're just going to put it into the grave. To do that, you need a little help from family. I don't think mom's going to be much help, I said with a smile. I was thinking distant cousins, he replied. Now your memory is going to be out of whack for a while, and you may forget some of this, but I need you to remember this next part. 8 over 12, 5 over 9, 7 over 3, and 1 over 30. What? I asked. I said, are you awake? As his voice called out, I blinked open my eyes. I was still lying in a pool-sized bed, although the covers were now rumpled. The room stank of stale sweat. Heather lay beside me on the bed with a look of concern on her face. I will freely admit that more than a couple of my fantasies started out in such the same fashion. However, in those fantasies I wasn't sporting a panache gage level headache. I closed my eyes because the effort to keep them open was too much. I meant to ask what the time was. What I said instead was 8 over 12, 5 over 9, 7 over 3 and 1 over 30. What? Heather asked. Location classified, Dyer said from everywhere and nowhere, his normal mode of speaking. What? I asked. Location for the specified stellar coordinates is classified. This sat up and stared upwards in the vain hope of focusing on the ceiling might help understand his words. Coordinates, I asked. Those were coordinates. Affirmative, the ship replied. Do you wish to alter destination? I looked at Heather, and she was staring with me bug-eyed. What's wrong? I asked her. She licked her lips and let out an exasperated breath. Oh, I don't know, she said. You lock yourself in your room for two days, no matter how many times I try to knock you, ignore me. Daya refuses to open the door, claiming that you are still adjusting, and now, when you awake, you start talking in alien language with the ship. This is the first time I've had to use a symbiote to understand you. What are you? I managed to stammer out before I caught my words. They sounded normal to me but I could now tell my mouth was making unnatural movements and formed the sounds. The symbiote translations were so close to instant that I'd almost forgotten Valsen and the ship didn't speak English. What language am I speaking? I asked. Standard chimeric, the ship replied. I made an effort to change mental gears. And now? I asked. Unknown human dialect, the ship answered. I breathed a sigh of relief. I was back to speaking English. Heather continued to stare at me. Irritation, yes, but I think she was also worried. Misunderstanding with the ship, I said hastily. I said that I had a lot to learn, and I thought that it was a request for an entirely new set of memories. She blinked and leaned back away from me. You don't remember me or the others, she asked. No, I said, and then caught myself on a look of horror. I mean, yes, I remember you, but no, that was not what I meant. And it grafted a new set of memories, memories from the third wave, I think. Is that why you were speaking chimeric, she asked. I nodded. The crew spoke it, including the human attachment, and I think that my new memories brought it into the language, as well as some other things. What other things, she asked, with her eyes narrowing. I hesitated as splashes of my dreams came back to me, not the one I'd just woken up from, the hibernation dream from Earth. I recalled something about the two places the abjurators couldn't see well, as well as remarks about degenerate versus feral humans. I made a decision. Dyer, I shouted out, I forgot which language I used in that moment. Calls corrections that calls to the, the coordinates I gave you and how I have forgotten. Affirmative, Captain, the ship replied. Best possible speed, I said. Destination arrival in 63 Earth days, it answered. I jumped to my feet and wobbled. Everything swam for a moment and I nearly fell back. Of course, a dummy, I chided myself. I had only been awake for a day out of the past twenty-three. It was no wonder my legs worked a wall. Staying upright, more due to force of will than coordination, I marched towards the door and waved Heather to follow me. Come on, I said. We need to talk to the others. Pretty sure I said it in English. 
I entered the hallway and nearly stumbled again, the shifting patterns on the walls I had noticed before, a few patterns of walls and swirls. They made me think of artists playing with a paintbrush that was the canvas was still wet. I had thought that they were decorative at the time, now I saw them as fresh eyes, so to speak. I realized my mistake. I can't just speak Chimeric, I announced. I can read it too. The words crew quarters were emblazoned on the hallway, and on a hunch I followed the sign that claimed to lead to the galley. Heather was hot on my heels. My hunch paid off. I found all three of the others sitting in an enormous dining room. The dining area was set up much the high school cafeteria, benches next to long tables except for the tables stretched hundreds of feet long. In the aisles between the tables and long walls were a series of blocky machines with recessed openings in the middle topped with a flared hood. Jack had pulled the steaming bowl of one of these machines and sat down across from Lee and the professor. Lee and the professor were still sitting rather close to one another that was truly necessary. Lee shot me an oddly guilty look. I ignored it. Not the time or the place to meddle with what goes on between consensual adults. Besides, Prof looked to be almost his own age now, with the facilities at our disposal, who was to say that a twenty-year-old gap was significant any more. I was already thinking like a galactic. Okay, I announced without preamble. First of all, you are all using machines incorrectly. That's little more than straight amino acid mixed with probably taste like toilet paper. I walked over to the machine and brought up a display. I tapped a few commands in and was rewarded with my efforts by a plate of dropping onto the recess. The plate was topped with what appeared to be a grilled steak with a side of mashed potatoes and gravy. It wasn't, my you, not even close, but I'd hoped that if I closed my eyes and pretended hard enough that I might be able to convince myself that it was the same ballpark, or at least the same zip code. How did you do that? Lee asked. Right. I said, that secondly, I can sort of read Chimeric now and know a bit more about the day-to-day -day operations of the ship. He told the ship to change course, Heather told the others with a glaring at me, like I was crazed. Maybe I was. A little anyway. Thirdly, there is that, I agreed. But that's because, fourthly, I think I've discovered something, gang. I think I've figured out where the Chimera have been keeping the other humans. No one told me to point their ship back to the overseer after that, but there were lots of questions. I was never so proud to be a human being when I realized half the questions involved how to get to the dispenser to not give them lukewarm mucus. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 19 Written by Sebi Loki Ten days into our voyage and I was ready to crack. You would think that having enough time to square acreage to hold a continent also would keep a person busy. But it wasn't like I could easily go exploring. For one thing, Dyer was keeping my life support active on a few decks. That was my idea, and I wasn't worried about resources. Dyer could fill the entire ship with breathable atmosphere for 500 years, and it would scarcely put a dent in the generator reclamating facilities. No. This was for the peace of mind. A few hundred square miles of hard vacuum should make it harder for any boarding parties to make it try to get past our defenses. No, the problem wasn't lacking the places to go, it was lacking the opportunity. I hadn't studied this hard since the college finals. The problem had really hit me the first night after I had woken up from dire, um, unorthodox approach at furthering my education. During the day, I had shown off my newfound abilities to actually figure out the things that were on the ship. I adjusted the light, showed everyone how to turn on the showers, and generally made an obnoxious spectacle of myself. So I guess I shouldn't have been surprised when the other four people wanted the same treatment that I got. Daya was willing. I tried to articulate the valid objection. The argument, it's terrifying when it happens but kind of cool afterwards, didn't get me very far. So I relented and that night the five of us retired to our beds, four of us were gassed into unconsciousness. As for me, I tried to experience my first natural sleep in a month. No lapses of consciousness due to a close encounter with the death beam, no artificial hibernation, no memory RNA mind assaulting, just good old-fashioned sleep. I woke up an hour and a half later screaming. 
Even though, thanks to my mysterious benefact, I no longer heard them, the threat of the abjecator still haunted me. I kept having strange dreams when I sat in the cockpit of Tyre watching the solar system get deleted while I screamed that I really had intended to file a report. I just needed an extension. Realizing that I wasn't about to get to sleep anytime soon, I did the sensible thing. I hit the library to collect data. Despite Dyer's large size, the very little was space was actually dedicated to a specific purpose. The hangar and the brig, the surgeries were pretty much location specific as they had spatial requirements and didn't move around easily. But unlike my dream, Dyer didn't actually have a cockpit, nor did the ship have any specific room that was a library. Any room where you decided you wanted to control the ship was the control room, and any place you took an interest to read was the library. Any place you decided to work on the engines, you could take a lift to go to the engine room. Okay, so there were a lot of exceptions, but not the library. I had full access to that without even leaving my bedroom. Surprisingly enough, the Chimera seemed to store most of the data like humans do. Text, which did a lot to relieve my fears that I would have to navigate alien equivalent of YouTube to figure out how anything worked. Is that all I had to do was select a flexible view screen that was about the size of a sheet of A4 paper and have the text I once sent to it immediately compliments of Dyer. The first night I learned a lot about the Chimera from just trying to decipher their language. The Chimeric is an odd language from the human standpoint. It is actually closer to a computer language than any tongue used by humans. No. Really, it's highly modular. There are a few dozen basic root words that you can express almost any concept you can dream of just by stacking them together. Then word for a battle moon can literally be translated as giant fast space rock that kills my enemies. But the order you snap those root words together can change the meaning. Using the same root words in a different order, you actually aren't describing the meteorite that is hilariously fell to the head of someone you despise. So, it was modular, but highly structured in the same time. It also had weird declaratives that made little practical sense. As far as I could tell, there were two different chimeric languages, common and uncommon. In the common tongue, you could just start yapping at someone without defining the language first. Useful when you were trying to get normal ideas across and don't want to waste time arguing over their meaning. I've been impaled by a rabid moose and I need to go to the hospital. Ideas like that without having to argue over the sort of hospital. Uncommon language, however, is just the opposite. The speakers first start defining some very specific concepts and assign new root words to them so that they can express new ideas. If a word is used enough in the uncommon language that it is universally understood without prior discussion, it can become common. Insane, right? Yeah, gets worse. Chimeric verbs are insane. Verbs are rarely used as a standalone. Instead, they are almost always used as modifiers. So in addition to insane compound word formation by stacking root words, chimeric allows the nouns to be modified by an action, where you tack on a verb changes to the meaning of the sentence. Adjectives and adverbs are also modifiers. The big red truck goes very fast would be one word. This is enough to have a headache on its own. But then you have to deal with the religion angle. To the chimera, everything centers around reconstitution. The reforming of the super sentience. Read on the owner's manual for anything in full one third of its pure gospel of how programming your VCR will help the reconstitution. It's weirdly obsessive. Still, I was learning. Slowly, yes, but I was learning. History, weapons, basic ship maintenance, and even a book on Xeno horticulture. I read whatever struck my fancy in the hopes that I would become a better captain. Then I started to crack. I first started feeding the strain during my pizza party. Lee, of all people, had been the one to figure out the finer details of controlling the dispenser. With the death precision of an artist, he managed to go from amino acid supplements to the almost should be mistaken for actual food. He had reprogrammed the dispenser to spit out something that looked and smelled a lot like pepperoni pizza. Okay, the pepperoni was green and there was just the details. Heather and the professor were trying to coax him into figuring out how to program to get a beer out of it when the cracks started to form. 
I found myself wanting to scream, to tell them that it didn't matter if he made it taste like a draft or a pale ale, that the Earth as well as the rest of the solar system might disappear at any moment. Gee, how do you know that, Jason? Well, sometimes when I sleep I hear voices in my head. Yeah, I played that conversation over enough times to know that it wouldn't go over well. So I nibbled on the edge of my green pizza and tried to think. The problem was that I was spinning my wheels no matter how I looked at it. It seemed like every time I was close to figuring out something, that someone plunged me further into the dark. Why had the nameless entity cut off my ability to speak to the abjugators? I was kind of hard to send and progress update right now. Had it bought me time or were they right now throwing the solar system into the steamer trunk? Not enough data. The Nameless had said that it was playing both sides. Which side was pushing which way? Who were the sides? Not enough data. I didn't see the outline of the bra, but Heather's boobs didn't jiggle when she moved. Did the ship design her top to provide support? Not enough data. Also, I was losing focus. I tossed the pizza aside and stepped out of the cafeteria and into the hallway. Dyer, I said softly, I want to go exploring. Would you like a course correction? The ship asked. What? I stammered. No, just need something to distract myself. Blow off some steam, you know. There was the briefest pause as a neon light appeared along the ceiling. Follow the guide to the gymnasium, the ship suggested. I frowned. Not exactly in the mood to pump iron, I said dryly. As captain, you are required to maintain a healthy and activity regiment, including combat training. Combat? As in martial arts? I thought about it. As a kid, I always wanted to take karate and pull off some of those cool moves from the movies. I loved how the guy in the white uniform would kick upwards and suddenly everyone was flying in slow motion. However, karate never seemed to be in the budget. Here was my chance to correct my childhood oversight. Besides, I really felt like punching something right then, so I shrugged and followed along. The gym turned out to be further down the corridor from the sleeping quarters and was little more than a large room with a checkerboard floor. In the corner, I spotted a lone medical pot. Ominous. Daya gave me no warning as soon as I stepped onto the floor, for all mechanical things appeared before me and charged. That things were roughly man height and looked like an oversized salt shaker covered in saw blades. The blades whirled and growled as they clawed hands reached for me. I ducked away from the first two and got pinned by the third. I woke up a short time later with the mechanical pod opened up. Continue, Dyer ordered. This would repeat day in and day out from then on. Dyer's methods of teaching combat didn't involve providing instructions. He just sent in his mobile meat grinders after me and let me figure it out for myself. Somewhere around the one month mark it actually started to work. I managed to escape the salt shakers of doom for several minutes at a time. So Dyer up the ante and began shooting at me too. I began to form a hodgepodge martial arts involving a lot of running around in terror, a bit of ducking and a mix of strikes that were probably either lifted from television or borrowed memories. I didn't matter. They were starting to have an effect. So that's how I spent the 50 days it took for Dyer to ramp up to jump speed. I'd study the mornings, eat lunch with the crew in the cafeteria, study in the afternoon, and go to combat training until I was too exhausted to move. I'd then collapse into the bed and hope that exhaustion would allow me to sleep through the night for once. If I was lucky, I'd be four hours later when I was awake studying again. I was vaguely aware that the other changes taking place in the rest of the crew, but for the life of me, I couldn't put my finger on exactly what they were. But the only one who didn't change was Sulthus, who continued to wail at all hours of the day, and Wilson. I found myself calling the former science officer and internal communications network to solve some minor point here and there with getting a frame of context with my studies. You spend too much time trying to find a thread of logic, she once warned me. Just remember you are reading the works of an insane species. I didn't tell her there was nothing new for me. I didn't realize how much I had been losing track of time until one day Lee walked into the middle of one of my combat sessions. There were six meat grinders coming after me, three shooters, three slicers. I found that, ideally, it worked best if I could keep the slicers between me and the shooters. 
The energy beams and the shooters wouldn't kill me, but they could incapacitate me enough to get the cut by the slices. By blocking the fire with the bodies of the companions, I could reduce the number of simultaneous attacks I experienced. Captain, a voice came up. It was Lee. His meat grinder shut down instantly, and I wheeled about to face him guiltily. Lee was standing up straighter than the last time I saw him. His hair was shorter, too. Neater. I could use a straight edge on my hairline. I stood facing with his arms clasped behind his back and his feet spread wide. Lee? I asked. He blinked as if shifting mental gears. I just thought that you'd like to know that we are about to make our first jump, Jason, he said. It sounded a little more relaxed but a touch forced. I nodded and I grabbed the towel. I wiped the sweat from my brow and followed him out of the room. How long have you known that what I've been doing? I asked him guiltily. We can hear you swearing from down the hall, he admitted. Ha! Ah, so a while now. Yet no one mentioned it. Um, has anyone else tried the, um, combat training? I asked. Lee just shot me a sideways look and over his shoulder and smirked. We arrived in the cafeteria and everyone braced themselves for the first jump. We waited and Dyer made us count down from ten seconds. Three, two, one, he intoned. Jump! Nothing happened. No sense of movement, no sense of otherworldliness, just the same as the moment before. Five minutes later, Dyer spoke up again. Re-entering normal space, the ship warned us, accelerating, resuming. We parted company after that. I found out later that Dyer was on a long-range ship. The initial acceleration for the first jump was always a limiting factor. For short distances, anything less than 30 light-years, there was a short-range craft in the hangar, but the first climb to speeds for a jump through the metaspace took 50 days regardless of how near or far someone wanted to travel. The next leg was shorter, 15 days this time, but it was still painful to wait. We gathered again for the second jump, again nothing happened. Lee and I got together for the third jump and drank some coffee and toasted one another. The fourth jump everyone ignored. The fifth jump happened while I was asleep and for once dozing peacefully. I woke up due to someone pounding on my door. Jason! Professor Madakai called out from the hallway. Wake up, you gotta see this. What's that? I muttered as swam out of my bed. What is it? I fumbled for the door and let it open. Madakai stood before me in a rumpled clothing and a bedhead hair. She apparently had her own sleep interrupted moments before she disturbed mine. We've arrived, she said, and you have to see this. I yawned. I'll look at the planet in the morning, I mumbled. Sleep now. That's just it, she said. It's not a planet. It's a Dyson sphere. I was now awake. I followed her down the hallway towards the cafeteria. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave Part 20 Written by Sibby Loki An entire wall of the cafeteria had been converted into a view screen of sorts. The cafeteria was intended to feed an army, so naturally the walls were enormous. This allowed wide and unobstructed view of the larger universe outside the walls of the ship. It still wasn't large enough. The primitive monkey part of my brain was going into hysterics. It kept insisting that what I was seeing couldn't possibly exist. That it was impossible. Yet there it was, in complete defiance of what I thought I knew about how the universe worked. I wanted to scream, to laugh, to weep, all of the above. Mostly, I wanted to hide under my bed and hope the thing I saw, or rather didn't see, would just go away if I closed my eyes really tight. Of course, I heard of a Dyson Sphere before. It just supposed that it was the thought experiment, though. A hypothetical way to capture the maximum amount of solar output by surrounding an entire star with... Well, something to collect energy. Hearing about one and seeing one are completely different things. Not being able to see it was somehow worse. Outside of the ship, there were no stars. The ever-present pinpoints of nuclear hellfire that dotted all space were simply gone. Instead, all we saw was darkness. Darkness and more darkness. The object was so large that we couldn't even detect the curve of it. It may as well have been a monolith from 2001 grown to ridiculous proportions. The monkey part of my brain was searching for a bone to smash heads with. Probably my own. 
It's impossible, I grunted out at last. Extremely, a familiar female voice confirmed. I started anyway. I was expecting someone to back me up and tell me why this laugh in the face of physics. I just sort of braced for it and prof, not Heather. This is not even a Freeman Dyson's envisioning, she went on. He was talking about a flotilla of ships and satellites forming a swarm around a star. This is impossible. It's wrong. I wanted to agree with her. Dyer, I said instead, can you make this thing visible for us? The view shifted into a false color palette. The blackness of space was replaced with a technicolor storm of light, except for the black wall in front of us and the still remained cold. That didn't help at all. The monkey brain gibbered. Privately, I agreed with it. But in the interests of pretending to be captain, I feigned emotional detachment. My underlings could openly gawk. Lucky bastards. How far out are we? I asked. 7.6 light riths. Raya answered. A hrith was a chimeric unit of time. It worked out to about 47 minutes. So we were about six light hours out. Which was, what, 30 billion miles or so? I don't know. Far away. Are we still approaching? I asked. Negative, Captain, the ship answered. Gravitational interaction is not advised. The ship is orbiting at a safe distance. Daya apparently thought orbit of Pluto was a safe distance from the thing. If a battleship the size of a moon was skittish, why would I be calm? So what now? I asked. We talked to an expert, Lee said. I looked in his direction to see if he was kidding. His face was remarkably bland. Eh, why not? Daya, I said, patching Wilson. Affirmative, the ship intoned. Hello, Wilson, I said without waiting for acknowledgement. Are you seeing this? This? This is impossible. I heard the clacking and her voice as her mouth spasmed with agitation. That makes for a consensus, I muttered, as well as an answer if you're really seeing this thing. So take it you know nothing about it. Know about it? Wilson asked. How could we? This is beyond anything that I have ever seen. I don't think the Chimera could perform such a feat. They should not be able to. I felt a nagging suspicion in the back of my head, but pushed it aside for a moment. We had more pressing concerns. The ship is refusing to get closer, I said. That is probably wise, Walson commented. That uh, sphere must have incredible mass. I am uncertain what effects it would have upon us if we approached too near it. Right, I said slowly. Because gravity just sneaks up on you. No other reason you both think staying out this far might be a good thing. The groom grew quiet for a moment. Or I almost suspected Dyer of disconnecting. How are you capable of doing that? She asked suddenly. You are the opposite side of the ship. What is the range of this mind-reading ability of yours? I groaned. Great. The alien was holding out on us again. I did some quick thinking. Heather, I spoke up suddenly. You seem to know a bit about Dyson spheres. What? She stammered. Oh no, I am not the science expert here. I think you should be better off with the... Uh... Sorry, I said. You're elected. Voting booths are now closed. You have a landslide victory. Congratulations. What can you tell me about that thing? I pointed at the curiously blank patch of writhing storm of color on the screen, then emphasized my point. Nothing, she insisted. I just read up about them after reading Ringworld, okay? I was curious. Uh-huh, I said, waving a hand to gesture her to continue. Go on. Anything in particular about Ringworld or Dyson Spheres that we should be cautious of? I don't know, she confessed. It was a long time ago. I don't remember much about how the ring was set up. It was just a city ring about a planet and, uh... Oh. Her voice trailed off at that last syllable. Oh, I prompted. Well, she said, I seem to recall that the ring protected itself from asteroids with the greater laser cannons. Laser cannons, I said. But that doesn't make sense here, she said quickly. I mean, those cannons were just protecting the ring shape. This is a sphere. The area it would have to protect would be... enormous. Right, I said, nodding. Guns. Anything else that might be useful? Well, she said after a pause to lick her lips. I heard that real Dyson spheres wouldn't last because stars move and it wouldn't eventually drift off into position in its shell. Guns. And engines. Jeez, 
and I thought the battleship the size of a moon was impressive. I muttered, that's not a world, that's a ship. How are you doing that? Wilson repeated. I ignored her. Is the ship using the energy of a star as a fuel source? I continued. What sort of insanity are we dealing with here? Same question, Jack spoke up, surprising all of us, I think. Now what? Right, we called in an expert that got us some... Um, nowhere. I sighed. I have an idea, I admitted. The problem is that I can't be in my right mind. Are you ever? Heather asked. I talked to Dover Thayer later that day, after making sure the door to my cabin was locked and barricaded. I explained what I needed, some concoction that was scrambled by mind. The ship agreed a bit too readily, in my opinion. The glass was lowered into the nightstand and inside a sloft of purple liquid. Twice, when I had been drugged, I had managed to talk to, well, someone. Though it's time to charm. I chugged the liquid down in one gulp and tasted the rats at eggplant. I settled down onto the bed and waited. Nothing happened. The beds returned to butter beneath me and nothing happened. The walls melted like taffy and nothing happened. Angels ripped holes in the floor, climbed out and screamed bluegrass ditties at me. Still, nothing happened. I was hallucinating and out of my mind, but no one was talking to me. My head trip ended a few hours later and... Vastly hungover, I lurched for the door and out into the hallway. Plan B. I hate plan Bs. I was preparing to head into the direction of the cafeteria when I noted I was hearing a strange noise coming from the gym. I walked in that direction and found Heather and Prof enjoying their own self-defense lessons. Apparently, one of them, Heather I suppose, had given Dyer a few suggestions on programming the meat grinders. At least, I was fairly certain they didn't scream exterminate at a heavily synthesized voice when they tore into me. Jason, Lee said from behind me. I turned and saw him entering the gym with a sweat drenched towel wrapped around his neck. Did you find answers we're looking for? No, I admitted, which means we're probably going to have to figure out how to get to the Dyson Sphere. Any ideas? He nodded. A couple, he said. I leaned against the wall and raised my eyebrows. First suggestion, he raised a finger. We cut a bait and run. This side trip took us a few hundred light years in the wrong direction when we were crashing through the Nexus gates. Gates? I asked. We went through two of them while you were out, he explained. Anyway, while we were crashing through them, we were moving closer to the Overseer, but further away from here. That's why we had to take so many extra jumps to get here. Wherever here is, this is way of course and where it wanted to be. I nodded. So we run and let the experts figure it out, I asked. He gave me the briefest of smiles. That's what they're for, he pointed out. Right, I said. Dyer was practically parked in the garage for a few thousand years and they never figured him out. This one should be a cinch for them. He sighed. Which brings us to suggestion two, he said. We take one of the ships out of the hangar and get a closer look. I raised a hand in preparation to shoot the idea down, but he stopped myself. No. Lee was right. Those were pretty much the only options. Okay, I said. We'll do it, but we're going to play it smart, right? It was his turn to raise his eyebrows at me. When do we start doing that? He asked me. About the time battleships the size of solar systems enter the equation. Come on, let's go to the armory. Lee helped strap me into the armor as I explained my idea to Heather and Professor. They say my idea met with some strongly worded objection was a bit of an understatement. You're suicidal, misogynist, bullheaded, Heather shouted. Arrogant, the Professor added. Arrogant, Heather added agreed. Macho bullcrapping. Battery will get you everywhere, I interrupted. Look, I already talked this over with Lee and he's in agreement with me. Wouldn't go that far, he countered as he tightened the plates around my thighs, just so that I was okay with you being the dying instead of me. No one is going to die, I protested. Well, no one important. That's why this armor is for. I asked Dyer, it can function as a spacesuit. If something goes wrong, I jump the ship and head back this way. The armor has the built-in radio so I can even call for help. Heather threw her hands up in the air in exasperation, so it was Professor's turn to grill me. Why you? she asked. Doesn't I have an unmanned drone or something you can send out? 
Thought of that, I said, but if there was an automated defense sending out a drone might cause them to retaliate. If they trace it back to the dire, they may start shooting at us. And you'll be much safer in a more smaller ship, why? Because, I said, trying to force myself to sound reasonable. It's manned. By me, specifically. Why is that important, she asked. Because the thing out there is chimeric, I said, and it tries talking before shooting, it'll be talking to the captain of one of the battle moons. I'm hoping that'll give it a pause. She frowned and shook her head. She wasn't buying it. Yeah, she didn't have to. I outranked them. If I wanted first dibs at looking at a Dyson Sphere, that was my right. You can't even pilot one of these ships, Heather mumbled. Already taken care of, I said. I'm bringing someone who can. You're dragging Volson into this now, Heather asked incredulously. What? I said. No, she's far too valuable an asset. Sir Jason Reese, sir, I heard Solthus's voice come through the hallway behind us. While I appreciate the fact that you're letting me out in the cell, would you explain why I'm being forced to wear an impractical upper garment? I smiled. Well, novice Solthus, I said as I turned around. Red shirts have a very important role in any mission on Earth, you see. I didn't get to finish my thought. No sooner had I laid eyes in the heel hybrid alien, custom fitting red draped over him in two of his tentacles, filling the sleeves look out low on sides. Then my body froze. Jack, who had been escorting him down the hall, must have seen something odd in my expression, because she ducked to the side quickly and grabbed the novice by the collar of his ruddy shirt. I wanted to move, but the armor had frozen me in place. Inside the faceplate of my helmet, there was a splatter of flowed by burst of static. The heads-up display filled with chimeric symbols floating in front of me. Enemy life form detected. A badly synthesized voice played in my ear, activating defenses. Before I could say anything to stop the legs staggering me forward, the armor was malfunctioning. All those years of storage apparently hadn't been as gentle on the armor as it had been on the ship itself. Armor compromised, the armor said, dispensing bio-enhancing serum. Bio-what? I squeaked before I felt a prick in the back of my neck. The colors faded from the world before everything went black. End of chapter. The fourth wave interlude number two. The first wave, the last teacher. Written by Semi Loki. The planet was young, barely a billion years old, yet already its boiling oceans teemed with life. Curious, why here? Uh, what are the predecessors thinking? The teacher allowed its mind to wander far in an embarrassingly long time. Three seconds. Was it going to see an isle in its old age, or possibly was this a side effect of becoming corporeal? The teacher eventually decided it was neither. Just idle curiosity while waiting for the ship's captain to cross the room. Organics were slow. How could they stand it? The teacher dedicated a small portion of its attention to watching the creature approach in its unfamiliar legs. The legs were a side effect of a recent diet, frailer than its natural limbs and poorly suited for walking, but such were the sacrifices one had to make for sentience. The captain had crossed half the distance to the teacher, May as well start now. The teacher began the painful process of slowing its mind down to pitiful speeds of the organics. The teacher found the mind grinding to a near halt. The thoughts trickled at a glacial pace. It was as close to death as a teacher had ever been. Perhaps that was appropriate considering what was about to happen. The teacher regarded the captain once more. Now, bu -bu -bu -ya -ya. Moved faster now fast enough that the captain might arrive before the boredom set in. Great teacher, Nabababayaya, greeted as he bowed as he spread the head with reverence. The teacher examined the extended neck. Your girls have almost closed up entirely, the teacher observed. The captain snaked his clawed forelimb to brush the slits where it almost hidden beneath the feathers. Yes, agreed the captain. This change is a strong one. No signs of rejection yet. The teacher was pleased with the news. Then the genetic therapy was successful, the teacher mused. The fixing agent was everything stabilized. It would appear to be so, great teacher. The captain agreed without looking up. The captain's species was a peculiar one. In all the teacher's studies, 
of the galaxy, it had never found another species with such an unusual adaptation mechanism. At first, the teacher had assumed the species was simply another mimic species, a curious defense mechanism, yes, but hardly unique. Then they noticed it. Unlike other mimics, the morphological changes occurred much slower and tended to stay longer. The truth had been revealed through vivisection. The creatures were not mimics at all. They were organic thieves. Their bodies played host to a retrovirus that was found nowhere else in the galaxy. This retrovirus, along with a series of bizarre enzymes, allowed the creatures to graft features of the prey into their own genetic structure. It allowed for rapid changes that gave them unusual adaptive range. They could go from land animal to sea creature and back again with a handful of generations instead of thousands. The creatures exhibited marvelous potential save for one flaw. They were not sentient. Close, yes, they could make rudimentary tools, providing their chosen form currently had hands, that is. But it was simple intelligence far too limited for the teacher's use. Well, that had been simple enough to fix. The generation ship had a crew of millions, more than enough for a genetic samples to allow these creatures to sample true intelligence, causing the ship to crash land on the planet had taken a delicate touch, but the navigation system had been primitive and easy to foil. Now the creatures had real intelligence. True, their bodies had very nearly rejected the alien DNA, but the teacher had devised a solution to of sorts. What was important was that they now had a highly useful agent at their disposal. Now to make use of it. The planet Nabibibiyaya said at last, You are certain this is the one? A doubt. Such an organic thing. Yes, the teacher agreed. There can be little doubt. Our methods of tracking the, um, essence, if you will, of the predecessors is very exact. There is definitely a contamination here. Stronger than usual, in fact. One would almost think the predecessors were attracted to this rock for some reason. If the teacher were capable of smiling, it very well may have. Yet its body, if it could be called that, was incapable of such a thing. The form had been chosen for efficiency for its task, not for its subtleties. The predecessors touched this planet, the captain asked. The teacher's mood darkened again. There it was again. The way these changeling creatures talked about the predecessors was odd. Obsessive, almost. Still, they seemed focused on the purpose. Perhaps this was enough. Here and many other places, the teacher confirmed, but here, here especially... It's strange, I cannot fathom what would attract them to the, such a planet. It returned its attention to the world below. Its planet was how the air toxic, the oceans almost boiling. The meteors still rained down from the fledgling solar system. The proximity of the oversized moon, so large as to dub this a double planet, pounded the craggy volcanic surface rock with daily tsunamis. A world so deadly that life should not exist. Yet, there it was. Primitive, but a lie. Perhaps that had been who had drawn the fragment of the predecessor here. Mark this world, the teacher said at last. I believe you may prove uh, fruitful. Yes, great teacher. The teacher was stalling. It knew it. It had been taken thousands of years of planning to bring it to this point. Now that it was at the cusp, it found itself hesitant to take the next step. Why? Was it fear? Fear of what? Not death. Death was, well, death was to be expected. But failure was different. Yes, that was it. Failure. They had come so far, and it would be unthinkable to lose it all now at this stage. You will not forget, the teacher ordered. You will keep true to the purpose. You must be our heralds. Yes, great teacher, the captain repeated. A fool, but a loyal fool. They had prepared a species the best they could. They had gifted it with intelligence, with industry, with the weapons of war. The changelings would serve them when they returned. Teacher, the captain said at last, I must beg you again, reconsider this plan. We're still young. We still have much to learn. We are not yet perfect. Perfect? 
How could a creature such as this be perfect when it was still clinging to an organic body? You shall keep trying for perfection, the teacher decided, but we have gifted you enough. You were able to repel the defenders of this quadrant. With heavy losses, the captain said, and they are beginning to organize, to unite. The teacher suspected the collective was as much behind that as it and its cousins were behind uplifting the changelings. Annoying, there was a defensive strategy. They wished to stagnate the galaxy to prevent the rise of another like the predecessors. The teachers, however, knew that this was foolhardy. They had defeated the predecessors once, yes, but not wiped them out. The only way to annihilate them was to allow them to gather and recollect. Only then could they be cut down for good. Sort of sighted fools, the entire collective cowered in fear of what may be. They never considered that they also could strike down what once was. Teacher, the captain said quickly, once more I must appeal to you. We have much to learn. Stay with us. Teach us more. The teacher had no lungs and could not sigh. We've already gifted you the tools you need, the teacher replied. The collective may thwart you, but you won't extinguish you entirely. Not while you may yet serve their purpose. Survive, grow strong, and come back for me. Yes, teacher, Nerbiyayaya agreed. Until we meet again, we will carry out your mission. You will find the predecessors again. The super sentience will live again. Once more, the odd obsession. What did the changelings think the predecessors were? The teacher had no time for such contemplations. They had wasted enough time. Farewell, Captain, the teacher said. Farewell, the captain replied. The last of the teachers. The teacher did not bother correcting the captain. Last of the changeling kind of grew of, yes, but the last teachers would endure. Oh yes, count in that. The captain stepped away from the crystal matrix that housed the formerly disembodied being known as the teacher. The matrix almost pure carbon and almost as large as the captain himself. The diamond was encircled by a force field for a brief moment, forming a long tube that stretched from floor to ceiling. It was not near long, just long enough for the floor to drop away immediately underneath. The atmosphere inside the cylinder had not been pumped out. Instead, it was used to propel the crystal into the void of space and into the decaying orbit around the newborn planet below. The teacher allowed its mind to speak up again. If it only had a few moments to live, it may as well enjoy them with a the full might of a god. Tumbling towards the planet took an eternity. The ship seemed to fall away and the crystal floated towards the planet, tumbling in slow motion, falling free. The blanket of night grew lighter, the fading of a pinpricked black velvet of the dark blue. The grew lighter still. Then the heat set in. As the sky took on an azure color, the compression wave of the atmosphere struck the crystal. Oxygen levels were low. The crystal did not ignite, but it did char. Streaking through the atmosphere, the teacher waited until the frothing ocean filled its view from horizon to horizon before releasing its hold on the chemical trigger. Five miles up and the crystal detonated, shards of organic material laced with fragments of intellect of the teacher rained down on the seas and seeded the planet. It took centuries for it to occur. The simple organisms living in the ocean, single-celled beings, would sometimes absorb an alien chunk of carbon. When they did, a small part of the teacher was absorbed with it. Much later, more complex life grew. Multicellular organisms that would contain multiple fragments of the teacher. These parts would form a weak link. Slowly, carefully, the teacher was rebuilding itself, not as a disembodied force of blackness of space, but within the entire living biome of a planet. Each time a cell replicated with the alien carbon, the links divided with them. The network grew stronger. Life filled the seas and still the teacher grew stronger, it would live again. It would find the source of the predecessor's interest in the blue world, and if the predecessors returned, everywhere would look, they would find the teacher. Every cell, every organism would be a part of one whole. I live, was the first thoughts in a thousand years. I grow, 
was the second. It came a thousand years later. The network grew stronger, entrenched with the DNA of the protobacteria. The teacher allowed itself to be absorbed into the cells of more complex organisms. It adopted a symbiotic relationship. It provided the power the cells needed to grow more complex and dynamic. They provided the network it needed. More! A million years passed, a million more. The world froze in thaw time and time again. Its hosts grew fins, fins became legs, it walked out of the seas. Still it grew, trillions of copies of itself scattered across the globe. Then, one day in the changeling species returned and gathered some of the teacher's offspring. The teacher would have laughed if he could. Not yet, children. Soon. A million more years, then another, then another. The sky grew bright and then all went dark once more. The world grew cold and so many of its offspring died. It was not the first mass extinction it had felt, but it was the first it had experienced with a newly rediscovered mind. It hurt, threatened to drop it back into a mindless entity once more, but no, there was hope. Some of the warm blood still thrived, some thrived and grew smart. Ah, perhaps there. Millions of years passed again, and the teacher, although a shadow of its former glory, reveled with the discovery. Yes, this is what they were after. It was not finished far from it, but the teacher had found it first. The teacher focused on the creature that had tightened the network inside its mind of the creature that had just barely crossed the threshold of true sentience. The teacher screamed, Wrong! It couldn't be, it shouldn't be. The teacher had been a part of the biology of this planet from practically the beginning. How could this mind, this primitive, organic mind, do this? The network link snapped all around the globe, invisible tethers that had formed the mind of the entity known as the teacher collapsed. The teacher struggled to maintain the links, to contain the damage. But it was futile. For every one link it saved, another ten dissolved. The corruption spread outwards from the twisted mind it encountered and rode roughshod over the network, destroying everything at its path. It wasn't targeted attack, it was a reflexive slash and burn. The teacher writhed in pain, the first pain it had experienced in its millions of years of life and unlife. This wasn't like being broken apart, it was being hunted into extermination bit by bit. The teacher beat a hasty retreat out of the head of the creature and away. Where? Anywhere. The teacher tried to flee but found its flight cut short. Somehow the creature had seized a hold of it and forced the links to stay open and flooded them with a corrupting madness. The connections burnt out and the teacher's mind was erased in seconds. Hours later, the sun rose and shone down bright on the grasslands of a continent that will one day be known as Africa. A small tribe of hairy ape-like creatures awoke and brushed the dust off their fur. One day... When their distant descendants would evolve the ability to create language and name things, they would be known as Homo habilis. For now, however, they had no names. As the tribe awoke and scuttled for one member, a male not quite old enough to seek a mate was late to rouse. He sat up and rubbed his head. It hurt, and would continue to do so for several more days. Within a week... The pain was forgotten for the rest of his life. This would be the only reminder of the invisible psychic scar that stretched from the inside of his head to the length and breadth of the entire world. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this dose of science fiction fun. I hope that you enjoyed. And if you did, please don't forget to support the author from the link down below. But if you want to support this channel, there are links as well down below for you to help with. But the easiest way would be to share this video. And if you are so inclined, subscribe as well.